All right, we are live. We are here. Welcome, everybody. Hope you all are having a blessed day. Uh, we are going to go over uh, 10 years on decade remix of the Cognos 2013 uh, free energy lectures by both Dan Winters as well as William uh, Donovan. Uh, which is the second half in that uh, Dan actually references uh, oh, several times, at least 10, if not more, uh, in his presentation, and that uh, we played about 45 minutes of it uh, in my last stream there before it got interrupted and ended. But uh, it's a two-hour stream or one-hour, 40-minute stream there. Uh, so I'll play it again in full and actually also pause it, and uh, especially at the start here, uh, as Dan Winters uh, specifically references several places in around Calgary, Alberta, where I live and have lived and grown up my entire life. Thus, it's always fascinated me. Uh, I want to like uh, specifically mention this. And uh, Gerald, good day, brother. Uh, anytime, a good time to join in. Simon as well. Uh, if you either of you are available, uh, I'll email you the links here right now. Well, Gerald, I already did email, but Simon, I'll forward it to you too. Uh, and so here, bef just before we get started on that, uh, some updates with my electrolysis, the alchemy, the cold fusion, uh, the hydrogen fuel production, the monoatomics, Ormus, GANS, it's all of that all in one. Good day, Gerald. Welcome, brother. Good morning, Bernie. How good morning good day good morning wherever going? everybody is tuning in wherever you are uh welcome and so we have uh in three jars that are in front of us uh, between bert and ernie there the big one it hasn't been plugged into uh anything zero voltage zero connection for uh, at least three or four days now and uh this what i'm what i believe from my understanding of hearing bob greenier describing this lion reactor uh that uh, essentially i've created something similar only a couple more layers but that it's got the copper solenoid uh coils going through it the aluminum uh layer of aluminum foils uh zinc iron ferrite core and uh, that repeating a couple times through it and uh, that ever since I unplugged the electricity, it's now been bubbling this atomic hydrogen up nonstop. And like right there, now all of a sudden we've got a cloud of uh, that monoatomic stuff just randomly moving upwards. That but looks cool. Uh, I'll focus uh, in quickly just to show the bubbles that have still been uh, coming off of uh, this reactor here. And that uh, it's a constant little stream but constant stream of this hydrogen non-stop and that uh, i predict like if it's running the same length as the one i've had outside uh that's been producing non-stop for over nine months straight now that uh right it's like well if you get a whole bunch of them and up it obviously that's a long life and a lot of hydrogen out of just water with zero input so basically, it's like uh, the metabolism of the human body. You spin it up and you let it do its work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Same and, effect. That's pretty cool. What's oh, yes, yeah, exactly, Simon. And that's the next uh, step. And I've actually got a whole bunch of different uh, gallon, multi-gallon, also liter, and just a... Uh, uh, pop bottles and water, giant water jugs and everything that I'm going to be cutting up and using and submerging into uh, the electrodes, into the reactions to start capturing and collecting the different gases, the hydrogen or uh, HHO, uh, the different ones that we're going to figure out so that we can start doing samples. And uh, I'll also show on this camera here quickly some samples of different materials that I've started to get together. Uh, I'm going to put a big package together and send it off uh, to Bob Greenier uh, so that uh, he can hopefully take a look at it under some equipment. 
when it comes to gas capture, uh, once you get your system set up so that you can actually capture it, a suggestion would be a balloon. You get to see what kind of pressure or um, how much gas will accumulate, so to speak. Well, yeah, that's the thing I'm going to, with putting it into the water on the electrodes, the gas collects, the jugs will rise from the water level and uh, collect up and up, right? Right, right. That's kind of like an anaerobic um, gas collector kind of thing. I think it's anaerobic. That looks like some mad scientist stuff right there, Bernie. That's awesome. Right? Getting, I got to get all the jars, all the parts right first uh, and in order before you try to put the homunculus in. The homunculus? You're go <laughs> That'll be awesome. Right? But, like, on a serious note, like, the first time... I actually heard of the ingredients of a homunculus. I was like, I can't even show my jars anymore out of like just the fact that the self arranging different like monoatomics and like gooey mixtures that it makes actually literally looks like a giant glob of exoplasm. I don't know. It's just, it's ridiculous. But. Yeah, it kind of does, eh? It kind of looks like uh, uh, an unconscious Slimer out of uh, Ghostbusters. Right? But then it's like the clouds and, like, the, there, there we go. So I, uh, over the last day, I rehung these two coils into the jar. They're not connected to anything, right? Uh, no current going in just to see if it made a difference at all and uh literally no difference uh, whatsoever in the reaction rate of how much uh this guy is bubbling and focuses in right get all the right angles set up before going live and then when you go live it just never wants to capture it for some reason i don't know if you can see it but there's a constant stream of very small tiny bubbles coming out of the core of that uh not just uh the random sporadic uh big ones bursting up both from the ground and from the nail, but from the top head of the nail, uh, there's a con should be visible a constant stream of the little ones. Uh, nope, you can see it. It's it's just like a little cloud that comes off the whole top of the flat part of the nail. Exactly right, and that's what I suspect being the the atomic hydrogen isotope hydrogens being formed out of this electrolysis uh, process and reaction. So uh, I'm going to, uh, just to experiment and retest it, see, uh, connect the coils there that are hanging uh, back up to the negative end of uh, the five volt uh, connection and then uh, I'm going to insert a, another piece of uh, pure zinc uh, metal uh, foil on the opposite side there as the anode and then uh, plug it back in to see what sort of reaction rate uh, the, this little lion reactor core thing here uh, has in regards to that, if it like uh, pauses production or whether it increases. Uh, we will see when i built my first hydrogen cell um i kind of wrapped them like a solenoid except i did it by filer and i wrapped one 
I'd wrap one and then I would uh, give a nice solid gap and then I would wrap the other one on the opposite direction. And then I'd do that successfully until there was 12 uh, lines in each uh, way, like opposite direction, so to speak. And I'll tell you, the hydrogen production I got was amazing. Like so much. When I would light the water on fire, my windows would shake from the implosion. It was just awesome. Really? So maybe it's a suggestion you should uh, try building a cell similar to that. Two different okay, well, uh, yeah, if you got an image or can draw up a little full Yeah, diagram, I can draw something. I, should do. Uh, I would love that. And sorry, Simon, finally emailing you right now completes the link to join if you're available or wish to. Good, sir. And um, all right, what else I was going to quickly show was I brought in a couple of other copper coil windings uh, from outside that I had submerged that uh, are currently now in this crystalline, pink crystalline state. I didn't see it. And now I just uh, put it in with some just below boiling water and some extra new salt, regular uh, table salt, to see what sort of reaction, if I can keep it going in the pink states and prevent them from fully oxidizing into the different uh, outer nano layers. And uh, keep, if you, when, uh, they're preserved in this active pink uh, red state. They'll actually grow and continue to grow out uh, crystals, uh, these nanocrystal layers on the outside of all of the metal, uh, which then uh, start reflecting lights and sparkling and glimmering. It's quite, quite uh, beautiful to see in the sunlight, especially. Uh, I'm showing the bottom of this jar where you can see some little uh, nanoplasmid uh, <clears throat> clusters and that they're all uh, just suspended in at like suspended, suspended at anime. about an inch and a half from the bottom. And it's uh, still a two ounce silver uh anode two ounce silver cathode connection going in and uh it's created a little bit of an oxidized uh diatomic layer so this would never be used for consumption and most likely uh highly to toxic but uh, it will be uh added into some of the uh diatomic um agricultural experiments usage i'm going to be attempting at making a, a forge sometime this summer i don't know i got a few things i have to finish but uh when i get my forge done i'd love to take some of your monoatomics and put it into um an iron um it's an idea i have for mixing certain metals in order to see if I can crystallize it all in one direction. I'd love to add your monatomics to it. That would be just awesome. A hundred percent. And uh, I am 100% uh, also on board with uh, shipping you a bunch of them. I also have to ship, uh, well, before I show those, uh, I'm showing, this was uh, the uh, second setup I have <clears throat> that has a one ounce silver, uh, coin on the anode side, but I added uh, just a tiny piece of uh, pure zinc onto it, and the zinc is what formed, uh, I also, and I also, sorry, at the same time, uh, added a couple drops of my blood in with it simultaneously, and then it uh, spontaneously started growing these nanotube layers and that they only grew halfway down 
and it's like an exclusion zone of uh, water uh, throughout that layer that the nanotubes now are resting, and then that it oh it stopped, and then there was another exclusion zone, but that uh, the monoatomic material now floats and forms in its own uh, second layer of uh, both suspension and like active self-arrangement. Also the copper uh, triple solenoid Mangrav coil uh, is still producing very small amounts of the atomic hydrogen. Uh, every so often you can see the little bubbles coming up off of it as well. But uh, it's like actually less and probably exponentially less like 10%, 5% uh, the amount that uh, the Lion reactor with no uh, electricity going into it currently is producing, uh, what, uh, 80 to 100 or 90% more hydrogen off of it with no electricity going in as opposed to the reactor here that does still have electricity going into it, but it's the silver coin an anode that uh, is delaying the reaction and that um, I've kept them running and plugged in throughout the month to keep uh, checking with like the moon cycle as it finally begins to uh, become a full moon here in the next week. And then I'm going to restart the experiment and it should uh, if you know, keeps reproducing the exact same uh, effects as before, uh, produce way more of the monoatomics and be way more active. And that coil should also be way more active than uh, when I replug it in on the full moon. Uh, so you've noticed the difference? Oh, I got to dip out for just a sec. I'm just going to mute me and I'll be back in, say, a few minutes. I got to go wake up my daughter. <laughs> yeah, no worries, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks for uh, hopping on, Gerald. And so, uh, what I'm sharing on screen now are some of the pictures of past uh, experiments I've done where the monoatomics have uh, done this spiraling vortex self organization all on their own. Uh, in different layers, uh, in different ways. And then in the bottom here, uh, it's uh, a couple of the pictures of the silver uh, as it produces in different amounts uh, throughout the cycle of a month of uh, the moon cycle itself. And um, let's see. Show a few more here. So as the month goes on, uh, here also I'm showing uh, this what the alchemists call the sulfur state. And when the anode uh, side uh, corrodes, corrodes uh, away and then uh, you, or sorry, actually it's when you, yeah, yeah, there, it's still the negative going in. Sorry, yeah, so. Uh, the cathode's still going in, the anode uh, has disconnected, all of a sudden all the uh, white and uh, blue uh, mono and diatomic materials instantly all turn to this yellow uh, colored um, state, whatever combination it actually is. One of the reasons why uh, I need to be able to get a mass spectrometer uh, to like just test some of this materials and that if indeed it does spontaneously react to become a sulfide, some sort of uh, oxi uh, sulfoxide or sulf uh, sulfur hydroxide or something like that, uh, that the sulfur would have uh, magically uh, transmutated from another element, uh, whether it's the metal or the salt or the water, but uh, some sort of cold fusion 
matter transmutation of uh, one element to another to produce it into sulfur all of a sudden. And if that is the case, then potentially the red uh, matter that I also uh, produce and accumulate that uh, the ancient alchemists, as Isaac Newton describes as mercurial or mercury uh, state of metal transmutations, uh, potentially could be uh, a mass transmutation of uh, the salts, the water, or the metal uh, into a uh, mer half mercury, half uh, whatever the monoatomics uh, were, which, uh, well, that would just change all of science, wouldn't it? And put a whole new, whole new perspective into the lost, suppressed mega science of super science of alchemy. Uh, all encompassing, all encompassing metaphysical science, metaphysics science of alchemy. All right, so let's try to get this back on to showing the amount of hydrogen pumping up. I guess show. Okay, also, so here you see the bigger clouds of uh, coming off of this silver coin here uh, throughout the month, and that there was this oxidized copper all around it, but there was the straight cloud of silver, monatomic silver constantly being produced off of the anode here. And that uh, as the month progressed, uh, it waned and waxed with the uh, actual moon itself, the amount that uh, it was producing, uh, you can see here, like uh, drying up, but like, and then to nothing down there. And then all of a sudden there became a super moon and boom, it completely filled up the bucket of the monoatomic silver. Uh, and that, uh, that is when I realized that uh, it was indeed attached to the moon cycle and that it was a super moon that then, you know, it just went from nothing to boom, filled up the bucket. And that is how she goes. Uh, there was no current going into this at this time where it decides to do this self-organization swirling. Uh, and what does happen is I was adding extra water into it after, a, um, you know, a bunch of water had evaporated into these uh, buckets, water, bat salt water battery experiments, metal, metal battery experiments. And that uh, when you add the water in, uh, it stirs everything up. And then after the stuff is stirred and it begins to settle, that is when this vortexing self-organization arrangements uh, happen. And uh, that uh, it's all on its own accord that it does that. Uh, here I'm also showing uh, in this picture specifically uh, the pure blue oxidized copper oxide uh, in the syringe and that as I put it into the jar, it instantly becomes this yellow uh, reactive uh, sulfur, what they call sulf sulfur state of transmutation, uh, even though it, it, like, it comes out blue and it goes goes in yellow. Um, here is a, uh, what I call a B battery, but it's uh, essentially a type of, uh, or B reactor, something like that. Uh, the winding that I've come up with, it's based off of uh, the Keshi Magrav pain pen capacitor technology. Uh, and that, that was on an anode side. Uh, and that it's in those four or five different colored states of transmutational elements that Sir Isaac Newton uh, describes. Uh, more of the sulfur states, uh, the active states. Um, that always there's this alternating, uh, here it's the blue-green, usually it's blue-red, and that that is the exact same copper winding uh, in the exact same solution and that all on its own, uh, it creates this alternating 
uh, oxidization or hydroxidization um, reaction and layering nano coating lattice structuring I guess as well and yes I need to desperately get myself a power supply a couple of variacs um, a signal generator as well as uh, a bunch of different I need uh, more different gauges of copper wire as well as uh, other pure um, metal uh, wires of different gauges uh, to advance my different uh, experiments as well as sheets of different uh, metals and metal alloys as well. All right, what else do we have here? Right, the different... And as soon as, so here's the thing is that uh, the silver monoatomic anode, uh, it's evolved into as the moon went to a um, complete waning and it's like, or waxing, whatever it is, where there was nothing, an empty moon, new moon, there we go, new moon. Uh, it created the shell. And then as soon as I disturbed it and punctured the self-organized layers of uh, the different oxidized and hydroxidized uh, monatomic materials there, or plasmid clusters, uh, this yellowy uh, bleeding essentially came out of it. Uh, what they're called, again, the sulfur state. And it uh, happens when there's uh, the live current going in, uh, and then as soon as the uh, the nanotubes that have built, such as the ones that are in the second jar here off the anode, these self-organized uh, structures, when there's actual live current going through the reaction, Oh, that's a, switching over. I think you can finally see it. Uh, that it, uh, and you disturb it, the tubes or the layers, it will instantly start producing this sulfur yellow layer. Uh, instead, it's like how uh, it bleeds, or it, it's just, it's interesting. But uh, it's the sixth or fifth states that Isaac Newton states, or the alchemist states, the yellow sulfur state, and that it happens uh, when these reactions or these self-organized layers um, get broken or disturbed, and, and then it just turns everything into the yellow and any... Um, of the regular material, whether it was oxidized blue or white monoatomic, uh, it instantly becomes the sulfur or the mercurial or these different states. So this is uh, the reaction being uh, there's no actual electricity going into that. I just have these wires going over to other buckets uh, that are next to it. But uh, the, yeah, I added water that mixes that up, creates these different exclusion zone layers, and then it uh, will usually go into the vortex spiraled self-organizing layers and structures as it then settles. Uh, lots of these different uh, jars and uh, little cells and reactors that uh, I have pictured here in their initial uh, stages, like a lot of these pictures five, six years ago, uh, when I made a lot of them, I still have them today, and uh, that, uh, you know, it can show the different... States developments that uh, have happened of them. So these bottom two right here, 
the one orangish red reactive and the other blue fully reactive uh, ones when they started out in fact you're looking at them in these pictures five years ago and they were the pure white monoatomic but then uh, between the different circuitry uh, of the differentials of the solenoids and the connections that I make with them uh, they produced a whole bunch of hydrogen and reactions for many years and created the different transmutated states that they're in today. All right, so my droning voice is probably putting everybody to sleep right now. We are 32 minutes and 33 seconds in with 23 people watching, supposedly, it says. Uh, it is 6.17 a.m. in Alberta Mountain Time. Uh, good morning, good day to everybody here. I am not sure how I sound, but on that note, let's get back to playing the main feature. Uh, the, this is the start, and the, uh, there's at least a second video of William Donovan, and then, oh my goodness, he probably lists at least 200 different epic-sounding free energy uh, patents, designs, and builds, and explains how they work. It's uh, just amazing. So I'll be playing that one immediately after this one. And depending how uh, long I can keep on going, uh, as it's now 33 minutes and 33 seconds exactly in. Awesome. Uh, you know, it might, might be even a six-hour stream, at which point uh, I will also play the third video that is the Cognos 2013 uh, question period session that uh, is a panel including Dan Winters, William Donovan, as well as uh, several others that were a part of that uh, lecture series. So, Bernie, I'd love to go over some of the key points Dan Winter brings up through certain once you get to it in the video and stuff. Uh, I'm gonna have to dip out and dip in though, if you don't mind, just because I have a few things to do. A hundred percent, brother. Like absolutely, awesome. that, that's what it's all about. And exactly, uh, Simon Clement out there was like, "Oh, I'm still in bed." I'm like, "Oh, don't worry. This is at least four hours, and probably gonna be six or seven by the time it's done." So uh, you've got the link. Feel free to hop in at any point and hop out and. Uh, awesome. Right, awesome. can rewind, can pause it, and that's what it's all about. That's why it's the Burn Eye Decade In Remix, and well, we've got gelled, uh, you know, even more epic. Uh, I can do some uh, uh, some updates a little bit here and there, and uh, on the alternator generator, I'm finally at the point now where it's going to be finished. So I've got really? one alternator that runs 110. It runs all my uh, um, power tools and then I've got the other alternator that uh, is a welder and then the third alternator on the system will charge a huge battery bank and it does it all at the same time so that's the complete generator now I've finally at the point where I'm finishing it and putting it in the box and getting it done so I love that and yeah. I can't wait to see more even uh, and we'll have to talk more about that even after stream at uh, some point as well because I was just over at my mechanic friends and he's got a whole bunch of extra alternators and stuff for me to start uh, using taking apart and uh, you know well, when I come out there I'll either help you build one or I'll bring you one whichever comes first well exactly both we're gonna have to have both. <laughs> for sure for sure because you're gonna help me build one ahead everything. of time and then bring another one out so we can have a couple going at the same time Darn and make great. it even more epic and uh, one thing i'll go over with you or with everybody here um the alternator generator isn't to run your house completely it's part of a formula that when you build a grow room in your house and you add the different parts that I have for it will run your house for free. It's a complete green, green energy, green room solution that is a hybrid, right? It's like yep. 
disruptive technology that it's not too disruptive. In fact, in if anything, it's actually fully uh, embracing their like ridiculous green climate change agenda and putting it in their face with the ultimate solution of here's your uh, portion free green self sufficient uh, solution in the situation. And Absolutely. For everybody. And and I'll tell you this though, the system or the formula has a solar panel in it. But as most people would get like say a thousand watts or two thousand watts for solar panels, this formula you only need a three hundred watt solar panel to run your full house because there's other parts that are involved, like the alternator generator. There's a windmill component, windmill generator, but it's actually in your grow room. It's not being spun by the wind. It's being spun by the forced air that you exhaust out of your room through negative pressure yes. see yeah. and that's what bob green your especially has been uh, stressing a lot lately well actually forever in the systems and that like everybody has to start understanding is like there's actually a lot of evidence in these evo in these uh cold fusion reactions especially of this over unity energy uh, situation and then also understanding how inefficient our current combustion and electrical systems motors and generation transmission all of it really is and oh it's very I, inefficient very and we're going to change that burn we are we're going to we already it. are we all yeah, are that's the absolutely point. That's why it's Absolutely. 10 years on and revisiting some of these ideas and adding it to where we are, right? And the next thing we're going to work on is ourselves. We'll get into that later. <laughs> well, everybody should already be doing that every day because well, yeah, that's where you goes... start being the change you want to see by being that change you want it to goes see to one world. of the things that Dan Winter said in, in one of his lives when he was talking about um a specific way of your chakra systems and how your body works and what you eat and how monatomics comes into play and all the elements and minerals in your body and that it, it, it's it's awesome we can get into that in the future for sure yes we always will and actually it's all it's about all of it and you know, I think the health things we will do on Rumble and Odyssey and Twitch specifically, which we are live on all of them right now uh, as it is. And I'll post the links here in a minute. Uh, but before I start the uh, Dan Winters uh, video here, I just quickly want to go back outside and show the for the agricultural experiments with this uh, ormus or gans or monoatomics colloidal waters essentially it's all of those four that i just listed uh but that <clears throat> some of the purple and white states of the gold silver monoatomics uh as they sat out in the sun and the moon over the last week uh have changed their outer layers and the funny thing is it's not the water each time i rinse it that causes this reaction oh no that just stirs everything back up it's actually the outer layer that's exposed to the outside light uh of the sun and the moon that then uh, is creating this change of colors that uh like the show Sorry? Kind of like a shell, like a shell. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. So uh, I'm just going to quickly log in and show this outside before playing the next video. That sounds super cool. All this technology, everyone, it all goes back to, I guess, in the long form of things, what we eat. I mean, the electroculture... We're imparting electricity into the uh, plants that are growing. And then, you know, you add on the monatomic elements that originally come from deep within the soil. And the plants draw those into themselves. And as, as we harvest those plants and eat them, we get those monatomics naturally. But there are other methods in order to obtain the monatomics, which is what Bernie's working on. So awesome, just awesome connections.
as well as uh, a lot of evidence and studies that show the human body and just uh, cells and life uh, do a lot of the transmutation uh, inside the bodies and the cells uh, of elements, just like uh, when they're in this ormus state or whatnot. And so this one, right, it's like this crazy brownish gold. And this one is a combination of gold and silver. And uh, regularly it's purple. It started out purple and all there's, you know, that's why I do videos of it. Uh, you know, uh, that uh, we go back a couple days in my live streams or a week when I first started, you could see that it's, it was like at least this purple. And now as I, Oh, actually, sorry. I'm not going to stir it up later on. I'm going to pour the waters out uh, as I do another rinse. But now there's so I've rinsed all the salt out that uh, I'm starting to collect it to actually use them in watering the different uh, um, planters and seeds and whatnot. But uh, this one, it used to be all gold, and it was like straight up a gold tinge that uh, there's still a little bit at the bottom. You can almost see. But layer now and a purple layer. The pure white has stayed pure white. Uh, blue teal pretty much. But the second blue teal gold, a lot more of the gold color coming out. Pink still pink. That purple still purple. This purple still purple. This purple getting a maroon layer on top. And that I can show that, you know, you stir it up and boom, there's the purple back. So that's all different stages of monatomics, basically. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. It's, all of these are exact mixtures of uh, gold, silver, uh, and then also the big ones contain copper and zinc, as well as the gold and silver. Uh, all equal, or not equal, but different uh, proportions and ratios that uh, the different states of the transmutation of metal elements described by Sir Isaac Newton in his alchemy writings, as well as several other ancient alchemists' writings. That's awesome. Have you ever uh, tried an experiment where you've taken um, one system of you know, the beginning process of monatomics and then meditated on it to see if it did any difference. I know it's kind of a bit of woo, but in. Okay. Alchemy, so, that, when so I have a witness. Well, there was a witness. Uh, I haven't talked to him in many years. Hopefully he's still around. Great guy. Uh, what the heck was his name? It will come back to me, but I was in my garage, the first, uh, garage, uh, alchemy lab that i turned into it was silk screening lab as well as where i started this alchemy electrolysis stuff and that uh i had a setup uh running of like one of these buckets in the garage with the magrav coils on the anode and then like uh magrav coils also on the cathode and it was uh, a couple of double a batteries that ha were powering it and that it was like bubbling off the cathode like, uh, you know, they always do just like this one does. Only this is connected to like the USB plug in instead of a battery. And uh, that it runs for about three days before the battery completely dies and it stops. And it had, ju it had uh, just done that like the night before. And this was like the second time that uh, it had run out exactly after like the three days or whatever. My buddy came back. He's like, oh, I bet it's done, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. And we go in inside and I'm like, he's like, how cool would it be? Or, no, I was like, how cool would it be if I set my mind to make it go? And I like, went like, me. And he's like laughing. And then all of a sudden it started bubbling again. It was just <laughs> like. That's awesome. Right? Because monatomics are apparently connected to the inner energy that we have right like our chakras or spirit or call it what you will prana whatever it's plasma it's, it's a plasma. plasma state and plasma state has consciousness within it yeah which i equate to spirit but not everybody exactly right 
Yeah. 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 Oh, also, I've got a whole bunch of uh, oh, that one's spring water in the house. I got uh, distilled water now. Yeah, I do a lot of my uh, experiments with distilled water. Aluminum jelly still growing. The crystal aluminum jelly. jelly. Yeah, aluminum yeah, crystal aluminum. jelly still going. See, now that's the thing, right? Well, it was like, I I will freaking murder someone if they ever try to, like, get me canceled claiming that these are all failed homunculus experiments. But, like, how bad does that look? Like, <laughs> Well, I kind of wonder if you took that aluminum jelly and, and took it out of the jar, collected it, stuck your fingerprint in it, and then let it dry. Would it turn into some form of a solid state of aluminum with your fingerprint in it? It's just oh, a uh, yeah, a lot of times. Uh, and um, that's what I've uh, started taking a whole bunch of samples of and putting them in uh, little small containers and stuff. Uh, yeah, not urine containers. No, they're monoatomics. <laughs> and then also uh, jars full of different samples of the different stuff starting to dry it out, letting them dry out. And uh, it's all going to be going into a nice package to Bob Greenier to test and try out. Um, for instance, there's also like, look at this guy, copper coil and these black nano crystals growing layer on it. What? Yeah. No electricity going in, just the three jars connected to themselves. And that one of them has these massive black nano crystals crystals growing layer that's awesome that's a new one on me i'll tell you i could see your copper already being like where your green is that's your copper solution from your solid copper that's already been transmuted but the black that's that's amazing right so here's uh coils also so it's like same salt water hooked up to itself and then these straight copper coils instead are in this red pink state, uh, just suspended and active. And uh, that there's these new breakthroughs and claims in meta materials and material science of this red state meta material of metal elements. And that essentially that stuff is and that uh, this is it in a suspended uh, animation cold state of it and then here's a full reactive uh, black nano coated uh, keshi coil through the caustic solution and then you can show that uh, uh, this you always have to make sure that the wire you're using is not uh, coated in plastic or uh, even caustic will not uh, eat through it and coat it showing uh, the little wires in there that didn't get uh, have the reaction happen to them. Can you replicate that uh, pink solution with your copper uh, anode in that? Which the one you what? just showed or not pink but red? The red? The, yeah. So this red state stuff I have so much of it my man like the red and the pink state stuff, like, it's all over. And it stays in the suspended uh, pink-red state um, in the jars in a little bit of, like, uh, the salt water. But it also, like, creates a layer of crystallization to stay active. Wow. That's interesting. It doesn't oxidize. I wonder if that could be used in material sciences. And oh, all of this stuff definitely can. It's huge developments. And I suspect that a lot of it is held in like different industrial or corporate or even state, uh, you know, Secret classification. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And patents and whatnot. Yeah, you're probably right about that, Bernie. That's uh, some amazing work right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So constantly uh, working away and making difference. Always just, you know, turning water into hydrogen and oxygen. Keshi says, you know, it's all 
putting out fields and that, uh, you know, you're creating this good plasmatic field. And so it is alchemy. It, it's like the alchemist, it makes more sense of a lot of what the ancient alchemists describe. And then the hilarious part is that a lot of, you can't take everything the alchemists stated as literal, especially, I believe, like with, uh, for instance, the homunculus description that I suspect there, that you don't have to go beat these animals to death and then like take their appendages or whatnot. It most likely has to do with uh, talking about current or electricity or energy specifically stuff like that yeah that and the monatomics in the blood that they were using if that's what they were using oh, exactly and that they were when they're taking the oils the essence the spirit of plants or like animals whatever they're literally just taking the amino acids the dna and the different like yep. life chemicals the core um, of it yeah real science the chemistry the electro bio chemistry of it all when i first got into chemistry i was learning how to make 100 percent pure thc and it's a bit of a process it takes about 12 to 16 hours to do but uh when you get to the essence before making pure thc it comes out as an golden, thick oil so you're absolutely right. It's like the the essence of the plant. See, look, there's the gold on the bottom. Yet the white oh, wow. purple layers, and there's the white monatomic layer again. See, and like that's the reaction that happened from the sun and the moon being. That's significant. Yeah, and like. Nothing else changed, and like that one was still purple. Like, like, oh man, it's it's like magic stuff. And I, those Once. like Harry Potter, like, uh, dream or memory pools and whatnot, like witch cauldron, freaking things or oracle bulbs. I I suspect the, this stuff might have something to do with it. You could be correct. I don't know. That's an interesting thought. Do you uh, document or keep notes? No, I don't have like 10 freaking full journals full of all <laughs> my decades of science notes. <laughs> Definitely not. No idea what you're talking about, Gerald. Good. Thank you. Right. I'm glad That's you don't have any. I'll I'm be right glad back you back. have no idea what I'm talking about. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Oh, that's a bad light angle, eh? Well, it kind of looks neat. It's glowing. It does. It does. Uh, and, like, look at the yellow-orange layer that's forming there, too. It's just yeah, fascinating like, what is stuff. That? Of course, it's monatomics to some degree at a different stage. Plasma, but... yeah. That's crazy cool. Another more reasons why I need uh, access to the uh, mass spectrometers and also why uh, I will be sending several samples over to uh, Mr. Wonderful Bob Greenier. Yeah, that'll be interesting I'm not to see sure what kind of results did he yet. gets testing. Uh, right? Considering how much product you have, yeah, that'll be awesome. Because there'll be a whole range, I'm sure, of different elements that come out. Exactly, right? All right, yes. this is epic. I'm going to let it play for about five or ten minutes and stop it when he talks about the Calgary stuff and the plasma worm and, like, the what? And the Don, Bon Po and all this stuff, like... Do you know what I'm the talking plasma about? Plasma worm. I have a theory on that. That's awesome. We'll we'll talk about it once you get to it. All right. And like I wonder now about all of these like 
the forest fires and like the just massive fires and it's like are those like plasma dragon worms or something flame worms eating stuff up and then you see all like the flame note natos now like the actual like flame fire tornadoes yeah flame, flame natos yeah. it's like is I that wonder... a worm is that a worm portaling in Ooh, interesting thought. I wonder if it's underground uh, volcanoes that are being activated as well. I don't know. Just a right. thought, right? That, uh, that sense. Uh, da, da, da. <laughs> yep. Go for it, Bernie. How's the Let's sound? Up, Do you understand? It's good. Yes. <laughs> Out, JJ, it, it's wonderful to feel so much oh, appreciated and loved when we come here. Thank you to the Spanish heart. <laughs> Thank you to the spirit and gentleness that is the Spanish culture. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so the title of today's lecture is called The Flame in the Mind. The Flame in the Mind. The concept here is that if we understand how you make a fire, how you make a flame with your mind, that we will also understand the solution to zero point energy, free energy, implosion energy, and fusion. So if we understand how you make a fire with your mind, if we really understand the physics of consciousness, the, the flame in the mind, we'll understand the solution to our energy, our energy crisis, the solution to fusion, the solution to plasma. So to begin, I want to tell a little story. I used to be privileged to be invited to speak at the Cherokee Shaman Conferences in Sunray Meditation Society in Vermont, sponsored by the famous Dahani Wahoo, who was a very famous Cherokee grandmother and shaman. And uh, actually, I feel her energy as I speak her name. And um, one day I was doing a, a lecture there. And uh, this is just incidental, but we were teaching about some origins of the alphabet work. And you know how we've talked for years about how alphabet letters make a flame in your mind. We'll play the animations later. You will but I was you, you showing the Haniwahu, the Cherokee, the Native American. I was showing them the sacred letters of the Ophanum Enochian here, the angel alphabet Ophanum. Many of you have seen this. And she said, oh, that's the sacred alphabet of our star elder ancestors, the, the Adawi. And so she recognized this alphabet as the origin of Cherokee from the pure geometry of sacred alphabets. It was fun, it's fascinating. But that's, that's not the story I wanna tell right now. The story I wanna tell you right now is what happened next. There, they had constructed a circle of trees for what they called the Cherokee Sacred Council of Elders. They called it the Arboretum. And the young Cherokee shaman who for that year had been in training to become initiated and honored as a shaman in the Cherokee culture. And they had to prove, they had to prove that they had learned. And one of the things they had to do is they lit this, they set this little brush in front of them and they would sit there and focus. And if they could light the fire with their mind, then they were initiated. That was their test. And we watched. Now, there's another culture that does something very similar. Has anyone ever heard the English term, the Bon Po? You know, the Bon Po master of Tibet? Well, in English, we have a term for a fire. It's called the bonfire. Do you know where the term bonfire comes from? It comes from the Tibetan Bon Po. And what do the Tibetan Bon Po do? 
They light a flame of fire with their mind. It's called the bonfire. Now, when, when the Tibetan Bon Po, when they light the flame, they have a, a massive ritual. We learned about this in Calgary with a wonderful sponsor of our lectures there, uh, Terry Willard, uh, Wild Rose College in Calgary, Canada. And they invite the Tibetan Bon Po there, and they come and they do this massive ritual. Um, they would bring a truckload of sacred herbs and they would pour them into this giant bonfire. And the bonfire would be lit and it would be midwinter and this fire would go like hundreds of feet into the sky. It was a huge flame that would burn for days. And that flame on the land in a very special place would in accomplish incredible healing. Incredible healing. Now, I mean, oh, oh, there were stories told. It comes from the Tibetan Ban Po. Sorry. And what do the Tibetan Ban Po do? Wild they light a flame, something. a fire with their mind. It's called the bonfire. Now, when, when the Tibetan Ban Po, when they light the flame, they have a, a massive ritual. We learned about this in Calgary with a wonderful sponsor of our lectures there, uh, Terry Willard, uh, Wild Rose College in Calgary, Canada. And they invite the Tibetan Bon Po there, and they come and they do this massive ritual. Um, they would bring a truckload of sacred herbs, and they would pour them into this giant All right, I got that written down. bonfire. And the so I literally born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, and live here right now. So I will be looking into this Terry Willard and this Wild Rose College because, well, this has been a decade and I need to get to this bonfire and see this plasma worm and connect with these spiritual people and leaders of both the Cherokee as well as the Tibetans and all of these epic... Uh, wisdom uh uh wisdom elders of uh humanity so uh so, if that's happening in my backyard we need to be a part of this or at least get them on so bernie check this out the ancients when they did this as dan winter stated they would make a circle of trees right and now he's talking about a plasma worm well those circle of trees because they acted as antennas and they were directly connected to ground would act a lot like um like a field of force right and yes. that would concentrate all their their uh what's the word i'm looking for she... Basically, it would create a plasma tube that goes straight up into to the sky because it's a circled area with all these people concentrating and going through the ritual creating a form of energy that goes straight up because it's directed by the circle a of beam a conscious beam exactly. of like creative intent and it's all the same principle that goes way back to the pyramids and even before that it's it's one basic principle it's amazing an astral travel circle or like uh you know an intergalactic contain that containment of energy allows you to bubble. direct that energy right and that's what I believe the ancients knew by doing their circle of trees. It's the same effect. It's a circle of antennas. Right. And I guarantee that when the moon and the sun occult and uh, when they're at the solstices and equinoxes, that uh, that probably exponentially increases. Absolutely. Uh, or, open some sort of portals with that i believe and, it electrifies the air to some degree whether it's a negative polarity or positive polarity i'm not sure it depends on if it's a full moon or, or i bet you're right yeah and i think it has a lot it, it amplifies what they're doing so yeah that's just a theory right on but all of these theories that's what science real science is all about and that's what like progression and development and connecting and getting us there is all about and you know this elevating into this new age of grand awakening and 
ascension while alive you know like uh fuck the cults that want you to sip the kool-aid that uh, you end up dead to ascend no we need to build this heaven on earth and ascend up and you know put everything in our hands first and free everything and uh build a paradise to then join the rest of the universal galactic interdimensional forever time a paradise that is or something like that who knows smoked a lot of weed before i started <laughs> back to dan winters the bonfire would be lit and it would be midwinter and this fire would go like hundreds of feet into the sky it was a huge flame that oh, would no, burn for not. days and that flame on the land in a very special place would in accomplish incredible healing, incredible healing. Now, I mean, oh, oh, there were stories told there in Calgary, this giant ancient dragon current, and there were people that claimed to see the dragon come out of the land, and we now know what that is. That's a plasma worm. That's a charge envelope. Yes, it's a living being. Yes, it's an elemental. And yes, it's living charge plasma and how did it get there it was attracted it was attracted to the flame now i want to tell you another story there is a partner and friend of ours in budapest his name is george edgley and he is rather famous for carbon powder plasma fusion and he claims that indeed he has a net energy gain when you have fusion in carbon powder. You know Rossi and Defcalion, they're doing fusion with nickel powder. Well, Edgley is doing fusion with carbon powder. Now, interestingly, Dr. Edgley claims that the part of the carbon powder in the flame, and by the way, he, does, he doesn't have a billion dollar government budget he uses a $100 microwave oven, actually. <laughs> and he, he puts the carbon powder in there, and at a certain pressure and temperature, there is plasma. And the plasma does fusion. And he claims there's a net energy gain during fusion. Now, this is the holy grail of science, the holy grail of physics. Is it in fact possible to gain energy during fusion? You know what gaining energy during fusion would be? That is in some way that you gain energy during collapse, during compression, during implosion. Non-destructive compression, implosion, fusion, and gaining energy during collapse. These are all terms for the same thing. Now, Dr. Edgley claims that the part of the carbon powder that does the fusion is what he calls a carbon nanotube. You know what a carbon nanotube is? It's like a, a helix of single carbon atoms. But you know what carbon nanotubes are famous for? The geometry of a carbon nanotube is called a fullerene, as in Buckminster Fuller. And Buckminster Fuller was actually a good friend of mine. In fact, <laughs> I have to say that I learned personally from Bucky Fuller this, from the, the, what he called the vector flexor. This would be an example of non-destructive collapse Cubacta, Ecosa, actually there's a dodeca in there, Octa, so this is called the jitterbug, as it was properly called by Bucky, and he taught me that personally. And it further collapses, as you know, into the tetra. So you had Cubacta, Ecosa, dodeca, Octa, and tetra, all part of one implosive collapse. Anyway, years later, when science discovered 
what single carbon atoms, how they like to unpack or nest. They named that structure Buckminster Fullerene after my friend Bucky Fuller, the inventor of the geodesic dome and the Dymaxion car. And they named it Buckminster Fullerene because it looked like this. <laughs> A geodesic dome, actually, a stellation of dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, ecosa. We call this the star mother kit, it's available here. And Dr. Edgeley claims that the part of the carbon that does fusion is this part. So, what is it about this geometry that enables fusion, implosion? The perfect plasma flame. <laughs> well, the fun part of, of, well, first of all, Dr. Edgeley now with our team is we're doing the calorimetry with one of the world's leading plasma fusion experts, actually, and we're going to prove, you know, this science is advancing quickly in the field of fusion energy. But I want to tell you about the spiritual lesson here. This to me is, is, I won't say it's more exciting than the physics, but this is the climax of the physics, is the spiritual lesson. And let me tell you what's most exciting then about the carbon powder fusion, which is, here's Edgley in his lab and he's got these little glass balls and inside it there's this glowing plasma of carbon fusing. And it's claimed that atomic transmutation, alchemy, real alchemy, is happening. One mouth, Sister Trank, you know, the term alchemy yeah. comes from alchem. Chem, K H E M, was the original name for Egypt because it meant from the place of the blue black blood. Blue black blood. <laughs> Blue, black, blood, and well, there's blue, there's red, and the coils I show are black, so I almost wonder if that is the alchemical talking of live electric chemistry. And speaking of live, we have Gerald, his birthday, live with us today. Happy birthday, Gerald. We just found out it was Gerald's birthday when his brother reminded him. Happy birthday. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> My brother came in, wished me happy birthday, gave me a gift. It's like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and shout out, yeah, shout out to Esra uh, Mindful Exposures, who made this epic logo, Lord of the Dings, the Fellowship of the Dings in uh honor of uh dutch since and i just i had sent it to i forwarded it on to him on uh, instagram but i'm not sure if he uses instagram messenger so i just finally uh re or emailed it to him because i'm sure once he sees this it will absolutely uh make his day if not his week because it's so epic and one love sarah i hope you're doing good mindful exposures and thank you for joining in Hey, and thanks everybody. You guys rock. This community rocks, right? It's that's what... straight, man. Straight yeah. up, they rock. We love you all. You all make this possible, and it's epic. It's only going to get more epic. And uh, we have Dan Winter describing some extremely epic to my work, to your work, to Jeremiah's work, and especially Bob Greenier. Uh, Martin Fleischmann's work here, this plasma fusion, uh, which is also a type of these cold fusions, and that the plasma fusion specifically that a lot of them referring to are uh, in the arc, the ball lightning, this EVO fusion plasma, but that uh, monoatomics, when added into that, uh, take that fusion, the level of nuclear fusion and cold fusion that can happen with matter exponentially up uh, in that lower uh, energy state into hard solid matter as well as then 
uh, my suspicions that the key is then to be doing it in creating those plasma arc ball lightning uh, and in controlled frequencies and field bubbles within the electrolysis uh, um, saline solutions and uh, that that will be the key of one day essentially making the Star Trek generates anything uh, matter microwave machine thingy. But anywho. I wanted to add one quick point to Dan Winter's work. Uh, one of my, I'll say my second coil, one of the biggest coils, something that's been deemed the hopper. Um, it has the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the hexahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron's mathematics um, incorporated into the design. So he's definitely on to something, let's just say that. Or maybe it's me that's on to something. I don't know. <laughs> Take it as you will. I say both. Perhaps. And I say everybody Perhaps. are in this community. And epic, awesome. We got JP joining us in five as well. And yeah, um, it's so shitty. Uh, they cut Dutch's internet for over a week now. And like, I've started to notice and record and document several mysterious internet disconnections and interruptions on my end now, pretty much uh, at least every second time I go live. Uh, and it, uh, Jeremy Reese also experiencing it a lot, but that they've actually cut out Dutch's for a week now is ridiculous. But yeah, so I just emailed it to him and now I'm re-emailing him this one more time to make sure it goes through and he gets it as well as the link to this stream. And I'm telling him uh, to use his phone and join us because he doesn't have any internet because they keep screwing him. But that's the great thing about StreamYard. You can use your phone when needed. All right. Back to Dan Winters. Anki's blood, Hermes. They were the black pharaohs. And it came to me from the place of the Bucanero, the black hole. That, so chem as an alchemy in chemistry, transliterated means access to the place of the black hole. Literally, ability to make a black hole is how you transliterate the word chem, as in chemistry, alchemy. And when, when the early biblical scholars in the Bible, when they said, I will raise a Shem, a chem, I will raise a Shem unto the Lord, that word Shem, Shout out Shem. Tartarian which term. became our word Shem'on, a shaman, as in a Cherokee shaman, a Shem'on. In the Bible, the word Shem, I will raise a Shem unto the Lord. When you now read the Bible, that is your word, the altar in the church. So an altar in a church is actually a Shem. Now, Zechariah Sitchin, he studied this, this term, Shem, from Sumerian for years. And finally, he decided to translate the word Shem to mean high word fire stone, a fire stone that goes into the sky, <laughs> literally a flame. So some kind of stone that makes plasma into a flame is the definition of altar in the church. Now, you know that if you put the stones in Stonehenge in the right geometry, it creates a, a flame of electric charge that dramatically causes seeds to germinate better and faster. So this is some kind of flame also, isn't it? It's a plasma flame. Now, the fun part of what Dr. Edgley is doing, and you can see pictures, at greentechinfo.eu, green tech, T E C H, info.eu. Uh, Dr. Edgley in Budapest, carbon powder plasma fusion. 
Here's the fun part. This is what I'm challenging you scientists here with me today. I'm challenging you to explain this to me. Dr. Edgley is quite sure that when he has this plasma flame going, that anybody nearby that has a cold or an infection or is sick is healed. Oh yeah, this plasma fusion is absolutely measurably a bioactive field, a healing field. You get plasma fusion going correctly, the opposite of fission, and suddenly everyone nearby is healed. Hello? Ask him, it's real. It's serious science. So now here we are serious scientists. We need to know what it is about that kind of plasma flame that causes healing. Here are some clues. There's a famous French scientist named Priory who used what's called a phase conjugate dielectric field. The Priory device, P-R-I-O-R-E. Priory, very famous. Uh, Tom Bearden wrote, wrote about it extensively. Uh, Bill may mention it after me. But the Priory device was implosive plasma, phase conjugate optics and dielectrics, phase conjugate optics and dielectrics, a flame. And in there, the French government documented in that field, thousands of cases of cancer were healed, documented by the government. Elizabeth Rauscher took the same frequencies, which are called phase conjugate, for magnets and did an FDA study, showed dramatic pain reduction inside the compression flame, the compression field. The same frequencies, phase conjugate magnetics. We can show you the equation for those frequencies later. It's called phase conjugate magnetics. Now, we're, I don't want to get into the really fancy physics right away. I want us to really grok the meaning of this, the implication of this. And so I want to really get to this issue of how you make a flame with your mind. Because if you knew how, you would be steering tornadoes, you would be making plasma fusion energies, you would be a sun god, you know? You'd be <laughs> the holy grail, right? So I'm, I'm asking you and me today if we can learn how to make a flame with our mind. And I'm asking you as an electric engineer. You know that for many years, uh, my partner Valerie and I have been traveling the world, and I pioneered a technology called the Bliss Tuner. Bliss Tuner. And with the Bliss Tuner, we were able to measure. This is a lady in Australia having a Bliss experience. And just at this moment right here, she's going, ah, ah, ah. And there are one, two, three, four, five harmonics in her brain waves precisely at golden mean ratio. There's been a lot of discussion here in this conference already about golden mean ratio. Well, I pioneered the measurement of golden mean ratio in brain waves. This is on the right is your right hemisphere. On the left is the left hemisphere. This is the delta, theta. This is the alpha in the brain waves. This is alpha at around eight. What is that? Yeah, 8.5 hertz there. And you see, when these lines line up here, the computer is telling us that, it is, that she has achieved golden mean ratio between the frequency of the alpha, which is here, and the frequency of the beta, which is here. Let's, there it is. In fact, maybe I'll just pause that for a moment. Yeah, so from here at 8.5 hertz to here at just under 14 hertz, the ratio between the frequencies of the alpha and the beta, oops, 
is golden mean. Now, so this, this led me to hypothesize that golden mean ratio in brain waves correlated to peak perception, bliss, euphoria, ecstasy. And others before me had worked in that direction. My good friend, Professor Konstantin Karatkov in Russia, did a lot of work in that. So we came up with a model of what is peak perception, golden mean ratio in EEG. And it, it kind of looks like this. This is what your brain waves are doing. Your brain waves are making these harmonics called a caduceus, which in physics is called conjugating phases. Conjugate means to add and multiply recursively, which is exactly what only golden mean ratio allows. So you get these two, we call it two pine cones kissing noses. Did I put that animation in here? When two pine cones kiss noses, oh, here we have the pine cones kissing noses. The, here's the two pine cones right here on the bottom right. Right there. You see the two pine cones right there? The two purple pine cones right there. Now, your brain waves are making those harmonics and the point between where they cross, right at the center, is where you make a flame in your mind. You're creating compression. It's called a phase conjugate model of compression. You know, when you have Kundalini, you feel this intense burning fire in your pineal gland. I've been there for 30 years, so I kind of know what that is. And we now know where that flame in your mind comes from. It's called a phase conjugate model of perception. Now, as I began teaching this, I met, I met another scientist who was also teaching that perception is caused by phase conjugation the caduceus, recursive adding and multiplying. His name is Stephen Lehar. And he said, yes, it's true that the way you when you see a, a gestalt, a whole image, the way you auto determine the boundary conditions, that you self-organize your relationship to the whole, the only way to explain that, he says, is a phase conjugate model of perception. Now, here's another clue. I'm, I'm gonna give you a few more clues and then we're gonna try to, try to answer the puzzle. Here's the next clue. The, the clue to what makes a flame in the mind. Here's the next clue. The fact that focused human attention causes electric fields to compress. It's well documented and it's measurable. This is the book, it's called Conscious Acts of Creation by one of the most famous physicists, a good friend at the time, is Bill Tiller, Stanford University. And he showed dozens of examples that when people focus their attention, it causes electric fields to, to compress. It causes Compression, implosion. Basically, charge is concentrated in the presence of focused human att attention. So electrically, we know for sure that when you're about making a flame in your mind, it causes the electric field around you to compress. Now, Bill Tiller never explained how that happens. Our job, today is to do that. Now I'm going to give you another clue. There's another famous person. Uh, his name is Ingo Swan. Uh, my friend uh, Bill Donovan, who's speaking after me today, helped me understand this. Uh, this is, I'd like to acknowledge Bill for this part of it. Bill pointed out that when, when they found out that Ingo Swan, he was a famous psychic, you might have heard of him. He did remote viewing to the backside of the moon and discovered there's some astral parasites there, <laughs> very messy. <laughs> 
But Ingo Swann was famous that when he used his focused attention, call it psychokinesis, that it would restore damaged trypsin enzymes, life. So he could create life with his attention. We can understand how now because the enzymes were restored to life by his attention for the same reason that seeds germinate faster in a compression field like Stonehenge, very measurable. So the physicists, the scientists, and the link to this uh, conversation, the web link to this conversation, are in the web link which is dedicated to this lecture today. That's the link where all of the material from today's lecture is located, fractalfield.com slash conjugate mind. The mind that conjugates together stays together. I mean, the family that lives together, loves together. <laughs> so what is a conjugate mind? So it turns out that the scientists decided to review Ingo Swann's ability to make a flame with his mind. And they put a thermistor that was t sensing temperature at a distance. Now, by the way, if you want to do what the tokamak and all the fusion projects are trying to do but failed, all you have to do is control heat at a distance. If you can control heat at a distance, for example, through a metal container, you are the answer to plasma fusion. It's called plasma containment. It's the biggest problem out there. Ask Nassim. He talks about it all the time. Didn't figure out the answer, but he knows the question. So to be able to control the heat at a distance means you have control of fusion. So they did some studies with Ingo Swann because he seemed to be able to control heat at a distance. So here's a thermistor instead of a flame. It's a temperature sensor. And they put it at a distance. And sure enough, he focuses and the thermistor starts to get hot. Flame with your mind. So they said, oh, 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 we got to figure out how he's doing that. So they put a metal screen, a metal screen between Ingo Swann and the thermistor and they grounded that metal screen. Now, if you're an electrical engineer like Bill, <laughs> you know that no electromagnetic normal frequency, no radio waves, <laughs> no, no, no microwave, nothing is going to get through a metal screen that's grounded. Nothing. Guess what? Consistently through the grounded metal screen, Ingo Swann could radiate his focus, that thermistor, make a flame with his mind at a distance through the screen. That means that he was using some kind of wave that can go through anything. Does that sound like God to you? Does that sound like the spiritual literature about the Holy Ghost? Hello? Well, it turns out that there is one kind of wave in physics that can go through just about anything. It's called a longitudinal wave. I'll show you a picture. So what we're saying in this lecture is that the solution to naturally centripetal wave nature of mind and consciousness is also the implosive solution to zero point energy and fusion. The perfect flame is a fire that does not consume. If you ever studied the priests of Atlantis and their toy stone, their fire crystal in Atlantis, they called it the flame that does not consume. You know what perfect compression, perfect fractal implosion is? It's called non-destructive compression because it does not consume. It's a flame without heat. 
it's a cool fire. That would be a good bumper sticker on your way to a rock concert or a rave, wouldn't it? The cool flame. <laughs> so science has a name for that. It's called phase conjugate dielectrics and optics. It's self-organizing. It's naturally centripetal and it is plasma containment. So what kind of wave can do that? Well, they're basically, well, there's more than two, but we're going to talk about two kinds of waves in, in physics here. And again, thanks to Bill Donovan on this stuff. So most of your electromagnetic signatures are a wave that looks like this. It's called a transverse wave. Oops. Whereas on the bottom, this is another kind of wave. It's called a longitudinal wave. See, transverse waves, transverse waves go like this. That's transverse. Longitudinal waves go like this. That's longitudinal. Longitudinal waves, like sound waves, can go through almost anything, including the metal screen. So, here is a, an animation of what it would look like inside your brain. This is your right hemisphere of your brain, and this is the left hemisphere of your brain. And here are two longitudinal waves here. They're compression waves like this, okay? Now, if your brain learns how to do this, like Ingo Swan did, then you can light a flame with your mind. Now, it's interesting that there's a simple way to prove this, very simple. All we have to do is, when we're measuring the golden ratio in EEG here, all we have to do is prove that the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere are exactly 180 degrees out of phase. So one's going up, one's going down like this. It's called phase discipline or phase ratio, 180 out of phase, like dancing. So that would mean if we measured it and if we proved it, that at this point, you can kind of see it here. Let me see if I can get this up here again. See if you can see it. Right here, when the two pine cones are kissing noses, and the bottom right in red, you see how this wave here, if I could stop it, and let's stop right there. So, this wave here, the, w the red wave on top, as it reaches where the pine cones kiss noses in the center, the one wave is going one way, and it has to meet the other pine cone going in the opposite direction, 180 degrees out of phase. In, in, you might call that getting screwed. <laughs> but it actually means the way two screws cross. And the way they would meet perfectly is that, and when that happens, it would create a longitudinal wave. And longitudinal waves would enable you to make a flame with your mind. Now, it turns out that there's very few scientists in the world who know how to make longitudinal waves, sadly. It's sad, but you want to pause compare that picture? image, compare the image we were just looking at about pine cones kissing noses. Compare that to what's called. Yeah, well, let's talk about longitudinal waves, actually, because this is kind of an uh, interesting topic. Right, absolutely. And welcome, Jeremiah. We have exotic propulsion, a.k.a. join the technicians as well as Gerald, WPG Enlightened for Truth too, And uh, I encourage both of you or either of you to stream any portion of this to your channel if you'd like to, or to Facebook, or to uh, Twitter, or to Twitch, or to Rumble, or to Odyssey. And I mention all of them because I am streaming all of them right now. And uh, yes, I'm going to shut up now and take it away, guys. Well, you definitely get some points for multi-streaming in terms of the number of platforms which you simultaneously are transmitting data to. 
it would be awfully hard to get rid of all of it. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly the point, right? That is. That is indeed the point. It's a shame that we can't count on this platform anymore. You know, the primary platform is still going to be YouTube, but Google has really screwed us. Yeah, they like to uh, definitely control the output, <laughs> you could say. And, of course, your, uh, your communist dictator leader out there where you guys are located has not helped with his various builds. What, true dumb? True dumb, the crime sinister? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Trust in judo? Trust in judo. There you go. <laughs> There's no oh, justice in the meaning of his name, I'll tell it, you. It's almost unreal. I mean, still, you're thinking about this from you know the state's perspective, like we kind of rebelled. and Let's go, Brandon. Hey, welcome to all night. What the Flock TV in uh, the house. Good to see you, brother. And... For those that don't know What the Flock TV, you need to check out Paul Knight, What the Flock TV. Every video he does, absolutely mind-melting, then explodes, then talks about it and puts your brain back together again by the end of it. It's awesome. We can all flock off to Flock TV. It's awesome. I'm just kidding. That was a bad pun, I know. I'm sadly not familiar with the <laughs> channel with any of the content, so I'm not even sure. Uh, I'm not even Start sure. Start off with the cinematic post. video one. Oh, yeah. Yep. Hmm. No, in terms Back of producing... scalar waves. Well, yes. So, scalar waves, longitudinal waves. A scalar wave is not a technically correct term, so I want to just start out by clarifying what, what the heck people mean by a scalar wave and what Bearden meant by a scalar wave when he talks about that concept. If you take a charge... If you take a, uh, a terminal, you know, an electrically conductive terminal like a stainless steel ball or a copper ball or you know even a plate, doesn't matter what it's made of, and you either remove electrons from it or you add additional electrons to it, they have an electric field. Every single one of those things that flows up the wire and distributes itself across the surface of the plate. Now, the nature of those electric charges is that they're going to try to push away from each other within the stationary medium of the conductor. So they'll try to move towards the surface. And in that case, you're gonna get a concentration of charge on the surface. And so your full electric potential from whatever number of imbalance charges have been added or removed will show up on the surface. And you can detect that with an oscilloscope or with an electrometer. There's a lot of different devices to detect the electric field. Here's the thing. Everything in this universe travels in the form of waves. So an electric potential, say the charge from an individual electron, doesn't instantly reach the farthest edges of the universe. It has to travel out, and it tends to travel out at velocity c if there aren't other contributing factors. And we'll get into that, too. How to produce longitudinal, longitudinal wave involves the contributing factors. But in terms of the scalar wave, if you just simply charge up some metal object, some conductive object, it will produce what we call a scalar wave, which is a scalar potential that propagates out at velocity c, and that propagation is the wave that's referred to as a scalar wave. So even though a scalar is a point potential, it can still propagate throughout space-time in the form of a wave. A longitudinal wave, however, is a type of scalar potential that's been focused and has a single vector axis direction, which means it's propagating basically in, in an arrow-like direction instead of spreading out omnidirectionally like it normally would in a scalar wave. So the difference is scalar waves are omnidirectional, longitudinal waves are highly directional. So and, the, sorry, the... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Just to clarify in layman's terms, so your scalar wave would basically uh, come outside of the middle point of your system, whereas a longitudinal wave is a focused beam of that wave. Is that correct? Yeah, and the difference is, well, it's, it's pretty much correct. I mean, you don't necessarily say a scalar will come out of the side. It's going to come out kind of in all directions, and right, your scalar right. potentials are going to be the summation of all potentials that exist in that entire system. So like a field. in space-time, they're going to be, you know, there's going to be some arbitrary vector value if you take in all the charge differentials in that single point at that single place in time. And measure them. They're go there's going to be a, a difference in the scalar potential. So it would be somewhat like what some people consider a, a field around the system itself. 
Exactly. In fact, I, I should have I should have described it that way, and you've said it better than I did. A scalar wave is the propagation of the field potential or the field flux. Right. I get that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome. here's the difference. A scalar wave happens whenever you add or remove charges from some metallic conductor. In order to produce a longitudinal wave, there's another factor that has to be added. And in order to account for this, we need to verif we need to uh, at least clarify that space-time is polarizable, aka the polarizable vacuum model. So lots of uh, highly intelligible people have delved into this category, and the reason why it's generally ignored is in current physics paradigm, what we have is something called the gauge factor, which means it assumes the scalar potential for all points in space-time, whether it's the magnetic scalar in form of J-curl tensor, or whether it's the electric potential, which is your E-field scalar. No matter what your scalar potential is and what form it happens to be in, it's assumed to be symmetrical, uniform, and equal at every single point in the universe. But that's, of course, ludicrous, because nothing in terms of physics can work electrodynamically if it was uniform. In fact, the very transmission of a radio wave or an electric potential at all is a demonstration of the non-uniformity, meaning that there's a concentration of the electric potential at one point that's not shared at all other points in the entirety of the cosmos. Kind of uh, like that, um, the potential between ground, like the Earth, and our atmosphere, they say every three meters is a uh, uh, hundred volts potential. Is that what you mean by by that? Um, well, basically, what I mean is that if you if you wait any amount of time and the and the signal isn't changing either position or amplitude, it's going to it's not going to have a radiation value, meaning that there is no there is no dynamic modification in the amplitude of either epsilon or mu. But if well, we change the really... position or we change the number of charges, we get a change in in those factors. With this with the longitudinal wave, though, and this is kind of the important part. We've seen this in Eugene Pogdanoff's impulse beam experiments. We've seen this in Becker and Bat's um, bidirectional forces generated by accelerated electrons. Uh, we've seen this actually in quite a few different categories, including the now missing and gone black projects, uh, Black Brains project, which uh, was doing similar to Pogdanoff stuff and had optimized it to the point where it was operating at room temperature. So here's that third factor. You have to, in order to produce a longitudinal wave, you have to have three things. One, you need a scalar potential. Two, you need a difference in that field propagation, which means that you have more potential at one point of the system than you do at the other. And third, you need, here's the key, acceleration or deceleration. So we're going to classify those as the same third point, acceleration or deceleration. Both are the necessary third factor for producing a longitudinal wave. So a longitudinal wave is kind of like a bow shock. Yep. It's uh, almost like a compression of the electric field. And because the electric fields are traveling out at the velocity of light, when you accelerate a, a charged particle and it continues to accelerate along one single directional uh, axis vector per particle, then it will have a compression of its electric field, whatever happens to be positive or negative, it'll have a compression of that same field potential in the direction that it's moving into and behind it there will be something called a wake field where there is less of that same potential so if you say take an electron and you use a particle accelerator to move it away from yourself very quickly you will see that electron as not having a negative charge but in fact possessing a positive charge and its positive charge will start out at low acceleration. It'll become less and less negative until it basically becomes virtually zero. But at a point, there will be actually an appearance of it having a positive charge because it's already pre-polarized the space it was sitting in before acceleration. And so now that's quote unquote gauged out. And when you accelerate it, now it has to re-gauge its new position. So it shows a positive. However, on the front side of it, as it's traveling towards you, it's going to appear even more negative than it normally does just sitting at rest. And that's because it's experienced an acceleration. So there's a compression of its field. So now, that's effectively the explanation for inertia as well, because we see with the magnetic moment of the neutron, the positive charge of the proton, the negative charge of the electron, and these three things compared against the absolutely not zero 
scalar potentials of the vacuum, we can now have a fairly accurate justification for what the heck inertia is and where mass comes from. By simply considering the electric charge potential of these particles and understanding that the acceleration creates this sort of wake field and bow shock in space time. So would a good analogy be like dropping a stone in a still pond and as the stone uh, goes below the surface of the water, it creates a dip. So that wave that, that surrounds the stone is the charged particle that's at a different potential. And as it goes out, its potential leaves it and it balances back to um, a still pond. Would that be correct in an analogy? That would be a perfect analogy for the gauge factor and the regaging constant that takes place. Right, right. Right, and that's that's basically what we've what we've come to accept is that hey, once you drop a stone in the water and the and the ripples travel out of it, that we're now considering that water level. Um, well, right now in physics, it's kind of ludicrous if you take a small container and you you drop a stone into it. The water level is obviously going to go up because it's being displaced by the volume of the stone. But in physics today, we consider that the volume has not been displaced at all. We just say, well, there's only so much water so the same amount of water is there and we're not going to worry about the total volume because there's only that amount of water well that's like i said that that idea is ludicrous it prevents any kind of understanding for antenna physics radio physics transmission or emission or radiation of any kind of electromotive signals and so it all it all comes down to the major error that happened with heavy side gibbs and heavy, heavy side and Gibbs got together and reformulated Maxwell's complicated equations for something that was designed to be engineered into the electric power grid of the United States, which wasn't a thing yet, but was quickly becoming one. Engineers couldn't understand Maxwell or the complexity of Faraday systems, so heavy side and Gibbs got together and simplified it. Well, so it would be accessible. And in doing so, it got very popular and became the standard. Unfortunately, it somehow snuck its way into cutting edge physics, which should have never used a simplification at all. Like there's no reason to use, um, there, you know, there's no reason to use a reference that's designed specifically to make things easier to understand by removing the complicated variables, which are actually necessary to know the nature of the universe, you know, the advanced physics stuff. But I guess that, yeah. Yeah, it, it was important that Heaviside and Gibbs did what they did. And it helped us generate a, an infrastructure of an electrical power grid. But at the same time, it also snuck its way in to college and uh, university classrooms. And that's where the make, big mistake happened. It should have never been there. It should have been just for the industrial and en electrical engineers working on the power grid and, and stayed there. And now, of course, there's favoritism for it. And it, you know, the, the variable refractive index is not really taught much outside of the optics uh, or particle accelerator communities. So unless you're going to college for something really special, you're not even going to hear about anything of a variable refractive index. That's just considered a constant. They just huh. write out it's, major it's, portions of science and electrical engineering and just basic understanding. Right. It's like it, it doesn't it doesn't really take that much to well move beyond the oversimplified view and I'm not talking about the mathematics side. That's useful in its own right, but it's not necessary to have an intuitive grasp of it. Like long before the math existed, these guys were doing experiments. Math came later after the experimental evidence was in and we had some real numbers to work with, and that came down to precision. But honestly, the most important thing when doing experiments isn't whether or not you have a mathematical equation to describe exactly what should happen or what did happen. It's whether or not you took quality data, because yeah. if we go back in time, we're going to see that it was the quality data, which led to the math, not the other way around, never the other way around. I agree with you 100%. It all comes down to the experimentation, the collection of the data, and then coming up with the math afterwards by analyzing Calculating the, the Yeah, analyzing the data. Exactly. And if you have all a right, solid sorry. data set, then right. you can get into the theoretical. And now we have all these categories of science like string theory and quantum electrodynamics. Box, that Box string theory. And we still got five and a half hours of lectures to play. So I'm going to hit the play button again. And then let's I'll pause again in like 15 minutes because there's some really good uh, 
examples. He's yeah, there's a lot more we can get into by far. Yeah, I, I understand. Four wave mixing in phase conjugate optics. It's just if you arrange for lasers to meet like that, it's called a phase conjugate mirror. You know, when Alice was in the looking glass and then she noticed that the milk was not nourishing because when, when you're in a mirror, supposing you're living inside a mirror, <laughs> inside a mirror, the helix is gonna go the wrong way, isn't it? <laughs> well, it turns out that all living proteins have a helix that goes one way only. It's called enantiomorphism. And if the helix goes the wrong way, then your body cannot absorb it. NutraSweet, I think, is an example of a helix that went the wrong way, and so your body doesn't absorb it. Well, uh, when Alice was in the looking glass, she says, this milk, it's not nourishing. <laughs> Guess what? She was in a phase conjugate mirror. She was in the mirror, and the helix was going the wrong way, <laughs> up the down, up, the down staircase. <laughs> and, and when the helix goes the wrong way, biology it cannot absorb that energy. And in physics, this is called a phase conjugate mirror. And when light bounces off a phase conjugate mirror, does anybody know? I will give you a clue. When my friend Bob Zawada, he taught phase conjugate optics. And uh, when you called him on the telephone, the answer, his answering machine says, please leave a message and I will phase conjugate back to you in the near past. <laughs> because in phase conjugate optics, they call it time reversal. They call it time reversal when they teach it in a physics class. What they mean is that the waves return to a previous state of greater order. I repeat, the wave returns to a previous state of greater order. Now, why would that be important to you? Well, there's another friend of ours, uh, both Bill and I work with him. His name is Guy Obolensky, Guy Obolensky in Slotesburg, New York. And he is perhaps one of the world's living experts on Tesla, maybe also Bill. <laughs> and sure enough, Guy Obolensky built a device to phase conjugate electric fields. And you can pay him and go over there and get inside in order to phase conjugate back to the near past. I mean, in order to get younger. Oh yeah, you can buy it. It's a fountain of youth. It's real, it's possible. Yes, you can reverse aging, absolutely. It's been done in physics a long time. In physics, the way they proved it, if a bar of steel gets rusty, you can de-rust the steel by taking it back to the past. <laughs> Ain't it cool? Now, there's one little complication here. As you're making your plans to get younger, <laughs> I need to tell you there's a, there's a caveat, there's a, there's a condition. There's always condition, isn't there? It couldn't have been, it couldn't have been that good, right? <laughs> the condition is that you can only go back to a past where it is a state of greater order. You cannot return to disorder. That's going to be my new bumper sticker, I think. I'll put that right here. You cannot return to disorder. <laughs> you know, a messy house can't return to disorder. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I want to, I want to uh, go backwards in time. You can't return to disorder. I want to return to my youth. Well, if your body was in a disordered state, 
Now, why can you only go do time travel to the past if you are returning to a state of greater order? I will tell you that's physics for sure. And I will tell you it has everything to do with the flame in the mind. You know what the real fountain of youth is? Guess what it is? It's a flame in the mind. Yeah. Now, we could, we could do the conversation about the biomechanics of Kundalini. Maybe we'll save that one for the moment. The conversation I want to do at the moment about this flame in the mind is regarding the science of alchemy. Now, you all know that I, I, we explained that the term alchemy means access to a black hole, which means non-destructive collapse. So when the mercury thin film is on the philosopher's stone and it's turning to gold, what's happening to the nucleus of mercury to change it to gold? It's plasma fusion. It's, it's a charge collapse. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's possible to predict very accurately the frequencies and temperatures at which you can make all of these atoms transmute into their mirror, into their next element in the atomic table. The real physics of alchemy is teachable once you understand the flame in the mind. Now, my purpose here today is not to claim to do new physics, although we can. We clearly can do new physics. We have a dozen, within our own grasp, at least a dozen technologies and Bill is going to show you pictures today where we understand the electrical engineering of a dozen or more different zero-point energy sources. Actually, from an electrical engineering standpoint, doing the hardware to make the zero-point energy is the easy part. Really, it's the easy part. You know what the hard part is? The hard part is the education so that we can use this in a self-empowered way. Because only if we understand the principle behind it can we use it without it destroying us. So our job is to understand plasma fusion in a way that teaches us the principle. Otherwise, we will be disempowered. Practical example, the famous Joe cell and to some extent the Brown's gas. We now know that the hydrogen atom for the hydrolysis, which is the center of the Joe cell and Brown's gas, I, I wrote the equation to prove that the radius of hydrogen equals Planck length times exact multiples of golden ratio. That was not known until I wrote the new equation. Golden mean dot info slash golden proof. Now, that means that the hydrogen atom arrangement of electron shells is exactly this. This is literally a model of the radii dodeca, ecosa, dodeca, golden ratio, golden ratio, golden ratio. This is how hydrogen works. This is how the sun's heart works. This is the geometry of carbon fusion. Oh, and did you know that the center bond of every rung on the ladder of DNA is hydrogen. So what's going down the zipper of your DNA when you 
unzip and zip up your DNA, the center? Hydrogen. Guess what the catalyst, the catalyst for the carbon powder fusion is? Hydrogen. Guess what the geometry of hydrogen is? Pure, implosive, three-dimensional fractal fusion geometry. So the fusion in the center of the sun is similar to the fusion in the center of your DNA. Now, there's another story that goes with this. And this story is called Fusion in the Blood. <laughs> and for this also, I want to acknowledge my friend Bill Donovan, who is speaking next. We know that inside your body, atoms are being transmuted. It has been proven. The famous French uh, chemist, uh, biologist, Louis Kevron, showed the African miners were synthesizing uh, potassium or phosphorus, and they showed that chickens can manufacture calcium from other atoms. There's many, many well-documented examples that atomic transmutation happens inside your body. Cold fusion inside your body. Well known. Now, Bill says that one of the um, one of the atoms which is transmuted in your body is magnesium. I think is it magnesium, Bill? Yeah. And this is one of my excuses for eating dark chocolate, actually, because dark chocolate is rich in magnesium. And so I'm feeding the fusion in my blood. There's my excuse. <clears throat> Everyone needs some addiction. You know, I was, I was doing a lecture about addiction one day and uh, being very critical of people who were addicted to drugs, etc. And one very young person in the audience said, no, you're addicted to food. And I said, ooh, <laughs> I guess I am addicted. <laughs> so, the point is that fusion does happen in the blood. Now, we know a lot about how the fusion is happening in the blood. First, we're going to look at the geometry of DNA to understand fusion in the blood. Most, most of you remember from earlier lectures that I have done, the way DNA is measurably affected by human Bliss. Remember, here we have the famous story, your heart harmonics. This is the electric field that causes your heart to fire. And this is the fractal harmonic inclusive heart, the frequencies in your heart. And when the frequencies are inclusive, phase coherent, there's more donuts, more implosion in the heart which is called a fractal heart, is a healthy heart. So that means the short wave is embedded inside the long wave in your heart. It's called perfect nesting or perfect embedding. And this is the way Feng Shui is taught, and this is the way heart harmonics is taught for a fractal heart or a healthy heart. It's simply this, that when the long wave, well, fits on the short wave, or you could say, when the short wave fits perfectly inside the long wave, <laughs> it's called embedding or nesting. I think you would call it sitting comfortably in the mind of God. <laughs> Perfect nesting. So what happens in your DNA is this is measurable now, it's been measured, that when your heart harmonics nest coherently, it causes the short wave to embed recursively in the long wave and actually increases the amount of braiding in your DNA. Now, we've been teaching this story for 20 years. 
we know the DNA braids recursively, the thread is braided into string, the string is braided into rope, the rope is braided into very thick fat rope. We say the plot is thickening, your DNA gets thicker. <laughs> well, eventually, this braiding in your DNA, like a Celtic knot, appears to pelastrate, pelastrate, which means to turn inside out. I would turn myself inside out for you, darling, DNA said. <laughs> and this turning inside out means the DNA becomes a big donut. There's a, there's a picture of DNA in a torus, in a donut. So in the center of that, DNA becomes toroidal. This is actually a photomicrograph right here of DNA in a torus, in a donut, just like this. <clears throat> There's one more really fun part of the story of Dr. George Edgeley that I wanted to tell you about. The other, the other half of his website is about his hobby, which is studying ball lightning. Are any of you familiar with ball lightning? Have you heard of ball lightning? This ought to be when good. Sometimes lightning comes in a house and it turns from a bolt of lightning when the lightning beams cross, the lightning turns into a ball like this. Now, the thing that's really interesting when ball lightning forms is that there are documented stories that people can talk to ball lightning. Documented stories. In other words, here's the ball lightning comes in the room, somebody's having telepathy with their ball lightning, and they say, if you can hear me, go over there, and the ball lightning goes over there. And if you can hear me, oh yeah. It's well known that if, you, if you're the least bit telepathic or psychic, you can talk to ball lightning. Anybody know why? Why is it that ball lightning is telepathic? Ball lightning is like a photon, it's a donut. And in the center of the donut, there's a convergence place, harmonic convergence. <laughs> At the center of the donut, where the plasma converges, it makes a kind of plasma radio, telepathy. Remember we were talking about Dr. Karatkov from Russia? He was following the Kogi to where they go to make phone calls to their ancestors, the, the shaman of this South American uh, sacred tribe. And where they go to telephone their ancestors, he measured the electricity of the air, the charge, and he called it fractal air. And what he meant was, electrically, the place where you can telephone your ancestors is a place where charge distribution is perfect. Now the way he measured that, we have, we have three ways to measure that, but basically, in uh, biologic or living architecture, you need to be able to measure whether the air is fractal. So, um, here it is. If you put a, a condenser under a tree, the condenser, the capacitor, in a sacred space under a sacred tree here, the electric field is very able to unpack. Charge distribution is invited. You can do a lot of physics around this as Dr. Karatkov has. And you can show that you can consistently measure whether the space is sacred 
simply by whether the air, the, the, the air in the space is charge radiant. Whereas if you take the same device and put it inside a metal building, the electric field is trapped here. It cannot unpack. So this is the place electrically measured where it is possible to lucid dream. Circle of trees, stone circle, sacred architecture. It is also possible there to have successful birth and death. I repeat, it is also possible there to have successful birth and death for the exact electrical reason you call that sacred space. Whereas over here on this side, where the charge radiance is trapped, the electric field cannot get out. Waves of capacitive charge are not able to unpack. This space is the opposite of sacred. Here, you cannot phone your ancestors. This was measured in a metal building. Do not send your children to steel and aluminum buildings for school. It is not okay for this electric reason. Now, to understand this principle a little bit better, why is birth and death and lucid dreaming and phone calls to ancestors, why is this only possible in sacred space. And at our website, goldenmean.info slash architecture, we show three different ways to measure sacred space. Sacred space is very teachable in electrical engineering. We use a, a gold capacitor and you can feel the little cool breeze, the negative ion wind. And this creates an electric field inside of it where, for example, if you put it here, you feel a little rush, a little charge, a little buzz. The same physics of why a king wears a gold crown because it allows his aura to unpack. And that's the physics of how a king inhabits his kingdom. <laughs> Arthur and the land are one. It, it means that to be the royal blood, you need to be the one whose charge is radiant enough to inhabit your kingdom in the sense that you are the centripetal force that holds the land together. Now, the ability to lucid dream and the ability to take memory through death actually requires the understanding of what is the electrical engineering of heaven. <laughs> heaven. How do you say heaven in Spanish? Cielo. Cielo. Thank you. Cielo. Like sky in French. So the sky is heaven. <laughs> in Spanish. Okay, all right. Well, famous author Lawrence Gardner. Lawrence Gardner was in his book, The Sacred Ark. He was analyzing the electric field of white gold powder sometimes called mana or ormes or the spice monoatomic gold, which later was called Holy Communion in church. He was, he was analyzing the electric field. It turns out that the gold atom in the monoatomic state, <laughs> the proton, the nuclear symmetry is doing this, and the electron 
Well, he's bringing up monoatomics, so I had to pause it and... Yeah, that was a good time anyways. We had other stuff to discuss, and so uh, instead of just, say, playing it straight through, let's get into some discussions. We've also Absolutely. got Mindful Exposure. Uh, do you have their email address? Oh, yeah. That's right. I'd love to, if you're available, Sarah, I'll email you the link right now. Yeah, because uh, him and G had some interesting things to talk about. But uh, Absolutely. I mean... Mindful exposures. Esra, uh, Sarah's excellent. And love to have you on, sister. I'll email you right now. Uh, Paul Knight and Simon C. also uh, sent the links out. All right. We're going to Yeah, that's probably fun. a pretty good point at 221 to you know, get into some discussion and various things. Oh. The video stream for a minute. Should have left it play until two 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 two, but that's okay. By the time it reaches two 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 two, it's gonna be sent to we'll you. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, so, G, did you want to comment at all on uh, on Dan Winter's uh, idea of fractals and how he's seeing those in comparison to what you had uh, discovered in your experiments and various things? Well, I believe he's on the right track in the sense where it all comes down to fractals. Fractals are what activates the DNA that um, is lying dormant. I believe fractals are the precursor to activating the superhuman healing ability that we all have and have all been given. Uh, I think it's been recessed since, well, you know, for quite a while, let's just say. I won't get into that history. That's a whole other topic. But uh, well, the whole yeah, Earth the, geogrid has changed too in time, right? So, like, yes, things that has. we were previously adapted to, they could have been significantly affected. And since we know humans are so incredibly dependent on environmental conditions for genetic, um, what do they, what do they uh, call that? Genetic expression with different um, parts of the genome. Since our environment and our food source and our lifestyle has changed so significantly, I mean, you're seeing some major fallout reciprocations of basically dormant DNA in most of the population for most first world countries. And the irony of this is first world countries, we live nice lives and enjoy them without having to work day and night and stress ourselves off. Well, some of us anyways, I mean, but the whole thing is if you take a look in like second or third world countries, some of them have discovered how to have incredibly long lifespans into the 120, 130 year range and live happier lives with generally better neurochemical balances. And they're basically growing all their own food and they have nothing that we would consider mm, comfort. Well, but they I, seem I to enjoy it and they live long. So what are we doing wrong in the West and in these first world organized civilizations? Well, I think we're all doing something wrong personally, even, even in the, the, third world countries. I think that personally, our genetics has been turned down, if that's the right term, I'm not sure. But through uh, fractal means and through, I mean, you could go as far back as the pyramids. I believe they were a working machine and had multiple different purposes. And one of those purposes was to extend our lives. But that wasn't the all of it, though. I believe that the pyramids created a torsion field, like like time mechanics in a sense, but more like imparting energy, bringing it down from the stratosphere, grounding it so that we can access it. And it's, it's right there for everyone to absorb. But in order to absorb it at a high rate so that it stayed within the body, we needed a key factor, something that they used to call mifkit or mana, or the Philosopher's Stone, hence what Bernie's working on, monatomic elements. And I believe that monatomic elements are high spin rate um, material that we need for our body to absorb that kind of energy to extend our life. If you go back into the Bible, and I've been doing a lot of research on history and the bible and the mechanics of they're all hundreds and millennia years old and like it's yeah, right and our biology and all of that it's all connected and i believe that there's a formula for man to live a thousand years and i believe we once had that formula and i believe it was taken from us by certain things that occurred two thousand years ago i have evidence that i'm putting together or 
proof from research, I guess you would call it, that states that our geometrical grid shifted back then. And because it shifted and we didn't shift with it due to the mechanisms not being in play, our lifespan retarded, for lack of a better word. And we went from 1,000 to 100, 120 years. And that's our max as of now. I believe in this next generation with the work that Bernie and others are doing and what Jeremiah and, and I'm doing with fractals, and I haven't even brought up primary water yet, all that is going to come into play to extend our lives. I fully believe that. Yeah, I don't even think we need to cover primary water right now, honestly, because it's that's just one of those oh, things that's so simple and comes with down. this. Yeah. Like, yep, it, it, com it comes right along with this. And, and the key, the key. let me, well, okay, I will say this, since this is stuff that we've learned based on our, like, ridiculous amount of investigation, research into electroculture, uh, probably goes well above and beyond what would consider what would be considered an, an obsession uh, for some of us anyways. But okay. just, you know, just looking into it, like my, my, my principle on doing research is obsess about it completely to the nth degree during that time you've devoted to the research. So if you're going to spend two days learning about something or, you know, a week learning about something, 100% of your devotion and focus should be into that one singular thing because the human brain learns best when it's not pulled into many directions. Say. Focus on it, get it done, but usually multitasking on many, but it's like they're in stages while you get that one thing just complete. Like this is one of those you know, pieces of life advice on how to be a genius. Learn how to focus on one thing with a singular focal point as a goal. You know, have some kind of a goal that you want to get out of whatever you're doing so that motivation is there, but don't divulge into all these other distractions and many directions in hopes that one of them will suddenly catch your attention and be entertaining. Instead, learn to the depth of whatever you're going to learn about something so you become an expert in that field. And you'll be surprised that it doesn't take very long. I mean, to basically be functional at a level of, hey, I can now do something with this. For the most part, in, in terms of the physical you know, farming, electroculture, uh, electrical experimentation, electrical engineering, and all that stuff. You can learn most of that stuff in a matter of days or weeks to be proficient at doing it yourself. Now, stuff like code, that can take a lot longer. Things that are complicated mathematical systems involve the learning of basically a new language, a language of symbology in, in the physics and mathematical community that they've sort of created and reused these old Greek and Roman and Sumerian symbols to represent certain functions in physics and that's a whole language on its own you've got to learn all that stuff and that's why it takes well it's man-made it's not natural but if it just comes to natural stuff you learn almost anything in just a couple of days so we I would, I totally agree with this. and i can relate because my adhd it forced me to sort of have to relook at how i learn in general and how i process and i'm a very hands-on learner so i feel like that's the main difference with trying to work in like a lecture type setting which is why I actually didn't do very well in college, but I'm looking to go back. And I was grandfathered in, but my brain is very creative, actually. And I was um, allowed to have a very hands-on experience with a neurologist when I started in sleep medicine. Oh, that's and very cool. So, do you work yeah, in sleep did, medicine right now? Is that what you're doing I, currently? I actually was laid off from uh, the hospital I last worked at in January. So right now I'm actually looking at becoming a psilocybin facilitator, uh, oh, potentially awesome. a licensed massage th uh, therapist, because I want to eventually incorporate like, um, obviously Eastern medicine, reflexology, like the chiropractic type avenue, because I feel like it's obviously it's all connected. Uh, like I would love to be able to do acupuncture, but I, you know, I also am like super fascinated in the frequency aspect of things, especially because of my experience with EEG and actually in front of me seeing the effects of like our, uh, our internet through the brain waves and seeing what, you know, what it would do versus like, oh, you know, yeah, when I with all, of that all the time. Right. And then it's like, well, what is this interference? That would be a little, I always remember going, what the hell am I looking at? <laughs> Yeah, because as you, as you did this, about, let me ask you some technicals then. Uh, perfect time to ask you some technical questions since you actually have life experience in working with the equipment. As far as EEG goes, in yeah. the hospital setting, 
when you when you set it up on a patient, uh, and I, I've seen 16 probe systems, 32 probe systems, and I've seen some that can work with as little as I think four. Uh, what were you used to seeing, like as far as the implementation, and how sensitive was it to like trying to get the signal quality up so that it was actually useful? Oh, so like where you placed it was very important. You could tell, like I could look at someone's hookup and be like, something's off. Like you, and here's the other thing, you're cross, you're, so when you're doing these hook, they call it the 1020 system because you're actually getting the signal from across the brain and you're, and then it's specific to each lobe, each lobe center of the brain. So you're doing the frontal lobe separately, you're doing the occipital, the meridian, you're doing, do, if that, in the central, if that makes sense, you're like, you're, seg you're pointing that out, but then you're also cross-referencing that, like the central to the frontal yes. and the meridian to the, to the uh, occipital. But then, so the occipital ones are where I can actually see your eye movement. So when are you're these, in REM sleep. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, sorry to, sorry to cut you off, but if you don't mind me asking, are these extracranial uh, contact probes that go directly on the surface of the skin, on the skull? Yes. Yeah, like we have to prep it, so we have to us uh, scrape the scalp not scrape when i say scrape that makes it sound like it's really harsh no you just like you exfoliate it like i have to pull the hair away and then um place it directly onto the scalp yeah so do you and, like you know, hair, you know like, you don't have a good connection so i mean do you have to cut the hair or or is it pretty much just you have well, to clean off all the dead skin from the scalp so you get a good electrical contact and you just kind of you know bend the hair out of the way and get some good contact i will say i've had like some really interesting patients and situations that they're in. So like you have to improvise, you know, like dreaded type hair situations, you know? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, I understand. But like, yeah, I, I mean, I did everything possible because it made a big difference. And, you know, I could tell because again, you get, and that was something that the reason I, my doctor um, pushed me forward so quickly and through the process and through, like I ended up going into days and doing a lot of work that way, but I, I was scoring sleep studies was because I was really good at patterns. So it was like, you get so used to what it's supposed to look like that you can tell when there's like the tiniest interruption. So like I was really good. Um, so like the type of studies I did too, I didn't always see a ton of seizures, but we did see partial seizures. And those are actually really hard to point out because they're like, you know, fractions of a second. And they, wow. you have to actually, what does that look like on the EEG when, when somebody actually yeah. experiences a partial seizure and you're actually looking at those wave wave shapes, what happens? This is something to where, um, and let me see if I can get, I, I've tried to stack up some good like pictures. So I'm, let me see if I can find something that like shows. Okay, great. And so, um, the the partial seizure looks really quick, but it's a very very sharp fire of the brain. So it's like um, if, if I slow it way down, it's still a very sharp firing. And so the same thing with um, like the grand mal type seizure, you get at like a lot of uh, sharp firing. <clears throat> and if you guys are, here's the other thing is that. Here, let me show actually um, if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead and uh, you can share, you can choose to share a screen or a window. Can I share? Um, we don't have to watch the whole thing, but like to, so that you guys kind of understand like what we're looking at before I even show you what brain, what maybe I should show you what brain waves look like first. And that there's a video that's. There is a video I have that does a really good job of showing like what you're actually looking at with what's how the neuron is actually firing. So what the two difference you're looking at something called an EPSP versus an IPSP. And that's the actual electrical firing between the synapses. So just to kind of explain what EEG is, you know what this I'm saying? Awesome. Can, can I interrupt it for a sec? Yeah, of course. Okay, so everybody that's out there, this is Mindful Exposures. Hello, Estra. How are you? <laughs> Austin, by the way, you just jumped into it both feet. I freaking love it. I'm telling you. Awesome. Work you. It's been a long time, and I'm like, I think I've been itching for this. Like, so I'm trying to, so you all know, I'm trying to do a little documentary series because I want to try to not oversimplify, but break it down a little bit on the connection between or try to uh, help 
and maybe I don't know how much you guys have seen. There's there's other people who you know explain this, but trying to explain what the biofield is and and how zero point energy connects. So I would like to do like this is for like people like yes. my parents. And I'm not and trying to do it. I'm not trying to the now, present but yeah. button at the bottom, Estra, and feel free to share away with all of your pictures and videos and channels and post the links in the private chat go. or in the main chat, and then I'll share them in all of the chats and definitely okay. put this out there. And no way you've been itching for this just a little bit, right? <laughs> this is freaking cool, man. All that, like, I'm going to learn more about EEG in this conversation than everything that I've probably seen online so far, right? Because this is firsthand, and this is what I want to know. I've worked with people who so. build the EEG equipment. I actually uh, calibrated for a company. Oh. And did their, yeah, and their frequency? I can get frequency. access. That's the other thing because I'm still, I am still a licensed sleep tech. Like I, even though I was laid off, like I still hold my licensure, and I, I've, I've considered going back, but I feel like I want to do something else. Is what I was getting at, and I still would love. So there is something called um, neuro uh, biofeedback, which I might have gotten into before, but that's um, they use EEG to monitor your brain activity while they're doing something called like. It's really sound pulse and vibration therapy, or uh, sorry, light, yeah. not vibration. Yeah. I just said the same thing twice. <laughs> yeah, and so they're what they're trying to do is um, rewire your your brain activity in like a trauma type situation, and so that is something I feel on the experimental level, especially with what we've all talked about and frequency aspect. I would die to be able to to be in that kind of research, like. My mom really wanted me to take this job at the University of uh, Eugene because it was it was with the NIH, but it was like part time. It was like the situation. It wasn't great, you know, for pay. It would be like, but it was it was just directly associating mental disorder with obstructive sleep apnea. And I dealt so much with, in my opinion, over excessive uh, prescription of CPAPs, and um, in some cases, ventilatory equipment. So. I really would like to take that to another level. And I feel like like if you guys have heard of ALS, which is a very very much connected to your central nervous system, that's where you lose all functionality of your muscles over time, and specifically with your breathing is is one of the huge ones. And so you have to be placed, you know, on ventilatory equipment, but it's about that misfiring, like what's going on. And so th this is something like I, I would really want to get into deeper. Okay, anyway, let me share my screen. And I don't have a thing that says, because I'm using Firefox, I won't have audio. You may have to open your pointer. It says um, share audio with it, but hopefully, yeah, you may. Firefox won't let me. Yeah, maybe. It's okay, I'll open my Chrome that I like never use and put them in there. You might just have the mouse over it. Yeah, it's all good. It's no, not clarify. There's issues. She knows what she's talking about. So, Astro, when when Bernie has this get together and and you come out, <laughs> oh, hell yeah, and we can <laughs> rent that EEG out here and do some tests with the coils and and have you and monitor. Me out, I might be able to get us one because I have that enough. Be oh, man, no I just have to contact these manufacturers. There's tons of options, and then get the software. And because I already know this. I can teach you guys. We oh, have to please. set that up. We, we have to get that going. Controlled. That would be amazing. Controlled EEG experiments, especially when we're talking about all these super weird effects and we can generate these types of fields, which do have an effect on human psychology. This is one of the strange phenomena that we really can't get much into, but some of these fields will have a, a very visceral effect. On We're human going psychology. full Woo Wednesday today, aren't we? Dude, that would provide some some heavy data. <laughs> like data. Yeah, it would be awesome to analyze all that at the end. Of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, use Chrome. Okay, I think I got it. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention, if you do the uh, acupuncture, I would love to do a test yeah, while you're doing have... acupuncture with the coils running as like an antenna oh. and the acupuncture needles would pick up that energy and then oh run gosh. the EG at I was the, thinking the same thing. thing. No that? way. Seriously, you were thinking the two? 
That's yeah, awesome. Was, That's awesome. Before, my mind was like, oh, what could we do? With yeah, exactly. It's awesome. <laughs> this great is actually. Sorry, go ahead. No, my bad. I was just saying, great minds think alike. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> not it's kind of woo, right? It's kind of woo, but it's not because this is where we stick the woo on the logger and actually record what that woo looks like. In exactly. And that's kind of fascinating about my past before getting into this science like it's field. Like, ooh, I, was very, ooh, I was very into ghosts and I was fascinated and I would always say, you know, what are they and how can we measure it? And, you know, I have my own theories on it now, but. It's anyway, I feel like it's all connected. It is connected. It is. Ghosts are actually residual uh, conscious plasma that has been like, as in the scientific yes. community, they talk about you spin up a vortex and that field stays there for a while after the machine shut off. Well, it's the same effect in a sense. You have, and it's usually over top of a water crossing that's underground or somewhere in there. And there's an ionization of the air that is created at the moment of that person's death, therefore taking a snapshot of their consciousness and replaying throughout time when that energy builds up, hence a ghost. That's oh, man, if I that. may. Bam. For me, I mean, that just, yep, that's what you say. I mean, I could never describe it that way. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> that's great. There is a mechanism, a way to build a machine to produce this kind of effect. And I... I loosely use the word effect because when we're talking about a quote-unquote ghost this can basically be a concentrated energy that has a fixed path and is kind of like a cold neutrino cold plasma um semi-covalent state where you have this assembly of energy that is not necessarily phase shifted into this time frame reference it's sort of like a virtual mass virtual matter and it's highly affected by certain signals so we used to go and do these weird ghost hunts when we were younger, and well, we that sounds like a ghost hunt. and high and voltage multipliers, so cool. and all kinds of fun stuff, and drug detection equipment. You know, quote unquote ghost detectors, basically op amps and comparator circuits that were tuned to be like right on the edge of triggering and could pick up subtle fields. You know, they they go off and show us an amplitude reading if there was something weird going on. Not quite, you know, not quite a uh, magnetometer, not quite a tri field meter, but something that picks up a different type of field flux that's generally not looked for. Uh, but <laughs> there's a way that Adam figured out uh, Space Case Zero comes on every so often. He built this yeah. strange thing called the Curious Device. And you probably have, are you familiar with the story of Adam's Curious Device? Not closely enough. I just uh, know who that is, yeah. Well, let me just explain what that thing did because I we've done a lot of discussing him and I about it and um, various other experiments that we've had similar kind of effects from. And it turns out that there's actually a few variables where if we discuss them, we could probably figure out how to optimize and build a machine specifically for the purpose of producing a pure temporal compression torsion field. So word salad, yeah, temporal oh, compression yeah. torsion field. But what we're effectively doing there is we're taking space time and we're putting a twist on it in a clockwise direction on one side and a counterclockwise direction on the other. If you flip over, you know, looking at the other side head on, then you'll be seeing clockwise. So it basically is if you're on either side of it, you're looking at clockwise and the thing that is, that's across from it is counter rotating. But what we're doing here is taking a magnetic and an electric flux simultaneously pointing with the same vector axis. And we're rotating them through physical motion opposite to each other with a high voltage electrical charge on these uh, these materials. And one of the keys here is that these materials, they have to be able to hold a large amount of electric charge. So say for example, Alexei Cherikov's gravity flyer. Big mystery there uh, in terms of the how it works. And yeah. it's been trouble to replicate the darn thing. A lot of people have tried, even I have my own version, but I didn't properly treat my discs yet. And so I'm not quite happy with it. But the idea is the discs themselves have an aluminum oxide coating. They hold a large amount of charge. Well, what Adam found out is when he ran this machine, it is made of two 18-inch discs. Each one contains, um, I think he said it was 50 segments. I uh, could be wrong on that number. But they are galvanized, they are galvanized steel, which is pin-plated steel. So they're magnetic, each of these segments. And they're very close to each other, meaning they can actually spark to each other. 
kind of like a Wimser's machine. These two discs yeah. kind of rotate, and when they're synced up, because there's magnetic elements on them, just like the Testatica Metherica device, these segments will flip polarity randomly in terms of their magnetic polarization. So they'll just flip around as they gain and lose charge because those charges have a direct magnetic field effect on the polarizable magnetic field moment of each of the domains of the iron atoms inside the developed plates. So what he gets, okay, I'll get to the end of the story. And I'm just describing the details of the device. Oh, so people that want to replicate it you know, don't have an idea how they might be able to do it. So if we've got two 18-inch discs, each one has 50 segments on it. The segments are, you know, cut like pizza slices. They're very close to each other. And they go to about, you know, two-thirds of the diameter to the inside all the way to the edge. And so they're charged up to a high voltage. And as they counter-rotate across each other on the backside of one, one eighth inch thick or one quarter inch thick, 18-inch acrylic discs, and they're glued on, um, they flip polarity. And what this device does is the electric fields of each disc, they try to connect to the other disc. So you have every single atom with uh, an ionized or non-uniform electric charge. And every single electron that is in excess of being in the valence shell of an atom, every single one of those little charges tries to connect to an opposite charge on the other disc. And so what's constantly happening is they're forming and connecting fields. And because the discs are counter-rotating, but they're basically geostationary, meaning that their center axis is staying in the same place in relationship to the room, the ground, and the earth, you have this rotating but fixed in place field. And those electric charges form straight little connection lines between each other. And then as the discs rotate away from each other, their connections get stretched and stretched and stretched and they snap. They basically snap to a new charge. And every time that action happens, it creates a little fluctuation in the zero point polarization for that scalar electrostatic and magnetic potential for epsilon and mu of that local space time. And it ends up creating so much energy emission at such short wavelengths that it generates like a white noise radiated field of insanely high amplitude. And what that does is screw with time. It literally screws with time to the point where he can walk up to it with a temporal differential meter and see the two clock chips drifting away from each other because they happen to be 10 inches apart. And that's enough where one chip is closer to the device than the other because time is flowing differently around that thing in two uh, counter-rotating toroidal fields where it'll actually screw with the meter and show that one chip totally changes its clock frequency. Here's the freakier part though. Even after you shut it off, that T field stays. It sticks around. It seems to be attached to both the machine and the environment. And it doesn't, does it fluctuate? Like, does it? It does, there... it fluctuates back and forth at about one hertz. But wait, this is the weird part, and back into the EEG where this relates directly to you. A yeah. lot of people that he brought in when he built this machine some 20 years ago, they couldn't stand to be around it. He would, he would run it, you know, basically power it up, spin it up, yeah. and let it charge up. And he said that some people literally went running out of the place and down the street and would not talk to him again. I was yeah, wondering. Was one of his friends, another one just, just dashed the heck out of there and it was like a couple of weeks before he uh, made communication again. This thing freaked people the heck out because of the temporal, temporal differential. Like it, it got their fight or flight instinct way triggered and their EEG oh. signals were probably being affected because one side of their brain or the other, whether it was their frontal lobe that was closer to the machine as they were walking towards it or it was you know right hemisphere, left hemisphere, or cerebral cortex, it didn't matter because there was a, a little difference in the rate flow of time, and that screwed with the neurological synapse firing so much that these people kind of lost their freaking minds. Now, he felt this so, too, and he knew what was going on, so he, like, withstood it. And I've, I felt the same thing, and I've gotten some very ill effects from it. This can screw people up. This is dangerous, you know, dangerous crap. Yeah, like, like, like um, okay, okay. Have you ever touched an electrical fence and didn't know you were going to touch it? So it like took you, you know, yep. oh, for yeah. a low end. So like, you know, that feeling you get was oh, it yeah. like that? where it's almost like there's like this weird nausea. Also feels like there's like this heavy presence on you kind of. Well, we've been, I've been hit hard enough to like feel a weight on my chest. Like I was just body slammed by somebody and be seeing stars. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had the, 
I have grew up with two older brothers. I've had the you one talk to only you know, <laughs> time. I fall down bleachers too, so that's an I've always and I have interesting central sleep apnea. We can get into that a little bit. I don't have a lot of it, but anyway. And and head injuries and the association with that and the uh, how your brain activity changes. Here's the other thing, like stroke, like you okay, what you're looking at right now is the left hand uh, there's you see where it has the arrow and it says arousal. Funny enough, I would actually put that back. Uh, oh, quite a bit. <laughs> um, here was my. Oh, so yeah. Looking it at look, it, I mean, I can see where the, the arousal is pointing, right here, but actually. how can you tell the? Is the arousal the little tick mark that indicates a fast transient? No, it's the. It's the. If you can notice, like here's this. This activity right here is quite a bit. Not just like quite a bit, but it's slower than the activity right here. Yeah, much lower frequency. Like so right, right here. here. The fluctuations is, there on the right side past the e, EMG2 yeah. to EMG3, where we see the sudden uh, increase in the differential between these signals. That's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at the differential suddenly spiking. Yeah. So now here's here's what's tricky and what you have to differentiate. This looks more heightened and thicker right here, right? But if you look at this activity and this activity would actually explain. So you're, that's artifact is making it look bold like that. So that's how I can distinguish like, okay, no, the arousal actually starts back here. There's a little touch where they're trying to go back to sleep in these lobes, but in these lobes, they're awake. Ah. This one, um, yeah, oh, see now this is interesting because this right here is almost indicating they were maybe coming out of REM. And it is actually not that abnormal to have breathing disruptions in REM, which is really interesting compared to Delta. And both of those are supposed to be restorative stages of sleep. But what was I getting at that we were talking about? I wasn't trying to get into like- We were talking about, uh, you know, strange yeah. psychophysical effects and ghosts and how it kind of all relates back to these fields. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, oh yeah, we, we got so far into the woo that basically we're three levels deep now. And so <laughs> I don't blame well, you for like- You were talking about, oh, with, sorry. Yeah, kind of like with this, so that, you know, you're hurt. If you're thinking about like your, your brain activity in the different stages are different hurts. Like why, you know, so when you were describing what the, this experiment, it was like, I immediately got that vibe. Like this would alter, this is in my mind, like a bigger variance than, than adjusting our music to 440 Hertz versus 432. Like that's less noticeable. Yeah. That's a lot so less like, noticeable. Like, this is, this is much more visible. Signal through sound, through sound. Well, vibration, sorry. I mean, it's more complex than just like sound. <laughs> because so, what he's right, like what he's emitting is is ultimately giving off a vibration. Right. And but that's what we want to really find out is, you know, how these things, how these things can affect psychology. So we actually have, uh, a pro I'm sure that I would get this stream bumped if I tried to show them now, but we have a, a whole bunch of patents. At the that end. Directly, well, probably shouldn't anyways. Uh it's just sort of like using that keyword list that we found out gets a bunch of trolls automatically sent here, and then the the whole entire thing kind of goes to heck in a handbasket. Oh, now that we know those terms, thank you, Simon, for uh, making that clear. Right. Uh, Shout out to should. my moms who I just helped finish moving after a month every day. Uh, finally, she's at a good new spot, but uh, got all of these different flower seeds from her, as well as the oh, soils. Wow. All the pots, and now the water is uh, ready. So I'm going to stop interrupting you guys. And oh, you're not interrupting. That's actually a really, really nice seed holder. There you got the uh, containers. I think that's pretty fantastic. Ready? But I Mom, do want to say, get that thing the heck out of the sunlight, man. You don't want those temperature. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good call. Just brought I'm the seed. I'm going to money so he can buy an, a cut, like one of those canvas tent things that, you know, is real tall and covers like a backyard area and then you can put all the stuff back there because the vending tent she took some damage this winter the snow was heavy the roof oh, yeah. is caving in i don't know how long it's gonna last i, I don't know how long was. she's gonna last <laughs> she survived okay, ten ten lab, lab, which but won't last winter <laughs> the mannequin graveyard so that's how you're outdoors and indoors at the same time. Now I understand. See, I never quite got that. I didn't realize it was a vending tent. Yes, weird yes additional sir. room on your house. All right. Gen genius uh, usage of space. 
I mean, you you made the thing yeah. radically into a solid structure. There's artwork all over the place. And go. I just figured yeah. it was from the house. <laughs> it's an extension of the burn eye. Man, yeah, I wish I could have one of those. There's a young burn eye. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, hey, G, what you should hold on. Oh, this is cool. Hey, uh, take take just a uh, brief moment there, G. Keep that stuff right in front of you when Bernie's done showing his stuff out. Let's because I want to I want to put Ooh, this on full screen. Yeah. Uh, baby, is that the one? There we go. Nice. Man, I got lots fans. of these I'm gonna, from. I'm gonna go to a local organic farm and get some seeds here. I have some, but mm -hmm. they're not. They're sure, old now. The right word, um, these from, and that's in the states. My, my seeds aren't yeah. packaged as pretty, but we all have our seeds now. It looks like. Welcome, Yeah, these are heirlooms. Hello. Hello, good morning, everyone. Bye. Be kind to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm shutting my camera off now. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no, Thank we, we, have, we have a lot of our seeds. We've got a lot of work to do. In terms a of, lot uh, of startup work. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, we expect the electric culture to seriously speed up the process. So, getting back to the EEG stuff, though, I was kind of I was loving the the practical explanation because, say, you know, I've seen these EEG machines. You can get these little boxes. They're not probably anywhere near as nice as some of these pro uh, medical units, but I mean, they are functional and they'll be like 16 probes in general for most of the kits. And USB compatible on some of the newer ones. Some of the older ones, they just go directly to like a VGA display output which is kind of funny but easy to assemble your own right and you can record that with some some software so yeah yeah the and setup is to run one of those that's awesome it's, to learn about it well and then i can they, to learn the 10 20 method which is how you measure the head and then so you know where to to place everything that's that's actually i mean with your knowledge it's you guys could ease all of you guys could easily learn that so i could teach you that but um this this example too that i had up is in actually a full one that's missing in four uh headlines and the the one thing is that i'm showing you this with it's this is what a sleep hookup looks like versus um like a full eeg often they actually don't monitor emg they don't monitor your breathing or your oxygen because those don't generally fluctuate if as you're a healthy person during the day but i actually think it would be relevant and important to monitor all of that uh, especially the EMG because it's like leg twitching and you know like we we get a lot of restless legs. Oh and yeah, that would be important. Feel, you know, the other thing I'd like to monitor too, because I, I haven't really seen a lot of good graphs or layouts for it, is just take two of the spare channels and measure the the general E flux and B flux at the center of the skull just to oh they have yeah yeah like there's like your end report like does all that for you like you want the full well, differential of everything is that I'm what you're not saying talking about brain signals here i'm talking about actually logging on the same chart using those extra two channels to log external environmental contributors that are electrical oh. magnetic and syn gotcha. synchronize them with how we're seeing the response in the eeg that's what i really want to look for oh. is how do these signals screw with the human brain in a very directly oh measurable way see, that was part of my job it was just you wrote it in text <laughs> just see, like if something happened you had to you know describe like what because like the brain activity would change if if um let's just say like their phone went off unexpectedly which usually we had them turn it off but like it would alter like what was going on so i had to like just type in what was happening <laughs> we had video um but it wasn't like it was synced up like you're talking about which i definitely agree we need to have like, um, and you, are you talking about having an actual like frequency, um, measurement? Yeah. Well, basically what we would look for is we'd have, we'd have two pros. One, we would, uh, filter out most of the noise by, instead of using a coil, we would use a simple Hall effect sensor with a, uh, um, Eddie blocking plate. So something like against a piece of bismuth and the Hall effect sensors on the front. What that would do is pick up any kind of magnetic fluxes that were to enter it. So if we, uh, yeah. just sort of summarize a, a single axis. We can say, okay, the magnetic field changed here. Then if we had some kind of high-frequency EM signal, uh, we could simply use uh, two high-speed rectifiers that were voltage-biased as part of the probe, and that would measure the electric potential. So say, like, you put an ionizer on in the room, and you might be able to directly correlate as the ions are hitting the body and causing these little electrical spikes. 
you'll be able to see it on the EEG, how it's affecting brain waves. So I, um, I'm wondering if we should consider um, a different type of measuring um, the brain activity, which if I'm remembering correctly is uh, the, the, with like a PET scan. Um, no, there's another one. Why can't I think of it right now? It's a, it's an electric magnetic and it Are gives more of a functional MRI system. for brain uh, scanning or. Yeah, MRI. it's like that. Uh, but I, I thought it was a little different, but maybe I'm just not thinking correctly right now. I'm double checking. Sorry. One second. Well, no problem. At some point I, hopefully I don't forget. I want to get your opinion on the God helmet. If you're familiar. The not God the helmet? Product. There's a, there's a marketed product that's tried to steal the name. The original work was done by a scientist in controlled laboratory conditions. He used four electromagnets, green ran off a audio amplifier and put them, mounted them inside of a motorcycle helmet and uh, ran that off of a, uh, off of a machine in the other room, a little audio studio machine at the same time did full EEG measurements on the patients wearing the helmet. And he was able to induce a state in almost all of the patients where he'd shut the lights off, close the door. The room was extremely quiet. Machines aren't really making any noise. And he would then start to ramp these coils at different frequencies. And he would watch the EEG response, mapping it live with the input frequencies of a uh, two-phase coil system. It's just two-phase. But they yeah. were just, you know, right and left channel, basically. Yeah. So, uh, crisscross. And he was able to bring the EEG into a state where the people were still fully awake, but they experienced what happens in sleep paralysis to some extent on the conscious level. And almost all of them reported feeling entities or spirits or other things oh. in the room with them. And yeah. those signals he recorded on the EEG to know exactly what that looked like when the brain was making this assumption that there's something there with you and triggering that kind of response. So I thought- Jeremiah, what you're right. referring to is what he had termed the sensed presence that the uh, the volunteers or, you know, the people, you know, helping them conduct the research and actually going into the helmet. The sensed presence is stimulating particular parts of the brain, but the main one was the temporal lobe. And so he theorized from there that this area, along with a few other regions of the brain, evolved over time to give us this sense of connection, the sense of otherness, so that we could have those spiritual experiences. And then right. from there, you kind of draw your own conclusions on what that means. You know, if you're actually connecting to something or if it's a evolutionary result of um, consciousness uh, coping with mortality, you know, you can get very yeah. existential from there. But um, yeah, I believe you're referring to Persinger. Um, hey, there you go. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Per yeah. Persinger. Thank you. Pers per Persinger. Yeah. So that that's the guy that uh, worked on it. He was based out of Ontario, I believe uh canadian and uh this is way back in like the early 2000s so yeah it's it's been around for quite a while at by this point um everyone prop not everyone but people interested in this kind of stuff and interested in actually getting the results and the kind of results that you can get from eeg or uh you know from magnetic you know transcranial stimulation this is where you're actually going to get some of that uh, empirical data that uh, people feel or think is missing from the research. That well, I would agree with the skeptics to some extent yeah. here because I, I do think that there's a tremendous lack of the research compared to how much claims are being made and how, how many claims are being made on this topic. There's just, there's a big discrepancy well, here yeah. in this science compared that's to other true. science. And that's because people really haven't, like, oh, man. I have you say, guys heard of, uh, regulate this. well, sorry, you guys have heard of narcolepsy, right? Yeah, oh, so absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So sleep paralysis is directly associated with uh, narcolepsy. Most narcolepsy patients experience it. And what's happening is they're not, they're not properly uh, 
their REM cycle, it's like their cycles are completely messed up. So the minute they fall asleep, they usually go into REM. It usually causes some kind of uh, startle awake. I'm saying that term wrong. There's an actual precise term for it, but it's, um, so then what it does is it causes them to wake, but they're still, your body paralyzes itself. It releases hormones so that you don't enact your dreams. And then in that case is what, what so what's happening is you're waking up in the REM stage and which is why you hallucinate because think about what dreams are. This is why this is interesting too, because I've actually this had. Sorry, to get into, out. sorry, go ahead. To return, but I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to interject, but this perfectly segues into territory that really gets me excited about um, the explorations of neuroscience seeking to explain conscious phenomena. Are you familiar with um, Thomas Metzinger? I can't, if I can't pronounce his name. Yeah, Thomas I think that's right. Metzinger. Yes, he sure. actually, uh, some of his earlier work back from like the earlier 2000s, he simulated the sense of an out of body experience by um, using virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it was. Oh, you know, this case is this, so good. This, yeah, yeah there, there is this conflicting visual somatosensory input in the virtual reality uh, that would disrupt the people participating in the research. And it would kind of create this jarring effect where they were in and out of their bodies and so well, let's explain um, the uh, scenario here because a lot i'm guessing that actually probably most people haven't heard of this study so what they did i mean you want to explain exactly how we set it up to create this kind of surreal experience for the participants or would you like me so he actually used uh virtual reality to to he he had people exposed to a virtual reality environment where they're getting visual and sensory input if well, if, if do... I may, so here's what he did he, yep. he took these people and he had them stand straight up in most cases i think he also did some with them sitting down and um as they're as they're standing there actually i believe uh, most of them were done sitting down later on because he found they it's, it's easier for them to kind of integrate this so they're wearing a vr helmet and they're looking at a vr picture of somebody that's sitting in a chair just like them or standing in the, you know, in a room just like them. And usually this is a mannequin for the experimental sake, but they're watching the mannequin. They can move their head, they can move their heads around and they, you know, it maps to move the uh, head of the thing that they're watching. So they get this association that what they're looking at is their own back, even though it's not actually them. It's, it's a VR simulation of a, you know, 3D character. And so in order to entrain the mind that this thing they're looking at from a third person view is themselves, even though it's actually not a video of themselves, somebody uh, comes up, one of the scientists comes up from behind and a VR secondary character comes in from behind the VR character they're looking at, which they associate with themselves, the one that's responsive to their body movements. And uh, so the, the secondary VR character strokes their back or taps their head or does various things physically to the body and the other person in the room, the scientist, also taps their physical body as they're sitting there so that there's an association made with oh, that thing that I'm seeing is actually just me. Then you can check the EEG response. Now a threat is introduced. Somebody comes up behind the uh, virtual character that's not them with a hammer, but this time no other scientist is in the room. They're just observing. And the person will usually react when they see this by jumping out of the chair or there's a huge spike in the EEG response or a fear response because they've associated the virtual character with themselves through the sensory entrainment done to their physical bodies. And it was amazing how complete the link was with these people's minds and the virtual character that was created. They really, you know, got well, this, this was their, what they were looking it's, at. It's, 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 sorry, really quick, if you guys have heard of REM behavior disorder, that's where you act out your dreams. It's like me seeing it on the other side. <laughs> Like they're enacting it through the VR set, right? But it's like these people get up and they literally are acting out what they're seeing in front of them. And right. I, oh, yeah. yeah. This is this is the physical kinematic VR, the kind that I actually think would be, uh, you know, not so terrible if environments were designed around it. 
But so, about people destroyed their own TVs and stuff because of VR incidents. Now that's funny enough on its own. The, this early, this early work that he did was um, a basis for what he termed the, you know, the phenomenal self model, which is the content of all of your bodily sensations, your emotional state, your perceptions, your memories, um, any actions you might be taking any thoughts you might be thinking. And it, he wrote this great book called um, The Ego Tunnel, The Ego Tunnel, excuse me, The Ego Tunnel. And it, it does get a bit dense. It's deep, not just into the neuroscience and psychology, but also the philosophy as well. And it, it, it through these experiments, he kind of dissects what really is uh, the self. Um, so if anybody's interested in out-of-body experiences, just to summarize that guy up, um, and is willing to chew on <laughs> a book, he, he's got the ego tunnel out there, uh, and, uh, uh, numerous papers, um, he's moved on since then and has done further work on studying the nature of the self. So lots of things really out there. I'm really getting actually into that right now more and, mm -hmm. Um, I'm doing a lot of research on trauma, actually, and the type of data that is actually the studies that have been done to show the effects and, and the type of, like, have you guys heard of neuro-linguistic programming? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, okay. that's been yeah. around for decades. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, just that yeah. kind of idea. Um, obviously, there's more to it. And, um, but, the, so the, anyway. The, I'm philosoph just, the philosophy <laughs> of how they try to sell it i find a little disturbing but um yeah the, like crazy, the techniques right? that the tech the, te the techniques that are employed are interesting to see like who they work on or how they work um but i <laughs> i steer away from nlp just because of the philosophy backing it up it's uh it's a little a little too a little too much <laughs> Um, I get that. But what, what is interesting is there's other forms of that in a sense. There's there's something called like NAT now too, but the, the data behind actually the effectiveness of it. And really what I think it's just getting down to again is that trauma. And this is sort of hard because uh, these are things that I think we as, as a population, we feel we're tough. We've gotten through these things. There's, I don't have these issues. This isn't it. And so this is more of like, something that maybe is beneath the surface. Um, but just for my own personal experience, like I have, um, I was, you know, half-ass diagnosed by, and don't mean to be rude, but I had better success with like a naturopath type doctor, that, which was an MD too. But anyway, um, well, I believe diagnosed with that. sorry, go ahead. Say that again. Oh, no, I, I'm all the way with you on, you're probably helping yourself better than going to just an average yeah. therapist. And then you probably had to find a more natural path towards your wellness. So, yeah. yeah and I, this is actually connected yeah. to endometrio endometriosis. I can't even say it all of a sudden. Endometriosis. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm tongue tied this morning too. Okay, good. I also drank maybe too much coffee already. But um, anyway, yeah. So that in itself, um, this with the emotional aspect of that is sort of what I'm connecting it to is there's rage and anger associated with endometriosis and and that you know it causes heavy clotting you know heavy pain that kind of thing so that fascinated me it fascinated me when I had to think about when that started for me and it potentially had to do with actually like a best best friend of mine this is and I'm getting super personal guys but I'm a total TMI person but a best, best friend of mine um, got like my first boyfriend ever. They hooked up like they she got to stay out or whatever. So they like it was like homecoming night and they hooked up. And and afterwards we had discussed it. And I felt like because I'm a very I'm a pretty calm person overall when it comes to like forgiving people and, you know, going through the grudges and stuff. And so I forgave them both and felt that I had forgiven them, you know, really well. Well, what happened was I went through a phase after that and she, that friend that best friend had I was I tried pop for the first time and she disowned me as a friend because of that I I had a lot I had anger over that I think because of what I had forgiven her for 
and what, you know, she couldn't forgive me for kind of a thing. And um, so anyway, that, that was directly associated when I started having, and it, there's other, there's another thing more, a little more personal too, but that, that when that time started for me. So this is me, you know, breaking down that emotional state of what, what happened, how it affected me and what it turned into. And now I'm, I'm actually working really hard on that forgiveness. I've also done acupuncture, which was amazing and found out that it's, you know, there's some digestive issues connected and like how much digestive stuff is connected to our wellness and our emotional brain, obviously, because of that second brain concept. You know, I, I'm sure you guys. Oh yeah. There's most, most of our serotonin is in our guts. So yeah, yeah, I mean, make your gut happy. Your, your, your mood actually does improve. So yeah. Yeah. But I do feel like there's still people that can eat like the most processed crappy food and not have problems, you know? And, and I think sometimes that comes down to life. It catches up with everybody. It's just a, you know, I think some people, I think think it's, I think it's a partially also body awareness as well. They seem fine, but they're not as sensitive uh, kinesthetically um, for one reason or another. And so they don't realize that they're having health issues until it's very severe and it can't yeah. be ignored. And so, that's sort of what we had yeah. too with like maybe forgot forgotten traumas that we mm-hmm. hadn't we thought we dealt with, but we you know, and so it's just because you've heard of and I've talked about this before on the show, but German New Medicine and his concept is this is a you know, right and left brain, like your you hurt your left knee, it's associated with the right part of your brain feminine versus masculine maybe you had an issue with a female or or a male and then it's breaking it down yeah. to like what's that emotion i'm but thinking like, of i'm thinking of alexander lowen he was uh he did some pioneering uh psych- psychological work in looking at rigidity in different parts of people's body and figuring out that they were locked up and they didn't have as much mobility in certain areas of the body because they were holding on to trauma. And so through a combination of talk therapy and movement exercises and yeah. some some kind of probably woo sounding stuff, he he helped totally. people release that body trauma. And if that's yes, if that's the area that you are speaking to. You, if you haven't heard of this book, I invite you to check it out. It's it's yes, also another pretty chunky book, but highly sorry. recommended. Uh, the body the body keeps score. Have you oh, I'm sorry, I read that. So yeah. I for some reason <laughs> that didn't I didn't directly connect that part of it to it, but I probably yeah. have it marked because I want to re go back and reread it. I just oh finished yeah, it. it's I it's it's like, there's so much information in that book. So much. Uh, you know, it, it it sounds like it's a soft, fluffy, feminine book or something, but like you open yeah. it up and there's like tons of information in there. And if you want to learn from it, you're bookmarking a lot of stuff. So the body keeps Actually, score. If your interest, if talk therapy alone hasn't worked for you, and you're having aches and pains, and you want to come at it from what I would say is the indirect approach, the the body is a great way to access a lot of these things yeah. because the body he, holds on to a lot of, of Sorry, I'm interrupting. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, we're we're both just really excited. That's fine. What what were you trying to yeah, say? I'm like, yes. I lo- that book is sort of my little Bible at the moment, but it it um because I reference a lot out of it actually and I um want to utilize, I'm going to utilize a lot of the information out of it when I was putting together the documentary. Um, because I think the data out of it, and that's what I was getting at. Um, I thought he did address NLP in that book, but he does address, he does a really good job of get, overviewing a little bit of the history on uh, neurofeedback as well. And then um, just really good, like he intermits little stories in there, but a lot of people say it's like, if you're seeking therapy, to be careful with that book because they say it's more of a textbook versus like a, but if you, um, yeah, and that's if, why you're, if you're an unusual pioneering individual and you realized early on in life that you kind of have the ability to self heal, we're not recommending this as diagnostic medical healing advice, but 
you know yourself best. And if you're one of those people that likes to go out there and learn stuff, it's a great book to learn from. I'm going to yeah. post it in uh, Crypto Alchemist. Yeah, do that. I'm post the title there because it's a, it's oh. actually a longer title. And I'll give the people the... And another, one that, well. um, another one that you should read um, if you haven't, that this I haven't actually gotten to read just yet, but these both those books were recommended to me. For, uh, she's probably not in here. Her name's Mish. She's a nurse in uh, London. Super cool, super super cool chick. Anyway, she um, she recommended the, the another one that's uh, called "When the Body Says No." I'm gonna pull it up so I can pull it out of my bag here really quick so I can tell you the author. So yeah, I I just posted "The Body Keeps the Score: Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma" by Bessel Van Der Kolk. Yes, thank you. That is his name. <laughs> I think yep. when you said it, I heard something else. I might have mispronounced that. I did my oh, best. I it is correctly great. typed in. Um, but for for everyone that might not be watching Crypto Alchemist's chat, it's in there. And if you could just pin it for everybody, really briefly, I saw some people saying they'd like to know what that book was. Uh, that would be helpful. Um, um, what I'm going to do is I'll get the Amazon links for you guys. How does that sound? Yeah, I, I I was I wasn't sure about posting it, but um, yeah, it's cool to post Amazon links. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and it it is. I'm pretty sure, right? I I don't know. <laughs> I I think I've seen other people do it, but <laughs> um, mostly because like they're promoting their own books. You know, right. I think. Oh, there's Bernie. Uh, yeah, Bernie, yeah, we were I, I just... heard, I got it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a picture I was trying to show. Change a tire. Well, hopefully you're all good, Gerald. And I just see... Oh, the yeah. So, uh, you posted it in crypto. Oh, there we... Uh, I got the Body it. Keeps the Score is a book that I, at least right. one or two people were asking about. Did, okay, another, another one post. I would recommend in all this, too, is uh, Super Genes. Because that connects the meditation, uh, how that changes the DNA, or, or change. It shouldn't say changes the DNA necessarily. Their their research showed that um, the end of the DNA, the telomerase, would affect. It could be mutated once it if you were, you know, if you reproduced. But it did turn on and off the activation centers of the DNA. That's another, I think, good one too, which gets into data and. It's you know you can get geeky about. Um, this is why I kind of think epigenetics though, might be more yeah. archetypal than what's considered now. It um, might not be. You know. I can copy paste it one more time. Yes, oh, please. sorry, my I'm I'm on my phone, so it's a little awkward. Um, oh, I posted the book already. I already okay. did that link. There, you should be able to see it again. The Amazon the link. Oh, um, she. She posted the Amazon link, but I can. Oh, okay. You're just posting the name of it, not a link. I see. Yeah, gotcha. it's live. Yeah, I, I was just saying for anybody that can't read right. that chat, you know. Oops, maybe. that N was not supposed to be there at the end, oh. just MD, but I posted it in all yeah. of the chat. Sorry now. about that. Here's the other one that I can't post the link for. So, and I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to promote Amazon. <laughs> I just sometimes oh, good. I need to get myself a full Amazon account with all the affiliate links and might as well because it's there. Why not us all make just a wee bit off of it? You know, like get free stuff for the science we're working on from Amazon. I don't know. In some but ways, I think you have to give in to some things. That's what I it's like. Use I think the system the, to change the world for the better. Sorry, problems. <laughs> yeah, I actually have not read when the body says no, but it sounds up my alley in that area of uh, self-healing and trauma research. Um, I'm a woman of many facets, so I'll definitely check like out that, that book as well. What are you showing us, uh, JP? Oh, yeah. 
He's shown yeah. us. Oh. Yeah, what we're looking at here, uh, I'll step away from it. There's so nice. those are, every one of those LEDs there is a five watt, all except for one of them, that's a three watt. But those are all five watt um, little chip LEDs. And each one of them is a different wavelength. And just to kind of tell you what those wavelengths are, if we're going from the left to the right, you know, grab all these, walk through what they are. I found out, I'll add this ahead of time, I found out that there's a really, really fascinating new technology with LED colors. So previously, we have to rely on different elemental compounds being mixed together to form a lot of even crystal that when activated and having electrons flow across a regional junction where the electron shells in the crystal can absorb only a specific wavelength and then re-emit it. That's how we used to make LED crystals, you know, in GAN, various things like that. But now they have this new crazy technology and I didn't even know about it until I got these things in my hands and looked at them, especially for the blues and the UV LEDs. They actually use a crazy ultra nanoscale diffraction grading type of material. And my guess is it's probably printed via nanolithography onto some optical film, but they actually are using an internal sort of Bragg reflector to selectively produce different wavelengths by using the same pump dye. And that's why we're looking at different brightnesses. So here we go from the left to the right, those LED wavelengths are, and let me see if I can, uh, I guess I can't really get my mouse on this, but yeah. 940 nanometers, 850 nanometers, 730 nanometers. So those are all considered in the infrared range. Then we go to our first visible, our fully visible. That's the fourth one to the right there, 660 nanometers. Uh, number five, 620 nanometers. And that's kind of that orangish color. Now we get into our 600 nanometers. They call this orange. And that's going to be number six in the slot. It's not quite orange. And then we have our 590 nanometers, which is just about looking the same as that orange at slot number seven. Um, we have green, 520 nanometers, ice blue, 480, um, blue, 460, royal blue, 450. And then we're starting to get closer to our UVs. Uh, we have 420 nanometers, which is still in the deep violet. Now we get to officially UV, uh, 395 nanometers. That's UVA 385 and 365. So that's the entire chain there. Now, why? Why have all these individual colors of LEDs? People are probably thinking, well, if you just wanted colors, why not simply uh, mix together three different colors, you know, RGB? Because these LEDs are not designed to stimulate the human eye. These are designed to stimulate various specialized samples of exotic materials and uh, metamaterials that we are working on manufacturing and to move something that Brandy Aquino has recently, uh, or he referred to in a paper as a photon gas, but also to move around a positron electron gas. And that's the real key here is to find exactly the perfect wavelength within the available LED range that exists on today's market, because that's pretty much the whole darn thing. There's one more that's coming. It's a one, uh, 1,050 nanometers. And that's not here yet, but it's on its way. But we're going to find out exactly what the perfect wavelength is to produce these strange gravitational effects and activate gravitational isotopes. And once we do that, then we just need a whole bunch of that same thing. And this will allow us to selectively choose each individual wavelength one at a time to activate elements. And you can't buy anything like it. Really, the only thing that you can kind of sort of get that's approaching what this thing will do, cheap LEDs, is to build a, what do they call that thing? A... Uh, Quant uh, super continuum laser. A super continuum laser uses a pulsed fiber to produce different wavelengths by tuning the mirrors. And you can get, you know, pretty wide wave spread out of one of those things. And I did actually want to build one of those, but it's a lot more expensive than simply buying these off the shelf LEDs. And hey, if they can work, this is going to be available for everybody to replicate stupidly easy because these are on the market now. So. So I need to buy a whole new set and my goodness, replace yeah, all of the lights with the new lights. Yeah, there's no, it, it will be, it will be ridiculous to basically, uh, 
to buy these. Like, honestly, there's there's really no reason to have to get all of those various LED colors unless you want to do science of um, spectroscopy on them. Uh, and put your yeah, we go to a lab then. Oh, by the way, I should mention something else that's kind of cool. Since I have a wide spread of all the colors, and if I put them all on a single heat sink, which I'm going to do, it turns out that laser diodes and LEDs are both subject to wavelength shifting by liquid cooling and nitrogen cooling. So it is possible to actually spread the frequency of each color uh, onto the next step where it's missing in order to perfectly tune them just by simply freezing them, essentially, with liquid nitrogen or something else like that, or bringing them down to a colder temperature until the wavelength shifts. So, uh, yeah, we can actually cover with that gambit the full spectrum from the 355 nanometers, because our lowest is 365, and we can ship it down 10, all the way up to our 1,060 nanometers, which is 10 above where we're at one with, uh, 1050. So, yeah, there we go. I wonder if Very I should cool. for that, if uh, people would find that scientifically useful for experimentation. Okay. I don't think it's going to hurt anything if you open door. I'm sure a few people working with the weird sciences will probably find some use in it. Exactly. It's probably oh, expensive there's to always manufacture, people but, out there that's... You, it's a breakthrough, right? Just the right dots connecting uh, the puzzle pieces. A weird equipment for weird science, man. I mean, the, the entire idea of uh, trying to simulate an element or a composition or some kind of mixture and make it act like, what, it's losing weight? Like its inertia has changed? Just getting these physical effects out of materials like that is something nobody is really looking into in the mainstream. I can promise you aerospace companies are, but other than them, and they're never going to talk about it because that's probably their, their most valuable secret of debt. And I'm sure some some valleys of the military are, but in this case, like, where is it in the private sector? Who's really broadcasting? How are we doing these experiments? Like, who's building a ridiculous freaking 17 or 18 LED chain? Jeremiah is 222 years old, and Gerald <laughs> is, I'm not exactly sure, but it's his birthday today. So happy birthday, Gerald. And we just hit three hours, 33 minutes, 22 seconds, and now hitting 33 seconds. Three hours, 33 minutes, 33 seconds. Happy birthday, Gerald. We're going to be three, 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 three. Oh, and you have the Master Builder 33 born at 303 on whoop, whoop. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. He continues. Illuminati confirmed. Hmm, I wonder if I can use Peltier junctions to like do a digital wavelength shift. That would be really freaking cool. I could make that whole damn thing electronic. RJ is Illuminati confirmed. 33 RJ, years are old. you a master builder too? Uh, I, I only ever made it to the first degree, or I never made it past the first degree. No, no, no. Can I reference that? Hold on a second. I'm out of here. Hold on a second, guys. I'm not a mason. That's not what that means. <laughs> if you've heard of numerology. <laughs> Uh, no, I you got know, blackballed and booted for them. not paying my dues. I'm in a, I'm in Mason arrears. I never oh yeah, they want you to water. pay. They want it's like Taekwondo, but they say for your like Taekwondo for your soul, right? And it's like you gotta pay your dues if you want that next level. I'm I'm willing to, you know, be, be good at self defense, but I. I don't want to be a master, that kind of master builder. <laughs> There's something in, if you guys have numerology, you take your birthday and it's like supposed to be your life path number. And some people are master builder 11s, master builder 22s or 33. So that's what that is. So it's just like, it's like that. My, it's our, remember, Liminal, you were saying what you were, I was mentioning one day in the chat and you're like, what, what's your Myers-Briggs? I was talking about it's like a different, but it's like kind of related to astrology. It's related to your Vedic chart. I'm Mine sorry, can you, that. Can you sorry, say that ahead. one more time? It, it's one related time you to... and I were talk, sorry, we were talking in chat. I was talking about like different types of, uh, like there's, 
so like it, there's there's the astrology right of your mm -hmm. personality um there's the really super basic one which most people don't connect with but then there's something called vedic there's something called a jovian and then there's like numerology and then oh i was just saying, jovian gets really weird um yeah it does it, it got surprisingly weird for me i i was like what is this and then i looked into it a little bit more and i'm still gonna say it's weird in the sense that it seems just as cobbled together and as convoluted as uh complex astrology does but in it you know like yeah. many me like many systems they can all kind of reveal and reflect something back to you it's yeah. it's weird stuff um yes, but what, all, what system are you know? talking about what what number am I talking about? Is that what you no. said? Sorry. Oh, you you were saying that we were we had been previously talking about some system. Oh, the Myers Briggs. The, the Myers Briggs, Briggs is, yeah. is like the most well renowned typology test. You know, the only scrutiny I would put on it because I felt this way when I retook it because I actually realized that when I first took it, I came out as an N an INT shoot. I'm gonna mess it up. I know I'm like JP or something. At your INTJ or P, J or P at the end. Yeah. Hold on, I can pull it up because I totally saved it. <laughs> anyway, I think I know I, what you're getting at. Uh, the, here's the thing. And then many, I retook it. Pe many people will <coughs> if if they go through changes, yes. significant yeah. behavioral and personality changes, you will score differently or it might be indicative um of i don't want to say <clears throat> it might be indicative of having a personality that is always changing which may be a sign that you want to get something checked out and liminal um, you like the cia I, talks about that there's like multiple versions of these in a sense and i think it might be mm -hmm. because we probably all have a little bit of like a multiple personality kind of thing. Right. Not to the full extent of, you know, maybe being diagnosed, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I but mean, I, I, I would say like if over, if over a 10 year period in your twenties, you know, like for me, I was an ENFP all the way. And I just what thought that mean, was. Me, myself I, and I all exist within burn. I, I thought that's uh, I thought, yeah, I thought that was what I was going to be. You're and, right. Uh, Going into my 30s, I turned into an INTP. So there no, you go. That's okay. like, that's interesting. So like, I'm pretty sure I was an INFJ when I yeah. first took it. And now I'm an ENFJ. But yeah. I think that was because I was depressed when I first took it. I was going through a lot of depression. That makes sense. And so I'm wondering if that's why, right? Because I was way more introverted. I mean, I, st I still can be. I've. That's the thing is that I... I some just people, found some people have more <laughs> consistent circumstances or more fixed personalities, and they're going to reliably, over the course of their life, score as one or two types that are very closely related. Or you might find that uh, as you go from your youth and to your, uh, you know, your adulthood, um, that that type changes and that that's actually yeah. not unusual um a, a good a good a good way to see if it's like fairly stable is just like over a several year period you can test yourself a few times and so you know see actually, where what's kind of cool for me is that this actually they, they call enfj the teacher and that actually connects to my master builder is supposed to be i'm, I'm an educator and my Jovian is I'm a master generator, which is, I think it's all connecting to me being like an educator. Oh, which man, is funny I, because I, my job in I know life. I have my Jovian saved somewhere from way back when. I, I, I can't even remember what mine is. Um, I'm not, I'm probably not a master builder though. I'm one of those, I'm one of those people that's meant to bump into things and find out what doesn't work. So I can good tell chaos. people what does work. I'll agree with that. I think I am good chaos. I always, I'm the bull in the China shop and I'm the triple horns. I'm an, I was born in the year of the ox. I have both Aries and Taurus in my sun and moon. It's like triple horns. It's good. You got a good chaos is important. That's the thing. Like I think, 
you know, some people were like, oh, the, you know, they're disrupting things and they ask too many questions, right? I'm the person that asks too many questions. <laughs> and so like, you get, you get a little annoying sometimes. Well, I did to people. I'm not saying you do. Um, and so, cause you didn't, you've never annoyed well, me. Well, you know, you know, there are times. <laughs> okay. Calm down. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway. Don't worry, so, love it. <laughs> so anyway, it's good. It'd be, I think people need to be more good chaos and it's, that's what, um, shakes things up. It's what gets people to potentially see, you know, another way, and you know, it may be a, a form of healing. I agree. And um, if you go far enough, everything meets up. Not to generalize, but it really, it really does overlap. If you're into optics, you're going to get into chemistry and gases and. If you're coming from the agricultural side, you can end up doing electroculture. And, and yeah, I was growing I was growing crystals a couple months ago, and now I'm doing electroculture. And two years ago, I oh, was I studying, you know, electrical engineering and all kinds of stuff. Cool. I mean, I throughout the course of my life, I've been through so many different things. So we are multifaceted individuals coming together, yes. trying to figure this out. That's so funny because, yeah, it's, I, I've been called jack of all trades. It's, I dabble in a lot of different things. Jack and, of all trades, master of some. Okay. <laughs> oh, I like that way better than master of none. Yeah. Well, and now we can actually tie it back to that comment earlier. Being polymaths, you're sharing and basically diving into a whole lot of different things and becoming really good at them. This is why it's so important to learn that focus I was talking about earlier. Because if yeah. you just focus on one thing at a time and become proficiently good at it, then you can basically use that at any point. And you now you've learned another skill without having this divided attention and broken memory to try and figure out what the heck it was that you did that worked so well. It's That's actually so, so true. Because like I'll open something because it's my ADHD again. And I'll, all of a sudden I'm realizing I'm looking at something that had nothing to do with what I sat down to work on. And I will have to refocus. And something that's helped me is um, organizing. I have like a planner that like lets me write down goals and um, things like you know uh, things that I've achieved. So it's actually like a you know I forget what they call those, but there's another type of what's that thing called? But it's like neurographica. If you guys have heard of it, it's um, there's another name for it too because. Uh, Calistoga refried Kevin who used to be on here he taught I he worked with a teacher like sort of this famous teacher and it's a, it's a way to like reprocess your or to help with your memory and so it's like you draw like a circular map of like um so maybe you put your main goal in the center and then you 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 branch off on like what you need to do to get to that point and so there's but neurographica is actually where you are sort of drawing these um, random designs really and you're doing it while you're reading or processing data and it allows your brain to withhold the memories um differently are, than you, are, you, are you talking about actually this is an actual it. technique people are drawing while reading or doing some other activity that yeah yeah okay so this is, i don't um, think this is the answer for everybody but sorry go ahead yeah it's so that it, it's kind of like a distract. I the way that the way I look at that is that's a distraction for the conscious mind to allow the subconscious mind to express itself through the body. And for some people, um, it depends. That could be a way to tap into automatic drawing or automatic writing i know that's getting a bit into woo territory but i i i really think it's uh primarily a way that would help one tap into their subconscious um they're stating well. that it is forming new neural connections and i haven't looked into if there is actual data behind that statement okay so they think um, it's so a good way do, to yeah, i'll do more research yeah. on it so are they are they allowing the is it like an intuitive allow the drawing to happen or are they actually yes. trying to draw something while no. reading something? Is it both deliberate on both ends? Um, I don't believe it's deliberate on both ends. 
okay. I believe it's supposed to be a flow on the drawing end. Okay. Um, yeah. You want me to read that this? That definitely quick? sounds more like a subconscious outlet on on the on the okay. drawing end I mean, with the body. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What you said. I would say I've uh, seen this before, actually. And this is one of those things that uh, there's a TED talk about it, about people who have, have their like super memorization capability and the ways yeah. that you program your memory. So anytime you have more than one stimulus simultaneously occurring in the brain, as you're reading or digesting some information and you have a secondary stimulus, which could be audio, like some people love to read audio books as they listen to them at the same time, you know, they'll, they'll read the book and simultaneously listen to it it creates a really, really strong link because you have these two different senses. But the most powerful sense in humans, unless the nervous system is damaged and someone has had to adapt, is a sense of touch. And this is one that immediately goes straight into the memory because it's the body, the physical body that keeps you alive. And so there's an innate direct path through the brain to, uh, to the physical kinesmatic senses. And so when you do something physical like draw or... If you can, if say you're driving or there's something else, there's some other kind of stimulus, some other vibration or some other uh, input or, you know, temperature or pressure or anything on your skin that's going to stimulate that input. It's going to be memorized very, very well. And that's what well, you're so doing. This is point. What about that ice water technique where you put your hand while you're like in the process of measure? I just remembered this and you, and you put it in cold water while you're you're memorizing something. Is it, this is connecting, correct? Yeah, it sounds like if you've already worn out your ability to use those other distractions to focus, that maybe you could do something more extreme. But like, quite honestly, I've seen plenty of evidence towards very gentle stimulus. Like what you're doing there with simply drawing is an output. And you might think it'd be a major distraction, but honestly, it's just you're not really drawing anything. That's the whole thing is you're just allowing your hand to move and sort of sketching blindly is one of the techniques that's used. It's not about creating anything at all. You're going to end up with a dribble mess on a single piece of paper. But the whole motion part, that's it, it triggers other parts of the yeah. brain that are going to automatically form those connections. We've seen this in mice, too. Extensive studies have shown that mice that will run a maze during their wakeful state will then rerun that maze uh, verbatim and do variations after the first initial run in their dream state. So they've identified that the dream state is... Yeah. purpose towards reliving the daily experiences and then re-simulating them with various conditions. Yeah. It's made, that made me think of that a mushroom that, you know, restructured the Japanese subway. You heard that story? And they did oh, it was, yeah, 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 it was a slime mold. Slime molds yeah. are extremely good at finding the most efficient, shortest path between A and B to transfer nutrients. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, the, the, nature always has a always has a better way to do things, and our best abilities. I was watching this amazing little like YouTube suggestion called um, Micro Mouse Competition. Veritasium just recently did a video on it, and these uh, Micro Mouse Competition uses these tiny little mouse-sized robots. They've gotten them as small as the actual house mice now, and they are so unfreaking believably fast and so absolutely precise. Um, these tiny little robots, they can run this entire maze that's probably, you know, 15, 20, 30 meters in some case in like a matter of less than 10 seconds. When they're zipping around the corners, you, you're looking at the camera view and even at 1080p, it's hard to track them because they're moving so quickly. And um, so basically there have been a few categories where we've gotten robotics to be as good at one specific thing as a natural thing found, found by, uh, you know, creation and progression of a genetic species like mice for example are very very good at running fast and leaping and doing all kinds of stuff well we've gotten there with robotics now in that one category but for the most part nature always does it better and if we look to nature to find the solution it's guaranteed that whatever it's doing it's already figured out how to do it most efficiently and if we want to be effective and efficient we've just got to find a natural process that's pretty close to the thing we want to synthesize Quick mention of Alexander Shulgin, who did exactly that, looked at um, natural neurochemicals, and then found ways to create synthetic molecules that fit right into the receptors. Man, that guy was a genius. Truly a genius in the world of psychoactive chemistry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
On you, Bernie, what you got there? Uh, just some of my more recent monoatomic uh, harvesting. Uh, zinc, silver, copper in this one. Uh, silver, uh, copper, zinc as well in this, this one. Exact same metals, two different colors. They really do look a lot different. Were there any differences? I mean, what was the difference between uh, why one stayed white and the other one turned this kind of purplish? Uh, uh, just later color. on in the reaction, uh, in the transmutational state of decay on the anode side of the production of the metamaterials. Was one uh, done far before the other in terms of... Yes, the, uh, the pure white monoatomic is always... Uh, just at the very beginning of the reaction and then it uh, keeps breaking down first to the blue uh, diatomic oxidized and then into uh, the green from blue green yellow red or orange uh, red pink and also sometimes black and then also sometimes back to the white what they call calcified state as well one of the things we want to use those uh, many color LEDs for is trying to test monoatomics and looking for that photonic response. I know there's got to be a wavelength in there somewhere that gets them to do something interesting. So this picture right here, you can see this uh, copper and aluminum foil coil anode going into the reaction just the salt water there and then instantly turning that uh red maroonish color and uh that's what i eventually dried out and when it was dry and i rubbed my fingers together uh with it onto the uh what remained of the regular aluminum and copper it instantly spontaneously combusted and caught fire uh, no was... way yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Seriously, yeah, so like, one hundred percent. It that, caught fire. That did happen. Do you uh, have any of it left? And I am sticking to it, dude. Uh, I need so all the details of this now. If that's literally what happened, then that's the first time anybody has reported Hudson-like effects so far. Because we have all tried for them, everything from microwaving them to flame torching them to electrocuting the crap out of them, discharging capacitors across them, and they all seem fairly non-responsive, but you did something that you actually got a reaction out of, you've got to tell me everything. Yeah, Enough so to replicate it. I, exactly, I want to replicate it again first. Please get closer to your mic. Sulfur state, everything comes out in this on this yellow side when you have a double negative going in. The different layers, exclusion zones, and stuff. Can you get a little closer to your mic? No, no, I cannot. I'm gonna mumble in the corner, Jeremiah. Uh, sorry, here's the copper uh, solenoid, little Keshi uh, pain pen, but it's just three copper coils. Um, in the series of nine going counterclockwise and then the copper uh copper oxide blue uh cluster there and then there's the brownish uh orangish uh copper cuh3 i believe guess she says so copper trioxide hydride i need to talk my chemistry I'm, lessons again <laughs> um and yet yeah, you can see all the bubbles and the mist actually rising off of it at the same time uh, simultaneously on that one producing hydrogen or possibly hho Uh, here's that same reaction that was uh, all in that yellow sulfur state now in the blue teal oxidized state. Uh, nothing chemically had changed at all in this. 
Uh, this is a combination of a bunch of aluminum um, foil as well as copper and silver. So in the one that uh, when you rub your fingers together, the stuff caught fire, which I really got to hear more about that Here story. you can see again uh, on the anode side more of this red aluminum copper stuff forming on the outside. That exact same stuff that you are asking about, Jeremiah. And this is what the alchemist state is, the red mercury state of transmutational metals, as uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, also describes it. And they say that is its reactive live state. And so what's the other electrode then? Does it need to be something specific? Uh, right here you can see that is a one ounce silver coin as the uh, cathode. Okay, so have you ever tried this with anything other than silver for the cathode? Yeah, it, with just aluminum on aluminum, copper on copper, zinc on zinc, I get it all into that red state. But is that red state always combustible when you dry it out? I, I haven't tried it. I'm not sure. Would uh, you? Uh, yeah, we got to do a lot more experiments on it, of course. So here's a bunch of different uh, reactors, coils, and wands and whatnot that... Uh, I made back in the day. Oh, here's this little guy where it's a couple silver ounces, a uh, magrav coil, capacitor, and then like a potentially battery of aluminum, copper, monatomic, and wax paper separating. And yeah, I gotta, I gotta do more with the circuitry. Uh, ooh, I do have this one opened up. So that right there, uh, that's when it was first sealed. And then this is the jar now, where it's completely encased in a layer of blue crystallized uh, silver oxide. That is this nano lattice crystallized layer that forms. And I'm sure these are actually a metamaterial because uh, they do flake off the jar and they're like this perfect like nano film layer. I was thinking the exact same words, man. Metamaterials, right? And that uh, you see it, it's forming in, it can be formed in all the different. Uh, states of the transmutational metals as well when built in these correct circuits and um, little reactor group things that I make. For instance, like this guy that's still bubbling, there's another Magrav coil that it's connected to with two uh, copper wires connecting into the monoatomics, and that's creating the charge and differential that's powering it nonstop. Uh, even when there's not electricity connected to it. And you can see that giant arse uh, structure or tubes. Structure, yeah, that's uh, formed there. And then when it does connect to the bottom and ground itself out, uh, then the coils themselves or the cathode side. Oops, wrong camera. Uh, on the cathode side here, it stops producing as much hydrogen. It stops bubbling nearly as much as what it was uh, because the anode side has built these structures down and grounded itself to the base monoatomic amount. But it, it's still bubbling a little bit, but it, it's almost as little or as much uh, as the one that has zero electricity to it, this line Magrav reactor hybrid thing that I got going on in there, where you have it producing the same amount of hydrogen through electrolysis as no electricity as five volts going in, and that I can disconnect it and this thing will continue producing that same amount of hydrogen indefinitely, what seems like nine months now on the outside ones. Hmm. So for that one that made that uh, crazy material, 
Was that uh, with the silver coin? Or was that the, uh, with the aluminum on the aluminum? Okay, so this red stuff, Jeremiah, I'm telling you, I make it out of every single uh, metal. I've get, gotten it from just like copper on copper into that straight red state. Right, but you didn't aluminum. know if it has that property, though. That's the thing. Yes, oh, it. yes, yes, yes. That's so sorry, yes. And so here's some of this red stuff in this state. Uh, and that it's just made out of copper in this one. Yeah, I but really yeah, want to replicate so, that, and that's why I'm asking that, yes, for specifics. That, uh, so I'm going to do exactly that. This is the first time thing. I've talked about it publicly. All right, so I'm, you know, I bring my different uh, secrets forward and discoveries forward time to time. That uh, all right, we're bringing it to light today, I guess. Take note. 401 in with 41 people watching apparently. I'm taking note. 946 a.m. Dear goodness. All right. So <laughs> on that note, we're going back to watch the rest of this right here first. Hey, what about revealing all those secrets? I just wanted to know uh, hey, what the it'll come. It will come, but uh I gotta be true to the name of the title and finish this lecture because we need to get on to the one afterwards, which is gonna blow your mind even more so. Oh man, I, I promise you it, it's gonna blow your mind. Well, the William Donovan, oh, before, one. We, before we do that, let me just cover this one last thing. All right, of course. So, this is I have no um, idea. I, I need, gonna, I was gonna show you guys the other day the um, what the heck. Ooh. Sorry, this is the uh, light box for the Frandi Aquino Photon Gas Experiment, and I have an analog wooden balance that's called a razor blade edge balance, and it has a razor blade sitting above it with the scale balance just slightly below it gravitationally. So um, if the weight changes between the left side and the right side, it won't be an electronic measurement error. It'll literally move the thing. And so inside that box are two LED strips, and I'm going to go show them up close. So yeah, anyways, uh, that's it. People wanted to see the other day uh, the photon gas layout and how I'm testing Frandi Aquino's experiment. So on the top and bottom of that plastic container, the LED strips are mounted on the side of, I can apply a ELF voltage across those just acting like an open air capacitor. Now, ideally it's tested in vacuum, but he says this can still be done with LEDs in open air. So we're going to give this a try using some of the worst LEDs for this experiment because they're super wide band kind of white noise output. They're phosphor LEDs with multi-phosphor uh, coatings. So lots and lots of wavelengths all at once. They're cool white. And uh, see if we can get some kind of motion. Now, I did get some motion out of the scale earlier, but I wasn't sure if it was um, thermal or if it was gravitational. And I haven't ruled that out yet with a digital scale. And those are coming. This is the photon gas experimental setup replication from Fran Aquino's paper, uh, Quantum Controller of Gravitational Force Using a Photon Gas. Yeah. And I'll let you know how it works out. So that's the last thing I had to show. We can get back to the video then. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, Jeremiah. And we shall get back to this video right here. Dan Winters, Cognos 2013. Free energy, implosion, and new technologies. One decade in remix. The symmetry is doing this. And the gold atom makes an electric field when it's white gold powder that produces gravity. White gold powder has been known to float. Uh, and your ancestors were eating the gold, the white gold powder, because they thought it would make them immortal, actually. That's how it became known as Holy Communion. And it was served, by the way, in a pine cone shape 
wafer that you can see the carvings at Rennes le Chateau in France of the white gold powder. So Lawrence Gardner in his book Sacred Art is analyzing the electric field and he decided that because the electric field of the monoatomic gold is so huge, it makes a almost infinite electric field. And it's called, by the way, the same thing. It's called phase conjugate dielectric. And because that electric field is so big, so perfect, so distributed like a rose. <laughs> you know the rose of Sharon in the Jewish tradition? Well, it turns out that in the Hebrew tradition, the name for heaven is called the Plains of Sharon. The Plains of Sharon. And according to his very, very scholarly analysis, the electric definition of the Plains of Sharon, an example of that is a perfectly unpacked electron. So, when I go to heaven, I'm going to be a perfectly unpacked electron. Doesn't that sound delightful? It's, <laughs> it's another way of saying to become a wave that's perfectly distributed. In, in English, the word for heaven comes from he ave, he ave, heaven, he ave. Heaven. He, he means the breath of charge. Ave means to take flight, to take wing. Ave, to fly. Avion, par avion. Sounds Spanish to me. <laughs> so, hey, ave, where the breath of charge takes flight, where charge can fly. Right? Remember how angry the Hopi grandfathers were when the U.S. government decided to put steel pipes in the old Aribi, the sacred burial ground of the Hopi. Why were the Hopi so angry that the U.S. government decided to put steel pipes, sewage, across the sacred burial ground? What did the Hopi ancestor know that the U.S. government did not know? The Hopi ancestor knew that the circulation of charge in that burial ground was fractal, phase conjugate, like a rose. And the only way ancestors live in memory is if that charge remains in circulation. Yes, and steel pipes and steel buildings and aluminum and electrosmog, these are poisonous to the distribution of all living plasma, all living memory, for the very simple reason that the electric field that goes, the electric field you call life, which I call phase conjugate, L I phi, life, <laughs> life. <laughs> the electric field you call life has to unpack like a rose. What does that mean in practice? It means, it means you go to your bed, your house, your garden, and your city and you rearrange the magnetic lines to look like the rose. The magnetic map of Prague originally is a rose. It's a meteor caldera. And when we get to Prague, Valerie noticed that I was, we were lucid dreaming more. Why could we lucid dream better in Prague? The magnetic map is a rose. Oh, by the way, Prague, is successful at attracting life force, tourists, energy, and money. So you could tell 
The Spanish government, if they want money back in Spain, rearrange the magnetic map to be attracting charge. Because the circulation of living charge is the human energy for which money is the only symbol. Right? So, the, this ability to make magnetism circulate successfully translates into very practical suggestions for your day-to-day -day life. Have you, have you been to Switzerland in the mountains where you have the old-fashioned house It's made of clay and natural materials and straw, all living biologic materials? <coughs> And in many of those houses, there's a hole in the roof that points in the direction of a certain star. And they say, that's where grandmother goes out when she dies. Yeah? Same where the tube that points to Sirius from the Great Pyramid. Same principle. Now, you know, in Australia, I think they found out that houses with metal roof, you can't dream as well. Why does a steel or metal over your head reduce your ability to dream? Do you know? Well, we have some clues. In Australia, where the aboriginals, let's see, we'll use this one. They found out that the place the aboriginals called dreaming track or song line in Australia is actually measurable as a magnetic line. So that the ability to, let's see, I think it's in here. Page so they, they were studying um, what were called song lines in the Australian aboriginal tradition got to find that picture now. Here it is. It's from our friend uh, Rob Gourlay in Australia. These are the white lines here in white are the song line, the dreaming track. And the way the electrical engineers measure song line or dreaming track here in white, they do it from airplane and satellite magnetic flux permit which is simply where rivers of magnetism are flowing in the land, magnetic conductivity, like the white lines, accurately identify what aboriginals called dreaming track or song line. So what's the physics? Why would you need a magnetic river for propagating your dreaming? Does anybody have a clue? Uh, another prediction that spiritual scientists always say is that if you can lucid dream, you will take memory with you when you die. But if you cannot lucid dream, you will take less memory with you when you die. So lucid dreaming has something to do with memory. Coherence of plasma. In Egyptian, the term for that is the origin of the term Catholic and Cathar. It was called your Ka in Egypt, K-A, which means your boat into the underworld. So if you get a coherent aura, then your plasma, your charge, can take wings, hey ave, to fly, and your magnetic plasma can go down the river, <laughs> the river of magnetic conduction. Now, if the magnetic map of your bed and your house look like a rose, imagine how easy it is for birth and death and dreaming. Whereas if the magnetic map of your bed is a steel and aluminum building full of dead air and electro smog, 
I tell you, you have a problem. It's the life force in the air itself that allows the charge to propagate. Hey, Ave, plains of Sharon, your breath of charge takes wings. I feel like I'm in heaven now. <laughs> Do you see the principle? So this, this is the, just an introduction to the curriculum of living architecture and the alchemy of the flame in the mind. Um, let's see, what time is it? It's uh, six o'clock. Um, before we go further, can we do questions here? Would anyone want to ask questions? Should we have some dialogue? Spontaneity? Anyone? Not ready for that. Well, if, if you have questions, feel free. The, the climax of this lecture is going to be about applying this to uh, technology, to sacred space, to living agriculture, to living architecture. And I'm gonna show you a, a presentation which is called the Fractal Field Team here, which has examples of things we're doing to create sacred space in practical terms. These are the websites, fractalfield.com, breakthroughtechnologies.com, theimploder.com, purify.com. And Breakthrough Technologies, and also bloomthedesert.com, those two websites are in conjunction with Roger Green, who is here with us, who works on all these projects with us, and he's currently also involved in the fusion work. And he's happy to talk to you about eco-global fuels and about some of the Rossi work, the ECAT. So this is just an introduction to some of the things we're doing with the Bloom the Desert program. Uh, the Bloom the Desert project includes Ormes, the gold powder for agriculture purposes, and it includes the imploder, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. It also includes the study of primary water, which is deep rock water, which is more alive because it has more charge, yeah? It's also called a captive water table. This is a project we did in Australia to bring the water back to this land at Eagle Farm, the Tiagra Airport near Byron Bay, and we remapped these dolmen to put this pent magnetic symmetry into the magnetic field of this place. See that pentagram in the center, and the, the magnetic map increased in charge density. So you, we actually fabricated the kind of stone dolmen circle that measurably affect seed germination. This is the Purify project. This gold capacitive structure creates lots of charge in the body, affects seed germination, can be used to charge rock powders, here we're charging a rock powder with a gold five-sided implosion pyramid. The angle, the angle of that cone is exactly this angle here in the center. If you stellate a dodeca, you make the exact six degree cone that becomes charge implosion. And later you're gonna see that in the imploder for water for agriculture. So this is the purify. And here we're using the same principle to charge the yeast, the brewer's yeast, and we accelerate metabolism in the yeast 40 to 50% simply by adding a zero power capacitor. We're proving here that you, we can do the same thing with capacitance, the charge, a cup-shaped implosive egg-like condenser. Condense, capacitance, charge compression. There's a little pine cone shape there in the electric field <laughs> where you feel a little cool breeze. So the same principle is the reason Stonehenge causes seeds to grow and the reason the Priory device eliminated cancer because all of life requires a centripetal field, implosion force. The electric difference 
between a live seed and a dead seed is quite simple. A live seed can suck, can suck in charge. That's why it's alive. A dead seed has no implosion, cannot attract charge, is not fractal, and that's why it's dead. So knowing this is life or death for you. <laughs> how, do you keep your, how do you keep your aura together? Get centripetal or get dead. This is a centripetal device. This is the Shungite. It's a, a natural phase conjugate dielectric. Almost like the, um, the Philosopher's Stone John D. and Kelly used for alchemy, the Moldavite, the Moldavite and the Shungite are examples of phase conjugate dielectrics, which is to say imploding capacitors. How romantic. Next time you want to ask your lover for a kiss, you tell her that I'm an imploding capacitor. I'm sure she will be attracted. Right. This, this, this is another imploding capacitor here. This is, a, this is in Barcelona. The last, I don't know if the last conference we did, but everyone felt the charge. This is called Ecosify, and this is all gold. <laughs> So I guess this might be more expensive than a Volkswagen because there's so much gold in there. But the demonstrated principle is that you make a capacitor that implodes and you make a flame in the mine, right? <laughs> so that's the geometry. You see how the geometry looks like a flame? You see the flame there? Let's play the animation of that flame here. Now, now do you see why we call it a flame in the mind? Here's, let's play the animation. Here's, on the bottom left, here it is. Let's stop this here. Wait, wait, I'll control this. This is not something Bill Gates can do, but Steve Jobs can do it. You can control Keynote better than PowerPoint. Right here, I'm doing it. Bill Gates, eat your heart out. No. So the point. <laughs> all right, all right. An apple looks like a donut, right? <laughs> so, but you see, the point is that right here, right there, do you see a flame? Does that look like a flame to you? That's a flame in the mind, a fire, a plasma fusion event. Do you see why that's attractive? That is a flame. And that is the way flame is created. You know what? I um, had my first bliss experiences in the Gurdjieff School, studying sacred gymnastics of Gurdjieff in Charlestown, West Virginia at claymont.org. And our teacher of sacred gymnastics, a French powerful spiritual teacher named Pierre Elliott, it turns out that our teacher for the sacred gymnastic, his university career was studying the physics of flame. So if you know how to make a flame, you can make fire in the mind, and you can make human bliss, and you can design sacred gymnastics, and you can make architecture, and you can cause seeds to germinate, and you can make plasma fusion containment. It's all the same geometry. Now, I want to show you one more picture. Remember when we said, we said that here are the waves, here are the longitudinal waves coming in like this, causing compression in your mind, right? 
and you've got implosion in the center. And we said, that's like phase conjugate optics, same thing, four wave mixing. But you would say, hey, that looks like a cube. That doesn't look like a dodecahedron, right? That's a cube. But here is the cube. I'm going to control this cube here. Here's the cube. Here, here is from the star mother. Here is how that cube gets in a dodecahedron. There's a cube. And now that cube is nested in a dodeca right there. See the cube in the dodeca? And now this is called embedding. And the ratio of the edge, the ratio of the edge of that cube, 1.5. Zero to the edge of that dodecahedron, 0.618. Golden mean, right? And now I'm going to do perfect nesting or perfect embedding, which is to extend the charge from each vertex of the dodeca. And that's the yellow icosahedron in the star one. So I'm not. Here's cube, dodeca, ecosa. Just extend the wave straight out, ecosa. And now I extend that straight out again, also by golden ratio, compression. Oh, there it is. Extending just straight, every edge extended straight by golden ratio. Hello. Does that look familiar? That's the star mother. That's perfect nesting. That's the geometry of DNA earth grid and zodiac. <laughs> so you see that if you get the cube perfect, then you can embed from hex to pent into golden ratio dodeca. And that's the geometry that creates fusion, implosion, fire in the mind. You know, these plasma fields, I was going to tell you the story of fusion in the blood. We didn't finish that story. See, when the DNA turns inside out and becomes a torus like this, remember when we said that ball lightning causes telepathy? Because the plasma at the center becomes part of what I call DNA radio. DNA radio, <laughs> the physics of telepathy. So whether it's ball lightning or DNA experiencing human bliss because of braiding, it ignites the fire in the blood. This is our favorite joke. We call this principle in physics is called, come on, baby, light my fire. <laughs> So, so when, when, the, when the fire is ignited in your DNA with the physics of bliss, then that ignites DNA radio. This is fusion in the blood. Well, I suppose we need to finish today's lecture with an ET story. Is it okay if we finish with an ET story? Is that okay with you? ET? ET phone home. Okay. We're going to finish the story with ET. It is my humble opinion that the guy called Yahweh Jehovah in the Jewish tradition is probably the Anunnaki called Enlil. And Sitchin and others believe that. And Yahweh Jehovah taught that kosher required that the blood must be out of the meat before you eat it. Right? Now, they also taught that the, the Anunnaki were dying prematurely when they arrived on Earth because they couldn't handle the atmosphere. Now, we believe that the, the, actual, um, the actual story of the Anunnaki is a story of what we call the ages of Uras, 
U-R-A-S. The Ages of Uras is a story told by Anton Parks in the Chronicles of Girku. And they said that Enlil's brother, Enki, looked like this, a frog. And the website is zeitlin.net about the Ages of Uras. And he says that that culture, this Ur culture, and I want to show you the picture of the history of that term Ur. I'm doing this for a reason. Here is the ur An culture. Ur became An Ur, Hungary, Ural, Uruk, Ibi Uru, Nibiru. I don't think the translator has a job here because these words are all self-explanatory. They're <clears throat> The roots of the term Uru, as in Heb Uru, Ein Sof Ur, Ursprung, Uruk, Iraq. You see the term you are. Now, if you were studying the history of the planet and you saw this term Uras, U R U, in so many words in your language, would not you believe that in order to know the history, of where we come from, we need to know who was Uru. I think, given the fact that Jerusalem, Uru Asa Elam, is a place where Uru, which Uru I believe means of the ancient dragon blood, Uru Asa Elam, Jerusalem, that's right, it's down here. Me Uru, ancient dragon blood, Asa, queen of, El, phase shift. So where the queen of the ancient dragon blood made the phase shift. Uru Asa LM, Jerusalem. Probably we would not need a war over Jerusalem if we, need, if we knew what it was for. <laughs> A place where dragon blood can make the phase shift. So who's this dragon blood and what was the fire in their blood? Later, uh, with help from Bill, we wrote a paper. And you can read the paper at fusioninheart.com about fusion in the blood. And specifically, we were studying we were studying the blood of our ancestors, the Anunnaki, the Uru, the Draco. We believe their, their roots were, were in Alpha Draconis. And whether you believe that or not is not important. But the chemistry of their blood is instructive. You see, our ancestors, sometimes you call them the Nephilim, fallen Draco, Anunnaki, Sumerian, whatever you call them, origins of Hungarian, Draco. The chemistry lesson remains important, whatever you call them. The chemistry lesson is from their star system, their blood was lipid based, lipid, L-I-P-I-D. It was an oil lipid based blood and for them, they were nitrogen breathing. It's called the plague of Azov, the plague of nitrogen. And for them, oxygen was a poison. The wars they came from in Orion were called the oxygen wars for a reason. It's the basis of the movie Total Recall about the oxygen wars. It's those who want high oxygen versus those who want low oxygen. And if your blood chemistry is poisoned by oxygen, then obviously you don't want high oxygen. Also, for their lipid-based nitrogen-breathing blood, that the water in the blood of meat would be a poison to them. So the origin of the um, kosher in the Jewish tradition 
requires understanding Draco blood to understand where it came from. Did you know that on Alpha Draconis, the men and the women have a separate language called Emesa and Emesa? Emesa? Anton Parks describes in detail. And exactly the same is true for the Australian Aboriginals. The men and the women must have a different language by law. Do you know the rules that became the marriage law in Aboriginal Australia and caste system in India? Those rules come directly from Alpha Draconis. There's so much we need to know about our ancestors to understand ourselves. Did you know that the culture on Alpha Draconis was female dominated for a long time? And they came here with a fear of women. When I started studying in graduate school, the history of Earth, I concluded the most dominant feature of the history of Earth is the fear of women. And I studied everywhere to figure out where did the fear of women came from. And, but you know what I found out finally is you cannot learn the origin of the fear of women without understanding the extraterrestrial origin of our ancestors. Anunnaki, Uru, Draco, that was a female dominated culture. Well, you can see I carry on, and this would be very controversial information. And I'm not asking that you believe this without your own investigation. I, I do suggest you read Anton Parks, but, and you could, should read that paper on the blood chemistry, it's fun, fusioninthehart.com. Thank you again to Bill on that. But here is a final point. Here is a final point. Final point I wish to make. <clears throat> you know when you say, come on baby, light my fire. What, what you're talking about is passion, right? If you don't have passion, you might as well be dead. Truthfully. So, we electrical engineers, we would like to understand a little bit about the nature of passion. Now, you can regard this as a fairy tale. I regard it as true history. But the story is that Enki, Ea, Samuel, when Enki selected which of the uh, RH negative rhesus monkey which of the monkey blood he was going to genetically modify to make Adam and Eve, <laughs> uh, he chose a species where he saw that monkey exhibit compassion to other animals. And he had never seen compassion in his whole life before. And that's how he selected the monkey that would be fun to work with genetically. He saw passion. Now, in order to remember this story, you can make jokes at the expense of English people, if you like. You see, the greatest, com the greatest concentration of RH negative blood on planet Earth is UK, United Kingdom. What does it mean to have a stiff upper lip? This is an old joke. Sorry, Valerie, my jokes are getting old. Sorry. But it, it, a stiff upper lip is when you're in the House of Lords and you have a stiff upper lip, you can't talk very well. But the, the, the physics is that when you're a little boy, if your mother, Elizabeth from Lizard Born, if your mother says, don't cry, to a little boy, the biophysics is it will cause your upper lip to get stiff. True physics. So the cause of a stiff upper lip 
is mother says, don't cry. It means repress emotion. It's classic neuro-linguistic programming, classic physics of emotion. So why do you have a stiff upper lip in England? Remember, we're making, we're, we're gonna make jokes about all the cultures, hopefully, but we'll just do British people for now. But the, 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 the stiff upper lip means no passion, repressed emotion. What is RH negative mean? RH negative blood concentrated in UK means the rhesus monkey is absent. What's left? The reptilian, the Draco, right? Very intelligent, but stiff. Lack of passion. Why did they have lack of passion? Well, the rhesus monkey had passion and compassion, which Enki never saw before. The rhesus monkey blood was dominant. The reptilian blood was recessive. Very important to know. The inbreeding in the reptilians, you know, the story of the bloodlines of Europe, holy blood, holy grail. We could do the Da Vinci code here very easily. But my point, my point, <clears throat> my point was that if your blood chemistry does not permit you to have fire or fusion in your blood, you physically do not have DNA radio, so you cannot feel other people's feelings as if they are your own. Remember, remember that plasma fire in George Edgeley's lab. Everybody around is healed, they're sucked in. It's a plasma fusion device in the sense of holy communion. You see what the Holy Communion is that allows me to feel you? Is if I can have that plasma fusion going on in my blood. If I don't have that plasma fusion, if I succumb to a mechanical culture, then I can't feel your feelings as if they're mine because my blood needs to be on fire to feel the fire in your blood. And that is the physics of plasma fusion. So, you know, the end of this conference will be Bill telling you about solutions to energy from imploding technology. Bill says that every one of the devices that he is gonna show you that do zero point energy Almost all of them have one thing in common. The golden spiral and the spiral on the cone. Why? Implosive collapse. Gain energy during collapse during fusion. So whether it's energy or architecture or physics, it all starts with one simple symmetry principle. And hmm. I promised uh, everyone here that we would show a few pictures of how we build that into an agriculture device. This is that nozzle, that cone in the imploder for agriculture. The same way you do fusion in the blood, I just want to do an animation of that cone, so it's so beautiful the way that cone works. Here is the architecture of the perfect implosion cone applied to agriculture. When water goes down that cone, it implodes. It gains spin density and becomes centripetal. And we have a dramatic effect on seed germination, on growth in agriculture, so much so that that's a successful commercial product, theimploder.com. This is the geometry of that cone. Do you see where we got that cone from? This is a practical application. Restored centripetal forces. Implosion for agriculture. 
So there are so many products that can be designed when you understand the nature of implosion. Restored centripetal force basically is our planet returning to a more ordered state. So on that note, I urge you all to get fractal, <laughs> to be like the rose, and I thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so that uh, finishes that first uh, epic uh, one. Now let's have some discussion again, and then uh, now those are some shades, Bernie. Those are some shades, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's summertime. Get cool down. Down. I love the electric culture. We're getting pumped. All it's right. So, uh, I'm about to uh, fill these beauties up with uh, water again. So, I guess uh, I'll just leave it on uh, this uh, large screen here for a second while I turn on the hose. And we can watch these mystic monoatomic mana metamaterial uh, ormuses refill and swirl around. Has anyone here ever seen that UHF movie by Weird Al Yankovic? Oh man, that was so funny. I love that movie. I've seen it several times. Do you remember the part where um, it's Kramer, but it, that's not his name in the movie, and the, the kid wins the competition, and he says, you know what little Jimmy gets? He gets to drink from the fire hose! And he just <laughs> <laughs> all the whole blast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, when you said that, it just reminded me of that clip. I had to bring it up. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, dude, that, that whole entire movie, if you haven't seen it, you're out there listening, if you have not seen it. Oh, UHF man. by Weird Al Yankovic, yeah. So funny. Such yeah, a it's, weird, trippy kind of out there. It's all comedy, movie. and it's it's different. <laughs> it's different, right? Oh, I, I'm I'm people. still just taking a moment to reabsorb my brain. So sorry, guys, just catching up. <laughs> uh, I actually just stuck a little transformer in the oven. It's I'm, I'm not actually sure what the heck it's from. It's a, hot, a very high winding ratio, high voltage transformer. It could have been from a very old type of printer, but I think it's uh, set to be about a thousand volts output, which is exactly what I need to charge this one thousand volt capacitor for um, MOSFET triggering. On an electronic pulse generator that will do like a 60,000 volt pulse and in a very short rise time. So, yeah, uh, just toss that sucker in the oven and now I'm trying to melt the wax off so I can unwind uh, some of the primary turns and put my own coil on there. And then we're going to run that thing in a little handheld voltage multiplier type of pulse supply to drive the whole darn thing. It's going to be awesome. Sounds like fun. Oh, yeah, it's already jacking out like two two inch long sparks and it snaps nice and loud. I mean, I would not want to get hit with it. I'll tell you that it's, uh, it's dumping like a, uh, 3.5 when I'm done with the 3.5 microfarad, uh, 1,200 volt capacitor into this transformer every single time. And the transformer Dang. is kind of a beast. Yeah. That sounds like a beast. I want to try to PWM that damn thing so I can do true TP Brown experiments in his original paper, how I control gravitation. There is a picture of the high voltage gravitator, quote unquote, system hooked up, which is basically a really long rod built out of layers of litharge, wax, um, a special type of fabric to absorb the wax and kind of hold the litharge onto one side, which he makes act like sort of a uh, electron transmission layer. And then the uh, plates uh, sandwiching that together. And then he sort of separates these things by just uh, bakelite or by um, wax with nothing in it. And with that assembly, yeah, he shows the transformer. There's a pulse transformer that does like 100 kV pulse hooked up to that device that's already DC biased. And even though he doesn't show diodes, you can assume he's probably running the pulse transformer with something like a class A input to get a uh, biased DC type of charging effect. Or he may even just have such a low frequency on a big transformer that he disconnects the wire. 
from the transformer so it doesn't discharge the whole entire unit. Either way, though, I, I think it can be explained by electron migration in the dielectrics, jumping from one heavy particle to the other and changing the nuclear spin value, gaining a relativistic inertial effect because it's some of the electron momentum in the direction of the anode is actually being converted into nuclear magnetic moment spin. In the lead, mainly, in the litharge, and on the plates. I want to see what those kind of pulses look like once you get the sucker working. <laughs> kind of like an ignition coil on steroids, really. Yeah. Large amounts of steroids. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a, it's a full loop core ferrite, and uh, the system is designed. The transformer I'm, I'm using is designed for like 600 watts. It Dang. certainly cracks a nice arc across the terminals, and now it'll crack a really nice impulse. I mean, it's to the point where dielectric barrier discharge-wise, if you put a, a separator like glass or plastic or anything between the two terminals, you'll see lightning shoot over the entire surface and just spread out like Lichtenberg style onto the surface, trying to get across to the other side and charging up the dielectric just to kind of transmit that electron charge until it decays. And with high-speed diodes, which will be added, we can get a uh, truly monopolar pulse. That would be Because it doesn't like monopolar pulses, by the way. That's where you get your weird scalar crap going on. That's part of the Hutchinson effect. <laughs> I, I want to see that. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'll show it off, for sure. There's got to be a way to rip the charges out. And so, in, in terms of generating exotic vacuum objects and then pulling them through, I, I would definitely go for a pulse generator in most applications because inside the vacuum cha chamber with Vega to generate EVOs, he's got to pump a significant amount of energy into that thing full of pretty hard vacuum, you know, harder than what you're going to get with your average two vein vacuum pump. It'll be near the max just to pull it close enough. And like my little vacuum pump doesn't go deep enough for that. So instead, what I can do is discharge capacitors into it. So no steady state DC, but just discharge. And then I can still generate the electromotive force necessary between the electrodes to uh, rip charges out and force them into a magnetic beam current, much like a, uh, what do they call that? Um, geez, the conduits, uh, the plasma conduits that will rise up the surface of the planet. I'm trying to remember what those are called again now. Nanosphrasia. Oh, you know, what? I said nanosphrasia is what they call when you can't remember a word. Yeah, you know what? I couldn't remember a word earlier. Earth this morning. That's it. Yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to think of this morning, and I couldn't think of them. You're talking about the currents that come in and out of certain spots in the northern part of our, our Earth, right? Basically well, they can the show top. up just about anywhere. I mean, they'll follow events. Really? Earthen currents will connect to superstorms and all kinds of stuff. Earthen currents will connect to, uh, to uh, hurricanes. They'll extend way, way out into space just like sprites will. And um, I mean, they can be way the heck up there. They generally spread out in the vacuum uh, in sort of a vortex form, getting away from the gravitational field. And those currents can flow all the way around the magnetosphere of the Earth and be charged up as a conduit to carry high energy solar particles that are positively ionized down through the ionosphere. That creates a tremendous current flow. That's why they tend to you know circulate around themselves because there's an electromotive force in the direction straight from uh, outside the magnetosphere that's carrying these charged particles directly towards the surface. But then as they move, there's this secondary field that's rotating around those particles. So they tend to entrain in a vortex. And once that vortex is established, there's a counter motor force. So it actually is like a layered vortex of counter rotating vortices surrounding each other. It's sorry, I got, I'm sorry to interrupt there, Jeremy. I got to dip out for like five minutes here. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Okay, man. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, in a couple minutes, I go check on that transformer, see if its wax is dripping out sufficiently. Might turn up the temperature a bit. You've got to be careful with ferrites when you're baking them or heating them with anything, because the ferrite itself is quite delicate, and you don't want to heat it too quickly, and definitely not unevenly, or it'll shatter on you. Those are looking trippy, Bernie. Quiet number of colors right there. And I'll be right back as well.
There we go. Uh, now that the water's off, look at all of those colors. And that one that had turned uh, like a bit purple and gray and separated, now it's back to the full gold yellow, the white remaining white. Uh, this originally purple, now beige, weird one doing its thing. This guy full purple still. And full purple, purple, pink, teal, blue, green. Bright light, bright light. Right, we're we're doing real science, real alchemy right here. And that looks gorgeous, now, seriously. That's awesome, isn't it? Like it's just, it's so beautiful. Those colors, so beautiful. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to be planting them with the same seeds in the different uh, buckets to get uh, these real science experiments going. And then, and once again, here, here's a couple different types of that, uh, the materials uh, packaged within themselves and the differential between the metals and the different states that they're in uh, is supposed to create energy field differential and uh, a soothing sort of uh, energy uh, when applied to sore muscles and stuff and right once again this is like it's not touching your uh, physical skin or ingesting or any way it's just a uh, water pack is there any difference if you use uh, like a distilled water when you're filling those um, Great question. And for lots of people, yes. If your um, natural tap water is tainted, polluted, or dirty, or anything wrong with it, uh, you don't want to use that water because it will exponentially increase uh, those negative uh, ions, particles, if uh, it gets into a monatomic form. And thus, you definitely want to use uh, that uh, spring water. But uh, in my house, I do have distilled water. And I would recommend everybody start out using uh, distilled or spring water. And spring water uh, essentially is what uh, we've all been calling or slightly discussing that primal water. Is that what it was? Well, and now I'm curious the difference between both because you got so many more minerals in spring versus distilled where it pulls it all out. Sometimes there's a oh, chemical. Exactly. Process. So many more experiments to do. This year <laughs> we're doing all of these ones, and then next year we'll get into also testing distilled, microwave, spring, tap water, and all of that. Yeah, uh, nice set up with. Yeah, there's so much. Primary yeah. comes deep from the earth, actually usually from under the aquifer. So it's interesting. Yeah. And like the, the different properties of, you know, cer like certain areas. Yeah. And it's under pressure and it's, it's a different form of water, so to speak. All yeah. Right. Back to everything else. Well, uh, I'm going to break in here to break out, so to speak. I've got to uh, get ready for a few things that are going on today. So I appreciate the live, Bertie, and talking to everybody. WPG and like your channel. Oh, I will uh, show the link in the live chat as soon as I am back in. And happy birthday, Gerald. It's Gerald's birthday. <laughs> happy birthday, Gerald. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my hey, Jared, is now, uh, I'm now a little alternator demo uh, before you left today because it was your birthday. Weren't you supposed to do that? Or No, I'm not fully ready to do that. But you know what? On the next Real Science, I will be. Deal. Oh, Happy birthday. We'll, we'll Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to Gerald. Happy <laughs> birthday, WPG Enlightened for Truth to... Happy birthday, Gerald, to you. I'm glad I had mute, Bernie, but no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You guys have a great day. I'm out, and we'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you. Yeah, G, good luck, with, uh, good luck with everything that you've got going on there and with the craziness. For sure, brother. I'll give you a, a Zoom call real soon. we got to talk. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Have a great You too. All right, all right, all right. So we have the wonderful Mindful Exposures, Esra, Exotic Propulsion, Jeremiah, Liminal, myself, and Gerald had to go because he's the birthday boy and life goes on. All right, uh, Gerald's channel. Do I have it pulled up? Come on. No, but I do have mindful yeah, exposures, yeah. so I'm going to show Sarah's first while I look up Gerald's channel, but here is mindful exposures. Any, any thoughts uh, there, ladies and gentlemen? I very much like it when he gets into the heavy technical part of the science in the, in the lecture and I can't really say much of his esoteric philosophy I can agree with. Got so, into the um, deep end. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he really got out there and I can't really, you know, one, think one way or the other, but I would say I probably more likely disagree with it if I have to push myself on one side of the scale or the other when he gets that esoteric. But as far as the uh, the physical experimentation stuff, he knows how to get technical when he chooses to, and that's very awesome when he does. So. Yeah, I the blood thing was, sorry, just real quick, just the blood, when he started to get into that, I, start, I started to kind of disconnect a little bit because I think there's way more to it in our ability to manipulate our own DNA and all that. Also the fear of women, I mean, I just wanted to shout right. out. You're just cracking up over here, man. Here we are. I'm a woman. But, well, you know, I wanted to be polite and let the guy finish speaking. So I, uh, exactly, I feel like right? Everything that because of, like, the, the idea that we used to, you know, that they, they throw out that we were more matriarchal. Matri I can't talk. You know, like in the, in the tribe and even in, in, that's what he was kind of getting at. And so, like, because we've changed, because it's become... I don't know. I mean, I guess that's a far stretch for me what I'm saying, but still, <laughs> it didn't, yeah, I didn't resonate. You can't trust it's anything, it's that, you know. Smart, has the right? But it's the technical science that uh, had me most excited, and even it, more it so really was all of like his the references geometry. to well, this yeah. presentation by William Donovan, which I really want uh jeremiah and Limla and sarah all of yours inputs because you probably haven't seen this one and oh my god it it. it's so technical and he names so many patents as well, well and, since i kind of got this going on in the background as i'm working on other projects that is uh, exactly and, uh, so yeah listen in I'm going to hit play on here for a minute and let's check it out because uh, it's been a while, and this one, this one's one that stuck with me. Keep your heart, your mind, that thing that you have to bring down, the way of living the That depends on you and not somebody else. Because in this, there is no teacher, no pupil. There's no leader, there's no guru, there's no master, no savior. You yourself are the teacher and the pupil, you are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader. You are everything. And to understand is to transform what it is. So I guess Dan has already uh, told you that uh, I'm into more of the hardware aspect as far as uh, the different free energy and anti-gravity devices, and propulsion systems. And my talk is going to be free energy. It's always been with us. And it really has. Uh, Marco mentioned something about uh, alchemy, uh, cold fusion in the Middle Ages. That's true. I mean, it's been around for a very long time. This guy's definitely got my attention. So we have legends uh, in ancient times, the Atlantean fire crystals, which were probably electrets. 
which I'm going to cover about that as well. Uh, unbalanced gravity wheels in the 11th century, uh, that's also something that has been around for a very long time. And it's also being resurrected now. Uh, there are gravity wheels that have been Sorry, I had to pause it there just for one second because what he's talking about, uh, something I've done a few episodes on and we need to do more on. There's like the Basraka real wheel, I think it's called, or Bas something or other, as well as Leonardo da Vinci's. Several of his uh, drawing depictions of these spheres within spheres and stuff are actually designs of these overbalanced wheels that uh, people have recreated and seem to actually be these functioning uh, perpetual motion uh, designs. I've seen them from a totally opposite approach of requires energy input directly converted into linear thrust. And in that sense, yeah, from what I've seen, I, I seriously was skeptical about it and still am for every single new design that I see that I haven't thoroughly analyzed. But the main point is I've analyzed enough designs at this time where I have seen ones which actually work, which generate a linear force directly from within their own mechanical motion by taking advantage of relativistic acceleration and deceleration and the differential in tangential mass pulling against it basically when it's moving fast and pushing it back into position when it's moving slowly. That whole basic concept, that out of balance system where you have a motion that changes velocity very, very quickly at one part of its cycle and it's pulled against exactly that point is the key for all of those types of, well, future inertia propulsion tech. Basically, that's what on Star Trek, when they, you know, when they're doing their impulse thruster stuff, that's how the impulse thrusters work. They're not actually blowing out propellant. The impulse thrusters are effectively converting kinetic energy along the tangential axes to a direct force on the ship. And uh, we can really build that kind of tech with today's technology, just recycled industrial commercial technology. If we and figure it out and apply the metamaterials. metamaterials. Oh, yeah, exactly. The metamaterials are the best way, in my opinion, to do it because there you have a solid state thing that's already made in the form of a solid material, and you can apply it to any number of different applications. So. It's a unique, you know, it's a like self-contained force generator, basically, and it screws with space time. So why why wouldn't you want it? Welcome, welcome. We finally have Simon C. We're only five hours in, but I knew you'd finally join my fellow Canadian brother. Hey, how is everybody doing? Uh, started in operation, and evidently that's also a real technology. Cold fusion in the Middle Ages. Uh, this is something that has been called alchemy, and alchemy and cold fusion are kind of related to one another. It's a gray area that blends into each other. Phonon resonance. Uh, this is using sound or longitudinal waves, which are basically the, uh, the sound equivalent of light or of a, an electromagnetic wave to produce changes at the nuclear level. When, yes, that is, uh, that is also possible. So, Joe Champion rediscovers phonon resonance in the 20th century, although this had been done in ages past. There's something that's, that was called the lost chord in alchemy. And the lost chord essentially is, uh, it's a blend of sound frequencies that can actually cause nuclear changes to occur. And this is something, for example, there are uh, stories of the alchemist actually putting a violin next to the crucible and just drawing a chord while it's at the correct temperature. And uh, and the crucible would essentially be something uh, that would be a mer red mercury or something similar to that. And a lot of alchemists had some health problems as a result of that. So <laughs> also, physics tells us that matter is frozen energy. And Marco mentioned something about that as well. Matter is a mix of standing wave patterns. So it's almost as if there's very little difference between 
the light that's here and the matter that's here. The only difference is that it's not moving. It's essentially a standing wave. So let's go a little forward. Okay, Bessler wheel in the 18th century. The gravity wheel was rediscovered. Uh, John Keeley in the 19th century. John Keeley was a man that produced, uh, again, using phonon resonance, uh, nuclear changes. He also had some devices that would produce anomalous amounts of energy. And Nikola Tesla in the 19th and 20th century, the most famous of uh, the electrical engineers in recent history, uh, actually started out as a mechanical engineer. He, he actually uh, invented a lot of mechanical things and he transitioned over into electrical engineering. So there are a lot of mechanical analogs in early electrical engineering. Uh, for example, uh, the, the mechanical ether, that sort of thing. Uh, there are energy patents in the 19th century that were uh, very interesting in the effect that it had many free energy aspects to it. And then there's Clerk Maxwell. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, this is an interesting story, that he had a working unified field theory back in the 19th century. And this essentially combined the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields at that time. Now, back then, there wasn't much of a talk of anything as far as a strong or weak nuclear force. Uh, the strong nuclear force is most likely a short range gravity field. And now we get into the cover up part because there is a political angle to all of this. Nikola Tesla uh, had a interesting run in with JP Morgan. Uh, there's a story about the Nikola Tesla and the carbon button lamps. And uh, Dan had mentioned something about George Egley earlier with the carbon fusion. It all started with Nikola Tesla. So uh, he basically had this carbon button lamp with a high voltage on it. And he noticed that there were what he called actinic rays coming from it, which were x-rays. He also noticed that there was excess energy coming from the carbon button lamp. So he also noted that there was an odd spectrum coming from it as if there were other elements that were being converted to and from, most notably, notably a boron line, so that there was carbon converting the boron back to carbon again, doing this ping pong back and forth. So when he realized that was going on, he was trying to promote this as a free energy system. Yeah, it's back. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then there was the story of the, the Nikola Tesla and the, the Pierce Arrow. Uh, Nikola Tesla had a, a car, which was called a Pierce Arrow, with carbon rods in there. No one could understand what the carbon rods were for. It turns out that earlier to doing the, the Pierce Arrow, Nikola Tesla had, and Nikola Tesla was a very utilitarian person. He would only invent things he had an immediate use for. So he invented an open air x ray tube. The x rays were tuned to the nuclei of the carbon. No one really picked up on that one. So he realized that if he induced a, a K shell collapse in the carbon, that the carbon would transition into boron. Didn't take much energy to do that, maybe a thousand electron volts or so. A thousand electron volts to turn carbon into boron. And boron turns back into carbon, and what comes out is over 10 million electron volts of energy. So you have massive amounts of energy from a reversible nuclear reaction. There was a talk that Nikola, actually an argument that Nikola Tesla had with J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan said, well, why can't you be like this Einstein fellow? He learned how to split the atom. At that point, Tesla was extremely aggravated, disturbed. And he said that 
there is no point in destroying natural elements that we can obtain all the energy we need from reversible nuclear reactions. He was right. That's another way of doing it. So there are people right now, um, George Ugly being one of them, and several others that are working with carbon with this to see if the, the carbon collapse will produce excess energy. And historically it does. So there's a great deal of hope on that. Now, after Nikola Tesla uh, does his demo with a Pierce Arrow, then obviously JP Morgan was very disturbed over this idea that uh, Tesla could produce free energy. I mean, he was thinking of doing this thing in a very big way with Wardenclyffe. So he had two different methods that Tesla knew that he could do, and he knew that these two methods were very disastrous to the economy, and these were people that were plugged into the economy in a very big way. They were making profit. And one of the things that Morgan said is if this fellow Tesla gets his way, all we'll be able to do is sell antennas, and then they'll be able to milk this cow for free. So he intended to turn off the milk supply. <laughs> so uh, Oliver Heaviside comes along, who was evidently contracted by some financial interests to bury the original theory on, um, on the uh, joining or the unified field theory. So what happened was that in many of the, uh, the universities, this original theory was being taught and many people were realizing that free energy was possible, that you could tap the vacuum. There's incredible amounts of energy. Yes, there's 10 to the 93rd urge per cubic centimeter. And if we tap just a fraction of that, to give you an idea how much energy is in there, uh, just a fraction of that energy is enough to boil off all the oceans on Earth. So it's, it's something that you have to be very careful with to tap into but it's possible to do this. So after Oliver Heaviside basically buries Maxwell, he lobotomized the original theory where he took the, the gravitational side, just sawed it off, threw it away, nobody would need it. Well, it turns out that the gravitational side is where you get the free energy. So without the unification, then we couldn't combine the two sides of the equation and get free energy. So after that, and then Henry Moray comes along, and Henry Moray realizes that there was a working theory, and he builds a free energy converter. This produced 50,000 watts. It was about, um, about that big. And the thing was running cold, which meant that this was producing energy that was not conventional, it wasn't nuclear, it wasn't anything else other than tapping the local vacuum. But Nikola Tesla also mentioned that the secret to doing this was in resonance, where you don't extract the energy, you have it in resonance, where it's pulling out and then snapping back again. So it's called reactive power, and reactive power can power real world devices. So Henry Moray's device was also uh, buried for the most part, but there are people who are recreating this one as well and have a working theory. And so there is a groundswell on free energy. And what we're understanding is that there's a, a certain protocol that you have to use with this for safety. And we're also realizing that whenever you tap vacuum energy, and you can tap this using nuclear fission, by the way, but it's in a bad way, because with nuclear fission, this can actually extract, it causes a local loss of binding energy. So, and this has been documented, with nuclear fission, what you wind up with is Man, a local sink for binding energy. So this means that matter basically has a case of dry rot, it begins falling apart. We found this an anomalous embrittlement inside of nuclear reactors. 
so that not only is the, the concrete and the steel going brittle, but people are too. Uh, if there's, a, uh, for example, people are developing embrittlement in collagen and in their bones, osteoporosis, and when they leave the nuclear plant for two weeks, suddenly those symptoms begin going away. So we know that fission is not the way to go because it's, it's changing the basic structure of the vacuum around it. Uh, fusion is the way to go because it's producing an excess of binding energy. So U.S. National Security Act of 1947 comes along. And what this does essentially is it puts a further clamp on most of the, the free energy patents. And after this, they route, and this is in the United States, but they reroute all the patents to go through the DOD. What this means is that 7,000 patents since 1947 have been, and this is primarily on free energy and propulsion technologies, have been sequestered. So, also governments are discovered to be corporations and many of the governments of this planet and the conflict of interest runs rampant. This is also part of the political aspect. It's, it's all one, you have to approach this holistically. Unless you approach it holistically, you won't find an answer. So that's one of the things that I'm attempting to do. 21st century, the classified inventions are rediscovered. Interesting thing about many of these gag orders is they have a time lock on them. They have a time limit. So many of these gag orders are now, uh, they're expired. So what this means is that people can actually go into the libraries and find these, and they're there. I mean, anyone can do this. Then, as far as the inventor goes, you might kill the inventor, but not the idea. And this gets into Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance. The original inventors produced this pattern, this idea, and it's in the ethers. People are rediscovering this. So no matter how much they try to suppress it, how much they try to classify it, their security leaks are basically security leaks that are happening in the vacuum where people are realizing that these patterns are already there and they're picking up on them. It's amazing how many inventors are rediscovering the same thing all over the planet. For example, I went to a Tesla conference and there, was, there were five inventors that discovered the same thing. And if you match the time zones, then they discovered they had the same idea within five minutes of one another. So it's useless to try to suppress this anymore. And I think some people in the upper echelons are beginning to realize this. And in the United States, Homeland Security Act is really an act to harass inventors. And I know that there's a equivalent acts in Europe as well. However, they're not pursued as aggressively as in the United States. There is an exodus of inventors of friendly countries over here. So, and there are many that have plans for working devices and they want to share them. So, was Ayn Rand right? Do we need a Gold Gulch? By Gold Gulch, I mean that uh, there is a friendly place, uh, a safe harbor for these inventors to go to, to develop these. And I think the answer is yes. I mean, if we have a safe place for these inventors to uh, produce what they believe they need to do, which is to share the fruits of their creativity with humanity, and I think that we can actually be actually living in the 21st century as opposed to the possibly the 19th, which is where we really are right now. The technology that we have has been held back that far. 
I remember I, there was a friend of mine that asked me, where's my hoverboard, you know, from Back to the Future 3? So that's true. We should have that right now. Anti-gravity technology has been suppressed since the late 1950s. But there again, all the records are there and anyone can look and find them. And then uh, some of these free energy inventors are beginning to be called terrorists. But in a way they are, I mean, they do threaten the, the economy of the, of the planet. But then the economy of the planet is badly upset already. So I don't think it is that much of a problem. Now let's get into the technology. This is a trout turbine. Uh, it's originally invented by a man by the name of Victor Schauberger. And the trout turbine is a way of producing torque through an implosive, uh, an, basically an implosive flow of hydraulic fluid. Now you can also have a liquid metal in there and it'll work even better. How much energy? As much as you want. It depends on how much flow you have in there. Also note that on the outside, if you have an input on the outside of this thing, you'll notice that as it moves through these loops, it produces a reverse vortex on the inside. And that's another important point. How this works is a combination of the, the two reversed vortexes and the fluid flow through the loops. You can see it produces a non-compensated torque, a non-compensated force, and that produces the torque. When Victor Schaumberger originally produced his device, it produced so much power that it twisted off the steel shaft. So this produces a great deal of energy. Richard Clem hydraulic engine. Now another thing is I'm going to show you many of the, uh, the common points with this. For example, this can actually be stretched out and it has been into a, a spiral cone. And the cone actually looks a lot, and if you imagine that the buckets are actually uh, the, uh, the seeds of a pine cone, then in three dimensions, that's how it would look. Now, let's look at the next one. The Richard Clem hydraulic engine. Again, please take note that it has a spiral geometry. It has an implosive aspect to it. This one is a, it does have a large COP. The story behind the Richard Clem motor is that he produced an engine that had 325 horsepower. It had so much power that it destroyed the clutch. So again, this was just using cooking oil instead of regular motor oil because the, the hydraulic oil, the, the, the motor oil wouldn't actually hold up under the immense strain. And there were shear effects, there were pressure effects, and he had to use the, he had to use actually cooking oil for this one. So uh, you'll see a lot of the, uh, a lot of commonalities with Dan's imploder in this one as well. For example, uh, please note the rim jets on the, the lower. This one is also a, a part of it. It, uh, and this thing produces, like I said, a great deal of energy. Uh, we're going to be doing a math model on this one. This one did work. It was back in the 70s and we have some interest that will want to replicate this. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so, soil effect generator. Now this one produces power through unbalanced magnetic fields. What kind of magnetic fields? Fields that move in a vortex arrangement. This one also produced extremely high values of torque. In fact, you can see that on the upper diagram over here, we have, uh, that's a North Pole, that's a South Pole over here. You can see that the way this thing is arranged, there is no way for this thing to have a, a permanent balance to the magnetic field. So that's how it works. Um, control is, on all of these is very problematic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a very sore point with many of the inventors. 
They have had devices explode, destroy themselves. Victor Schauberger has, Cyril has, Clem did. So the challenge for this is to produce a system which is controllable. This one is a Carl Schaefer steam generator. Also note the commonality. You have a, another inverse cone. You have fluid flowing to the interior, producing an implosive effect. And on the other hand, this one does not produce, it produces a small amount of torque, but this produces steam. And it produces anywhere from 165 to 325 degrees of steam. The first test that it made was 165 degrees C. And if you look this up on one of the steam cables, that means that it will produce steam at about four bar, which is enough to run a turbine. And if you can run a turbine, this means that you can run an alternator attached to that turbine and power your home, power uh, your business, or uh, in a larger version, um, power an entire community or city. And again, this is power from implosive cavitation. It's a combination of implosion with cavitation and mechanical resonance. Because now what you're looking for is a mechanical resonance with the liquid. And when you do that, you can extract energy from the vacuum using that method. Then uh, Dan mentioned something about George Egley earlier. And George Egley's carbon fusion system initially had a COP of 2.0. Other elements were found. There is evidence that this is transmutation in greentechinfo.eu. I think it's .eu. Yeah, okay, .eu. He shows that uh, there is a, a chart, and this chart basically shows all the elements that are being produced from the carbon. Uh, Egley says that he's run this for about six weeks, and it's been producing excess energy. As the elements cook into heavier and heavier elements, it's kind of interesting because when you go from hydrogen to helium, there's a little bit of mass energy left over. By a little bit, I mean you're looking at 25 to 50 megawatts per gram. It's, it's less than matter-antimatter fusion, but it, it's quite a bit. That fraction that's left over, and we're talking about, because of the immense energies that we're dealing with, only parts per million of mass to energy being generated, which is a good thing because it would generate a, a bigger meltdown than it already does. But with that amount, you can power real world things without producing pollution. Because if you're going from carbon to the heavier elements, I have done the spreadsheet analysis on this and it will not go to fissionable elements, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I know that we have an enormous problem with um, burying fission waste or trying to do something with the nuclear waste that we have now. This will not have that problem. On the other hand, what you do wind up with are precious elements. You'll wind up with rare earth elements that have a great financial value to them. You'll also wind up with and Egley did mention this, it does go through gold, it, go, do, it does go through the platinum series. If you stop the reactions when they go there, then you can pull the material out of the reactor and then refine it. So the nuclear waste from a fusion system as opposed to a fission system has a huge financial value to it. And it's clean energy. Uh, it has a reversible K-shell collapse. Again, uh, what I mentioned with Nikola Tesla, this is taking place here too. And next let's go to the Rossi ECAT nickel fusion system. Another clean system, relatively clean. This one has a COP of 6.0. It goes from nickel to copper, which is just one jump in the periodic table. That one jump produces over 25 megawatts per gram of fuel. If you take a look at the entire sequence, which goes on for 19 pages for the Egley system, this thing produces so much energy 
that it actually exceeds the mass energy of the carbon that was put into it to begin with. And the Rossi system produces, uh, again, clean energy as long as nickel-59 is avoided. There is a way of doing that. Nickel-58 has a reaction chain, which is complicated, but any kind of transmutation has problems. And you just have to account for all of them. Uh, the Defcalian hyperion reactor, this one has a CLP of 20. It also does nickel to copper. Also 25 megawatts or more per gram of fuel. Now to give you an idea, uh, whenever you, you burn petroleum, uh, petrol, gasoline, in your vehicle, there's a few parts per million of energy, mass to energy being generated. And I mean, you're just burning just a tremendous amounts of this. But when you convert one element into another going up the periodic table, it produces so much energy that you're just generating energy with picograms of fuel at a time. I mean, you're not dealing with kilograms. That's why you can have a, a cartridge with just a few grams of fuel in it, and it'll last six months. Same thing with the Eggly system and same with many of the fusion systems. And of course, this is Rossi's competitor. Uh, if nickel 58 is used, there are reaction byproducts, which will include nickel 59, which has a half-life of 76,000 years. So that's something to keep track of. Okay, so here's another device. We're going out of fusion now. This is Tom Bearden's energy collector. And Tom Bearden was interested in tapping the vacuum without producing effects that would uh, have a negative effect on the vacuum. So this was originally put out, I believe, in the 1990s. No one had the foggiest idea how to do this. We knew that the collector was some kind of capacitor. We knew that it needed a switching system or some kind of a resonant frequency going into it. But up to this point, nobody really knew what to do with it until now. This is how to implement Bearden's energy collector. So it's an electret. Essentially what you do is you have two back-to-back -back electrets. What this does is it, it's in resonance with the vacuum without actually extracting anything. It basically produces a, um, a vacuum polarization that produces the, uh, the energy coming out of it. Theoretically, this will work. And bench testing is yet to be done, but we believe that this is the best route to go. Then there's the Charles Flynn transformer using magnetics to do the same thing. There are several different magnetic devices. If you go to Patrick J. Kelly's site, uh, there is a book with over 1,000 pages with all the free energy systems in there. He has documented over 100 pages for magnetics alone. There's over 200 patents that are known to work that are based on magnetics. So the, the trick with this is to do it without discharging the magnets, because if you do this and discharge the magnets, then you have to remagnetize and it becomes a conservative system. If you allow the energy flow to run unimpeded and you just divert the energy flow from one side to the other, then you're going to wind up with a condition where the magnets never discharge. And in this case, then you will be able to extract energy from the vacuum through those magnets because the magnets are basically using spin polarizations that are biasing or rather cohering the local vacuum. This is another device. It's the implosion transformer. It uh, unfortunately imploded. So <laughs> uh, the problem is that, yeah, yeah, yeah it happens, yeah. <laughs> 
So you have a capacitive tape on core, it produces a, a, an implosion around the, the secondary that actually it moves faster than the speed of light. And this is what produces the effect, also produces such a tremendous mechanical stress around the internal core that it actually collapses into powder. So that's going to have to be re-engineered. The theory is valid again, it's a control issue. There's the Floyd Sweet vacuum triode amplifier. Uh, Sparky Sweet, or Floyd Sweet, produced a device that uh, had, it was using barium ferrite speaker magnets, and this thing had a tremendous energy output. I mean, it had a COP of over 1,000. So you'd put a small amount of energy in, and, and this thing would be producing an immense amount of energy out. And yes, it did produce energy out of vacuum resonance. That is, you're, you're putting energy in, but you're extracting it, then you're putting energy in, so the net amount remains the same. You're not tinkering with the local binding energy. So, and having the binding energy go up is okay, unless you have a million of these in operation. For example, if you had a planet full of fusion devices in operation, then the local binding energies would start rising significantly. So what we want to do is actually not produce an effect on the vacuum. We don't want to produce an environmental impact, which is positive or negative. We want to just keep it where it is. And that's what the Floyd Sweet device did. And that's what the Electred does as well. So the Robert Alexander patent. This one was banned in the USA. Interesting story behind this one is that the legend of this one is that it was used on board the US, USS Eldridge, which was in the Philadelphia experiment. Not really something you can verify at this point. However, it's a rotating transformer. What it does is it takes the back EMF and feeds it back into the, the front end. So it produces a forward torque on the motor generator side. This forward torque acts like a motor. So you initially start it up, and once it's started, as long as there's a load on it, it will continue to operate. Once again, control issue problem. If you short it out, it will overspeed and explode. So it, it has some problems with that, but that's a, a fairly easy engineering problem to handle. Now we're going to be getting into the anti-gravity side. That's just more fun. This is something that was wound on the bench. Also note that this thing has a, a configuration like a Celtic knot where it goes like that. So many of the symbols that we have in ancient times of power are actually symbols of power. They're either symbols of ancient technology that produces energy or produces propulsion. It just so happens that the Celtic knot, if you wind a hydraulic line around it, will produce a lifting effect. So how much? This one will produce on the bench between five and 20% lift. So this is another real technology. What do you do with this one? Well, it turns out that the rest of this, this Celtic knot, it was all parasitic stuff that you want to get rid of. Victor Schauberger told us that the reason that salmon could swim upstream was because of the vascular system inside of the salmon. You look at the loops behind the, the rib bones and you can see that as the fish is moving back and forth, it's pumping that blood, that fluid through it very, very rapidly. If you do a spreadsheet analysis on this one, you'll see why the salmon can actually go upstream, why they can hover in midair. You'll also see that this is the same type of vascular signature that's in bumblebees and some insects. And Victor, Grimet uh, Victor Gr Grbenikov found this as well and actually did quite a bit of work on that. Uh, he had a lifting platform that worked. 
This is something that would require a Tesla pump uh, to power it. And we have people that are interested in doing that as well. What do you do with this technology? It needs an application. So with apologies to Star Trek, this is exactly what you can do with it. It produces a, a lifting force that, again, uh, many of these anti-gravity systems produce a kind of a blue glow. Uh, uh, that was one thing I didn't mention about the Schaefer device. It actually produced steam that had a blue glow to it. Uh, any kind of uh, free energy anti-gravity device, instead of producing a, a greenish or a reddish color to it, it has a, a bluish glow to it. So that's another interesting point. Now, this is another thing. It's uh, similar to this. Imagine that you have fluid moving in a vortex, in an involute vortex, in a smoke ring like that. What does it do? Well, there's a few things that are going on with this. For example, you have several gyros that are around the torus like that. This gyroscopic moment produces a propulsion effect in itself. If you torque those vortexes, then it produces an unbalanced force, which either will act upward or downward, depending on which way you point the, the vortex and which way the fluid is flowing. We have an associate that has done the math work on this, and he shows that a 1.6 meter diameter torus with a four liter per second flow rate will produce 15 tons of lift. That one has yet to be built as well. Very encouraging though. Uh, his math has been verified. Okay, let's go to the Kosky Frost experiment of 1927, since that one is really interesting. Back in 1927, there were two scientists, Kosky, and uh, obviously Kosky and Frost, that did a crystal anti-gravity experiment. What they did was they took a quartz crystal and they piezoelectrically overloaded it. They treated the crystal by broadcasting energy into it. And first the crystal went from clear to translucent and it grew, it expanded on all four axes. After this, then they, they took the crystal and by this time it had the same consistency as styrofoam. It had lowered its density significantly. They placed the crystal into a holder and realized then that's in that part over here. That's a real photograph. So interesting story about that one is that the photograph was supposedly a hoax, however, it turns out that science and invention was acquired through a hostile takeover and they wanted to print a retraction. The original owners of science and invention wouldn't do that. So they printed the retraction, said the entire story was a hoax, but it turned out that the, the hoax story was the actual hoax. The reason being that the original story of this one, which was published in a radio Umschau in Germany, has been verified. So this one is the real deal. And Jerry Gallimore said so before he passed away. So how much does it produce? Up to 800 times the weight of the crystal. This means that a one kilogram crystal can lift 800 kilograms. The other thing that it produces is some kind of field effect because we know that when the crystal experiment was redone for charging it, that the, the man who was doing the experiment, who we were going, who were calling Mr. X, found that it produced a two meter diameter field around it, that when you went through the field, the hair in the back of your hand would stand straight up. So there was some kind of electrostatic effect. And evidently the experimental 
rig weighed less when the system was energized. So this is producing a field effect as well as a, a lifting effect. Can this possibly neutralize inertia? It could, it could very well do that. And that remains for the next experiment. But this is something which is en engineerable. This is the original Radio Umschau article, April 1927. And you can see that uh, they did this in a lab and let's see, this was in Telefunken. This was actually in uh, Derudin, Poland. So we did it with technology in 1927. We should be able to do this again now. If we can't, there's something really wrong. <laughs> so, what happened to the crystal? What happened is that it was shattered internally and recrystallized in a high energy form. Its quantum state was changed. Its energy state is what we call dielectric constant, which means that it's, it's, a, its ability to store electrical energy went way, way, way up. A typical quartz crystal has a rating of one to 10. This one was close to one to 10 million. So it's extremely high. Okay, what are the inventors offering to the world? Unlimited free energy, anti-gravity, personal freedom from corporate control, freedom to create their own future or our own future, Time for growth in education, because when you're not working as much as you have to, to pay for expensive fuel costs, expensive electricity costs, expensive transportation costs, now you have much more time to work on yourself. And that means that you can read a book, uh, you can pursue a hobby, uh, you can climb a mountain, do whatever you want to do instead of being yoked uh, to this, this financial treadmill that we have now. That's what free energy and anti-gravity will promise. So it is also a legacy for our children to be proud of because if we take this step, this means that we'll be passing it to them and they'll be thanking us for it. If we pass this up and we're talking about three generations that have gone by since Nikola Tesla. If we pass it up this time, then I think that the civilization has some serious problems to deal with. But if we take the challenge up, we're looking at a civilization that has a chance to go to the stars. And what do the corporate governments offer? Economic slavery, totalitarianism, George Orwell's 1984, a bleak future on a dead world, ultimately extinction. But that's the downside. How do we find the corporate government's agenda? Our research all references to treaties, secret or covert. Remember, we have to, uh, this is a chess game we actually have to be at least two moves in front of the people who want to neutralize this energy and, and this technology. We have to follow the money because we know that uh, there will be people who are financed to destroy any kind of alternative energy, including the conventional forms of solar, wind, geothermal. Already uh, they're suppressing geothermal. You hardly see that anymore. We need to find a real history for the motives. We think we know what they're doing, but do we really? We need to find out what their real agenda is. We also need to listen to the whistleblowers because it's those whistleblowers that will tell us what that agenda is. How do we transition to a real civilization? Because what we have right now is not a real civilization. Return the control back to the people. 
Easier said than done. Uncorporatized government. In many nations, corporations are considered people. They have personhood. They have more rights than actual people do. We need to reverse that. We need to have it set up so that corporations have charters the way they did in the early days, where if a corporation does not serve the public interest, then they are dissolved. We need to make all those running for public office qualify. The way the system operates right now, we have people that have a hunger for power that are pursuing that office, and we let them do it. Well, I think we need to rethink that. We can't allow this to occur anymore. Uh, we can't allow sociopaths to be in public office. We create a body politic that integrates all beneficial technology into society. This means that we have an, either an agency or a non-government organization that looks at all the technology and then decides whether this has a positive impact on the future. If this were true, we would not have nuclear power today. Uh, we also need to return to a real currency since the, the fiat currency system that we have now is basically set up to enrich the few at the expense of the many. And then there's the politics of energy. I actually have a, a whole other PowerPoint on that one, which actually becomes a little more radical. But who or what are the forces blocking it? Special interest groups, especially with the corporations that are involved in conventional energy systems. Corporate government, and this was asked to me before, why would the governments want to keep conventional energy in place? The reason is that if you can tax an expensive source of energy, then you can have that fraction of money going back into your coffers. So, in fact, that the worst thing you can do is, uh, the worst thing you could possibly do is have a green energy tax, because what this means is that you're going to actually uh, cause an increase on the, uh, the tax base, which is keeping the system in place. What we need to do is eliminate the taxes on the energy completely. Because this is what's keeping the system in place. Uh, another problem is corporations with a vested interest in old technology. And these are the ones that are, that are hand in hand with the government. And many governments on the planet are set up like this. The banking interests are threatened by a new real economy. By real economy, that means actual goods, actual services. Uh, another thing I need to mention is that if you have an unlimited amount of energy, now you can reverse the E equals MC squared equation because now you can turn energy back into matter. You can precip precipitate matter out of the vacuum. This means that the replicator technology that we see in Star Trek is possible. There are people working on this right now. These are quantum replicators, quantum 3D printers. The 3D printers that we see right now are only the beginning. The 3D printers that we're going to have will actually print in atoms. So that means that you'll actually be able to, and the, I predict the first thing that's going to happen is people are going to be filling up their rooms with diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and bricks of gold. It's, it's just human nature, that's going to happen. But after that, and after the economy collapses as a result of that, then we're going to realize that the only thing that's worth value, the only thing that has value is human creativity. We can't duplicate that, we can't replicate it. 
So this is something that the, our new economy will actually value, is human creativity. Because right now, that's, that doesn't have value. And this is the world that we have. was the standing ovation for William Donovan. What an epic, epic presentation that was. I, I don't agree with 100% of it, but right. uh, a it's lot tough. of it is really good. Like the, the vortex part near the end there, that was really interesting. And uh, if you're keeping track of stuff like the Windex, uh, right? it's getting very right. Oh, that went through my mind too, Simon. I just uh, set the way right there at the end. And um, yeah, that was awesome, dude. Like, I've never seen that presentation before. I'm really surprised that I haven't, especially considering the content. Well, it's not surprising that when you were streaming it the other day, they shut it down. Right? They knew. They just didn't want that getting uh, out there again to this community. But uh, we got her done. And uh, there's still actually uh one more hour of uh the open panel uh of william donovan and dan winter as well as the rest of the presenters of uh cognos 2013 but uh let's uh talk a little bit before we share or play this last portion yeah well the transformers are wax melted off pretty good so far I'm just about to pull them out and uh, have a third one in there that should serve the purpose for a new driver supply that I can mount on a uh, very interesting experiment that I've mentioned before. So this is a new supply I'm finally doing this transformer called the Momentum Aggressor. Basically, it's just a full closed box and then you, when it's uh, being accelerated, if you happen to have this device turned on, whether undergoing angular momentum, as in spinning, it'll slow itself down, or if it's going in a straight line or being accelerated, it'll act as if it's heavier. Uh, that's basically what this thing does, is it continuously damps its motion to the point where you can push against it effectively like a variable mass using the electrostatic fields. So that's that's in the oven right now. Pretty exciting. I like it. Finally finishing it. Uh, also, I edited and I'm re-premiering in a couple of days uh, yourself at Liminal's um, crystal growing method and uh, the episode that we recorded privately there, uh, out of the hour and a half, I took about 27 minutes of it where you were showing the different fractal shapes uh, of the crystals and how they would... Uh, reproduce like that uh, once the design or the geometry the lattice geometry was set that yeah that was super weird <laughs> right all Just... the crystal experiments are temporarily on hold i've got the heat pads and i've got the temperature controllers um and i have i just haven't wired the whole thing up yet and... ah, exactly <laughs> one thing at a time and uh right you grow in exponential leaps and bounds here and there and then something goes on the shelf for a little bit and then we come back to it and others make advancements in between and you know it's just the way real science happens well i think the fact that we're sharing it all is really important like uh 
I don't know if everybody's seen Fail Forward Research, uh, basically recreating Jeremiah's uh, new tool for I the uh, inertia experiments. Yeah, Wayne and I spent quite a while talking about that one, and uh, he he ended up with a setup where, I'm not going to say it's a fantastic scientific instrument, but it it's it's kind of the uh, same basic principle. He's looking for a different phenomenon though than I am, which I think is great because he's using the same type of spring constant device and he's actually looking for a corresponding change in the amplitude that it swings and the time that it swings at that amplitude, whereas I'm, 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 a, I'm actually looking for a immediate frequency shift that can be observed real time so I don't have to count it down basically. So it's cool to see it through different approaches, and it, it really helps expand what we're understanding about the control of inertia using basically simple inputs and changing the energy of, of the samples that we're using. Like all, all, he's just using heat for the most part, using photonic uh, infrared heat to heat the samples up. And you know, I'm setting up to try a huge variety of different kind of stimulations, one with the LEDs, one with um, directly applying heat via induction, one with um magnetic polarization that's continuous i mean i want to try a, quite a few different things and see how these materials atomically respond and they're all basically analogs of trying to achieve epr or N nmr with passing something through the right area of the frequency band so that it just happens to hit so it doesn't have to be so precise but yeah just imagine we can change the inertia of something to make you know a, a car suddenly become well, basically like, you know, half a pound, quarter pound. So it's traveling down the street at, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour. Kid comes running out. Uh, the uh, inertia arrest is immediately kick in. Start, car starts to slow down, but also it doesn't weigh anything. So when it hits the kid, it just kind of bounces off. And inside of it, you don't feel anything. That's the kind of tech that we're talking about being maybe able to achieve here if we take this technology as far as we go. Well, there's also just a question of like fuel economy, even if you don't have, you know, unlimited energy for the sake of the argument, uh, if you can make your car weigh nothing, you can ride around for basically nothing. Like you, you could basically pedal power at that point. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> You're just talking high gear ratio boxes. Heck yeah, you could. Uh, Flintstones maybe? <laughs> well, maybe not that exact design. I mean, uh, you know, front roller is probably not the best type of thing to be in contact with like, modern roads but no, no, you know just like uh, kicking around or the tic tacs right essentially uh we could finally replicate what's going on with the tic tac look at that all of a sudden boom the nanostructure just decided to destroy itself uh and here i am on the other side of the room thus couldn't have bumped it or touched it at all it just did that completely on its own um what the heck was I going to talk about that was relevant to what you guys were saying? I don't know. Lost my train of thought because the monoatomic lava lamp decided to have a life of its own. Like, look at that stuff. Like, going up, down, all over the place, different things. Like, it's alive. What you need is a fancy laser like Jeremiah's new uh, array. Yes, Jeremiah, please do make a second one and uh, send it to me so I can send you back some monoatomics and we can play with lasers and monoatomics together. How much did well, that again, cost? Well, that array is not laser, it's LED, but still. Uh, how, LED how much did that laser. cost, though? A lot. Because <laughs> uh, I can't imagine One million dollars! Very common. Especially oh, not no, the... they're definitely not very common. No, so it, it, One million dollars on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. If you want to uh, spend one million dollars, Jeremiah will make you one. That is the going rate. No, I prefer uh, I prefer a different type of uh, <laughs> feedback system rather than the monetary one that people seem to be so focused on. I uh, if you want to make me a second one and ship it to me for free because you don't believe in monetarism, I would appreciate it, Jeremiah. Otherwise, one million dollars on Facebook Marketplace. Could you? Well, oh, Bernie, if, if that happens, there's a caveat. You see, there's a caveat. It is you're going to have to perform the experiments I want you to perform with it. I fully agree and encourage that one billion percent. I know you said no money, but does monoatomic gold count? 
I well, exactly. That's part of the deal. Just one exchange for the other. Boom, boom. We both got. Then we can repeat the experiments from the same ones. Ooh. Well, that's the idea is to test it out and see what happens. Uh, we'll find out if that whole entire array ends up working out pretty good. Like I still have to find the ideal heat plate for it and decide whether I want to uh, use a Peltier junction to and a thermistor to control the entire thing because then it, it could be possible to you know shift the wavelength into whatever I want. So are you going to have all of those uh, going through a singular lens or something? or, or well, What I'm going to do is basically put it on a round heat sink. Put it on a round heat sink with a uh, center pivot, center bearing, just sort of like a... Uh, you know, there we go. Like oh, on a moving head, something like, like that. The, and uh, it's like going to be able to just select and go into the same... Yeah, exactly. Oh. And then the one that you're using at that point in time is going to go right under the lens assembly. So that way we can always get the best focus without having to you know, use... 18 unique, huge, heavy optics, but we can just use one and sort of rotate the back of it and just one LED at a time is on. So a single Peltier junction should be able to handle a thermal load, no problem, just a single five watt LED, LED being on. Jeremiah, I've been taking all sorts of different samples, isolating them, drawing Do you have them, any of that that you were talking about earlier? Getting them prepped uh, to send out and... Uh, you know, I'll send some to you, send some to Bob Green here, send some to Gerald, uh, get all sorts of goodies uh, dried and together and soon to be labeled as well, of course, before I send it off. But uh, yeah, starting Yeah, to those are going to go through uh, customs really nicely, freaking pill bottles with unknown substances in them. No this chance is not get medical back. advice. Right? Well, hey, if they can answer me and tell me what uh, is in these things, they would actually be doing us a service. So why not? <laughs> right? I and mean, so that's I one guess, way of doing it. I guess when I do send it, uh, it'll have like a uh, <laughs> little business card with this exact live stream URL attached to it, written on it, to be like, hey, check it out. It's not drugs, retards, it's meta materials. Don't throw me in jail for leaking nationals' secrets because I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in this world. You might want to just, you know, perhaps get some super cheap plastic containers to send those in. Instead of All right, open. well, anyways, I'm getting them organized, <laughs> separated, and uh, together in the meantime. So, right, packaging can change uh, later. Nothing's final. All right. What? Okay, are you guys ready for uh, the last panel? Uh, William Donovan, Dan Winter, um, Cognos 2013, or? Yeah, that sounds good. I'm just going to go pull my transformers out of the oven and clean off any extra wax that's still hanging out. And uh, So you can go ahead and start that. I'll be back in just a couple minutes after I got the thing. Kind of Real science took, 10 took years, transformers. Though. Sorry, Simon. It's kind of funny yeah. that it took 10 years. I mean, well, this is, this is probably at least the tenth time. Uh, it's exactly a decade. It, that's why I'm saying it's the Burn Eye Remix, Cognos 2013 Remix, uh, one decade on. And right, we got to get this free energy, that anti gravity uh, knowledge out here. And Bernie clicked the wrong thing. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. That was my bad. Wrong button. Sorry. No conspiracy there. Just sloppy. Oh, we heard the click. Okay. That's what made it funny. <laughs> Even better. Um, see, also, look at that pure green copper coil right there. That's uh, the oxidization, uh, that level color and um, nano layer that forms when you take it out of uh, the live reaction on the anode side uh, from the red state and then it will 
instantly turn into this green before finally drying and turning that blue teal color. And I'm just randomly uh, describing that as I reload the Twitter. Here we go. Nico, no I've actually often thought about that, and I probably will start selling some of these toys as art, and uh, art, and all, whatever, you know, not all, but just energy devices, art energy devices, jewelry, accessories. So, so Lawn art is really popular. You definitely do something with the copper coils. Teletransportation. Is it possible? Yes. <laughs> oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, essentially, uh, what is possible with this is if you can produce gravity in any form, this means that another possibility exists to produce something similar to the Stargate, in which case you will produce an event horizon in one side that's quantum entangled with another event horizon elsewhere. You'll be stepping through one and stepping through the other one at the same time. Reverse, reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. That is the link to the Cognos original video. Mm -hmm. You mean reverse engineering of, say, extraterrestrial technology? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly there are examples in the last round elsewhere. Sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, getting back to the teletransport. Visualize what happens at a stargate as a form of implosion that all of the matter is compressed and accelerated in the wormhole, and when the acceleration becomes faster than light, it can be transferred to a place where the resonance matches, mm -hmm. and that's, right. that's that quantum entanglement. Right, right. right. So it's, it's sort of the Philadelphia experiment was a kind of caduceus. Mm -hmm. You need a little background in electromagnetics, but it's very real. More that's questions, right? That's the uh, spooky action at a distance, right? Yes, yeah. it's called spooky action at a distance. Yeah. And in fact, longitudinal wave into interferometry, which is a flame in the mind, is a form of action at a distance. Mm -hmm. Yes. One last question. Tell us about the heat as plants in hydrogen. And the option to, to use that in domestic electricity. Oh, sure. Okay. Está preguntando por el ECAT y por si hay una manera de poderlo hacer ya domésticamente. Illuminati? Oh, yeah. as far as the, uh, as the, the reaction is, the, the hydrogen combines with the nickel to form the copper. Now, it combines several times. I mean, it's a complicated chain. And it winds up with copper 63 after several reactions. So uh, as far as when this will be coming out, it probably will be in about a year, because there have been setbacks. Now, there are, uh, there are other systems that are also being worked on. For example, the, the Egley plasma system. And there are also, uh, the, for example, the Electret system is also being worked on, or will be worked on. <laughs> and so we have several different systems that are running in parallel. It's a matter of which one will be done first. It's really uh, an extension of the concept of alchemy to understand how 
how the cannabis are transmitting up and down the atomic table, and to accurately understand that what is called isotope path, which is actually Bill's specialty. Uh, so many of these inventors need this very detailed wave mechanic prediction of frequency and temperature to better control the fact that these isotopes are changing through a whole domino series of cascades. Mm -hmm. So the real alchemy is to understand that in literally musical terms. Right. As Bill said, the phone on a recipe for mm -hmm. alchemy. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, Roger Green is here, who's deeply involved with the Rossi technology and the e if he wants to say He's is he here? Mr. Uh, Pika <laughs> is here if he wants to say that's why it's a little bit and uh, Roger has been supporting us for many years, and uh, eco mobile fuels. These are my buddies. And, and uh, <laughs> Roger is now deeply involved with uh, Rossi and other sort of future technologies as well. Thank you, Roger. Does anybody have uh, any questions about the uh, Rossi ECAT technology on that? Did anyone have any questions? I just wanted to get away from the ads. How does it function exactly? Yeah, and how much does it cost? Well, as you know, we are on low energy nuclear reactors or fusion, and the basis is nickel and nickel and hydrogen, and so Rossi has. It invented a canvas and uh, frequencies that take the nuclei of the hydrogen and the nickel, and that releases a lot of energy, and there's uh, copper as the outcome of it. Yeah, so copper is the, the ash of the process. Yeah. yeah. And so that releases a lot of energy. Uh, at the moment, to answer the question, is an uh, industrial. Uh, one megawatt unit available. And imagine a shipping container with these little reactors in there. That's essentially what he's uh, about to release. In a couple of months, this is of course the government's <laughs> for many, many years. Uh, you might remember that whole future got a bag about 20 years ago, fish and ponds. They tended to do coal fusion. They had a few leaks on the screen. And uh, that's basically the whole thing collapsed and it, it, you know, uh, it got a bad press. But in the meantime, there's several scientists around the world going, hold on, you know, they have something happening here. And Rossi was one of those scientists. He's an Italian director. And basically, he's the one who's pushed it further than anybody else on the planet. There's no doubt about it. There's going to be other people following it. In the footsteps, it is said to be the uh, one that's uh, moved uh, forward. And so, uh, typically speaking, this industrial unit is, is ready, it's working, it's guaranteed. Uh, a domestic version of this will be ready in about one year because it's more like safety certificates that have to have. Uh, so, that means in a year, you can buy a, a small uh, EPAT reactor, put it, put it into your house, dramatically reduce your electricity. Uh, you can clean that up with a uh, solar panel, so basically it's to uh, reduce your energy consumption, and it's a completely carbon neutral. No, you know, the one, one barrel of nanomized nickel. When you put it through a uh, low energy nuclear reaction, it's the equivalent of one super tanker of oil. You get it? One barrel of nickel 
or in this process is the equivalent of one super tank of fossil oil. So that's the energy uh, quantum that Bill's mm -hmm. referring to here. So it's, it's yeah, that's 25 megawatts a gram, yeah. And then on another level, mm -hmm. you know, the third world countries, like in Africa, what keeps uh, a lot of African economy developing is the natural electricity. I mean, we have electricity, we're so lucky in the West. Uh, you know, we have electricity for our businesses 24 hours a day, you know. But, you know, in Africa, Nobody can really develop their small businesses and so forth. When, when the sun goes down, that's it for millions of Africans, young Africans who want to develop their businesses. And their government, it costs millions of dollars to get that electrical infrastructure in place, as you know. Millions of dollars. So with the EPAN, we can uh, truck in on the back of a truck. This is basically the way that it's, it's a shipping container. Yeah. We can track it, you know, like 50, 60 of them, set them up, put a, a Tesla a turbine on top, which mm -hmm. uh, Dan and Bill and I are actively doing, we've done it, the research and development of the Tesla turbine. And then with the generator, you've got localized electricity. And then all you need is a very simple, you know, uh, grid to distribute it. Right? So that means you can lift the whole continent by like Africa, you know, in, in the air or something, so out of poverty in our life. life. That's what makes it great. The other danger, of course, is that if you're running at the resonant frequency of a fault line, for example, then it'll, it will trigger earthquakes in that case. Yes. There are many believe that Tesla may cause earthquakes. Yeah. And possibly even the 1908 Tunguska blast. And many people believe the Tunguska famous blast in Russia was caused by Tesla. The point is that it is not safe to begin using zero point energy until you have a deeper understanding of gravity. And we actually do know what gravity is in charge of acceleration caused by fractality, basically. And once you understand gravity, 
Then you can leave zero point energy more energy. You have to. The park is real. Hi, the horse is real. They're using megawatts of radio frequencies for selective heating of the ionosphere to control radio wave bounce and other things. Uh, their intention was, you know, submarine communication. Uh, we do believe, and Nick they quotes me in his book about the part, that they were, of course, using the same low frequencies that you and I use for our brain waves and heart waves to modulate heart, and therefore, there's all kinds of profound and sickening biological effects because how it reflects the failure to understand how biology inhabits the planet collectively. So, heart is actually a sad example of humans profoundly misunderstanding what makes the planet alive. Very similar example would be whales and dolphins beaching themselves, committing suicide because the Navy is using low frequencies to communicate underwater. Mm -hmm. So powerful that we hurt the humans here. Imagine what it's doing to dolphin ears. And yet the Navy is doing this globally. And they're wondering why the Julian and Dolphins are getting so upset. 200 decibels. 200 decibels. So the point is we must teach you know, our governments and our military how living things communicate in a profound and subtle way before we decide what frequencies to allow, whether it's hard or low frequency acoustic communication, LFAS or needs. But can they produce tsunami also? Um, there are many who believe that the Japanese tsunami was caused by heart. I, I do think that maybe a bit heavy on the conspiracy theory. It is true that low frequency phonon longitudinal uh, uh, can cause atmospheric compression, uh, what Tom Beard called the scalar woodpecker of the, of the mm -hmm. Russians. And so it is true that you can create heat and therefore atmospheric or earth wind distortion at a distance. So it's always been true that you do not give sharp knives to children. Obviously, or matches. <laughs> we still need to have sharp knives. So we cannot keep making this technology illegal longitudinal waves heating at a distance just because the military thinks only the military should have it. And here's a simple example. The American government prevents the real super capacitor batteries that are in the Abrams tank from being on the Boeing 787 aircraft. So the Boeing company now has to go bankrupt because only the military got the real batteries. This is just one little example of the fact that the militarization of technology ultimately cripples the planet. And this is we acknowledge the right. Oh, absolutely. This is information from them. Right. The point being that we must resist the temptation to allow the military to control all technology. This is not okay. And in America, even the majority of inventions are taken over by the military. And so the Americans wonder why they don't get on it. Oh, and, I've got a story about that and, one. Uh, we don't want to be sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we should have more questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. I think yeah. really. Yeah. But so you think about uh, Mr. Kess's uh, inventions uh, about plasma. Cashew? Cashew. Yeah. Well, Again, we would like to be diplomatic and give him the benefit of the doubt, and certainly he's managing to interest lots of people. But, but the, the actual science that he's published is mostly missing or erroneous. So, unfortunately, uh, the perception we have from studying what Keshe has shared is that he's not revealed technical content, actually. Although we honor that mission, to teach how the zero point energy shall work and all those things. But we really think that if you've been to an engineering class, unfortunately, people like, you know, the Fry movie and the Keshe, they get all the new age people excited, but people are actually engineering content 
much more deeper. So we urge you to learn the physics and to have discrimination. Otherwise, you end up wasting your life following people who actually are not themselves competent. You must understand for yourself. But, you know, has Cassius demonstrated any actual physics? Unfortunately, it doesn't look good. Right in mind. It means your children need to study some engineering, even in order to be spiritually empowered. That's what it means. It means your children need their physics class. That's what it means. Uh, he's asking about if the RV activates the calcium mine. Well, we are saying that the low frequencies of the EKG of the heart, they motorize the spinal liquid pump and therefore sacrocranium and therefore kundalini. The low frequencies of the heart are controlled with the breath, call heart rate variability, and the yogic skill to control your aura with your breath. And we know that the low frequencies of the heart measure and control the DNA braiding. And the DNA braids to the point of implosion when you feel that rush of human bliss and kundalini. And at that point, obviously, the calcium pump mechanism would be impacted dramatically. So it's cliche, but true. The heart, as the highest voltage source of the body, is the motor of most of the body's electrical Thank you. Not only that, uh, not only the domestic level of the body, the components of the body, the components of the body, the components of the body, the Okay, there's a there's a shutdown sequence for that, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the question is uh, on the domestic. It's a ten. It's got ten kilowatts, which is more than about the average house. It, it's a simple mechanism. Cold fusion, as you know, is a little bit of pressure and a little increase of temperature, and the reaction starts. So you need some energy from an outside source to start the reaction. So you need some electricity. Mm -hmm. But remember that to be from a solar panel. So, and then when the reaction starts, then you kind of have to pull it back mm -hmm. because yes. it wants to fly into the, into the infinite. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that's why we say it's a COP coefficient of performance of six to one, one, one unit of energy, electrical energy, and six thermal energy. Uh, so that's amazing, that ratio. Yeah, and, uh, I, mm -hmm. So basically, it has to keep drawing on a little bit of energy for the controllers. Uh, and so it, you know, it, it doesn't have a lot of energy. If anything goes wrong, it, it just stops. So mm -hmm. it's very safe. Mm -hmm. And like any domestic, like your pop up poster, you'll have an on and off. So. And the thermal overload. Yeah, the idea of the design is that we have to make it very user friendly. I said to Rossi, uh, it has to be uh, as, sexy, as sexy as a, a Mac computer to visually look at. And he's Italian, so he understands the design. So, um, and, uh, yeah, the thing is, it will just retrofit into your existing system. Another thing I think I should mention is that after you get the electricity, you can also close loop that output to keep the reactor going. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes. 
the keypad to uh, be connected to the solar panel. I need to put a uh, user to the electricity station and put it to the now. Did you catch all the input? Do without uh, electricity installation in case we plug it to a solar panel. Yeah. yeah, it is possible to do that. Oh, yeah. yeah if, if you had enough electricity, then you can run the ECAT off of your solar panel, yes. You would take a substantial size for a solar panel. It's a CLP of six to one. So, for example, you would need a solar panel that's um, for 10 kW, 1600 watts. So, Such a 
Yeah, look at what happened in Fukushima. Yeah. 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 Obama signed it. Yes. Obama didn't need to hold education. Obama just said it right. And the problem is education. It's a tough one in America, for sure. It's a state education. It's a state education. It's not a federal. So Obama has no state. It's a state by state. At the moment, the New York, I live in New York. The state is probably, are we going to have fracking or not? For the Dolphin, yeah, yeah. It's all really caused a lot of problems. But, you see, this is the thing, isn't it? Well, that one was kind of annoying because the sound was kind of shanty as well as the majority of the questions were in Spanish. And for some reason, they decided not to have a uh, translator with them, which doesn't really make sense. So I'm going to uh, cut the last 15 minutes of that. And instead, uh, we're going to replace it with a 40 minute update. Nassim Haramine, new and exciting discoveries uh, from Cognos. Uh, and it's only two years old, not 10. So, uh, well, We'll get a, you know, at least eight years uh, more recent update from Nassim. And any other uh, questions before I play or comments? So, can you tell us a little bit maybe about uh, what has happened since 2010? What new uh, discoveries have you made? What new directions is the Resonant Science Foundation directing itself towards? Mm -hmm. Well, the, <clears throat> there's a lot of change and we're in the middle of making new changes actually to uh, the foundation uh, branding. We're going to change the branding of the foundation, but um, I made some very big discoveries in um, the physics that I wrote about the nature of the mass of atoms, the nuclei of the atom and the electron and what they are and how they interact with the rest of the universe. So, and 
what's really important in these discoveries is that they were confirmed by measurements in an accelerator in Switzerland. So now the theory has been confirmed. And that means a lot, you know, because um, like the competing theory for unification of physics uh, is string theory, for instance. And in some 35 years, 40 years of string theory, um, there hasn't been one single measurement laboratory experiment to confirm it. Exactly. Uh, uh, so it's wow. really important that this new theory uh, actually was confirmed very shortly after it was published, this, this discovery I made, this new formula. And the formula is very simple. It, I can't believe it took me almost 30 years to find it, but um, it describes the information transfer uh, that's occurring for the proton in the nuclei of the atom and for the electron around the nuclei. And the information transfer in the field, right, um, actually, when you calculate how it exchanges information, um, you get the correct radius, the correct mass uh, of the proton very, very, very precisely, all the electrons of the table of elements. So basically, all of a sudden, you can explain all of the material world uh, by describing a field of information that's exchanging with uh, the boundary of the surface of what we call the material. So, so basically, we live in a field of information, and we're exchanging information in that field. And when there's an exchange of information in that region, we measure mass or energy because there's a change in that region of the field and so and you you know these equation implies very large number it's very remarkable like the sand the, when you calculate the amount of information inside the one little proton in the nuclei of the atom you get all the information of all the other protons in the universe the mass of the universe so basically you have really large numbers but when you finish the equations it gives very, very precise values for very small numbers, like the mass of the proton and the radius of the proton. And so it predicted a radius of the proton that was 4% smaller than the mainstream theory predi predicts. And, you know, 4% in quantum theory is a lot. And, um, and uh, you know, so, so I wasn't sure if it was going to be right. I, w I wasn't sure even in, if my, in my lifetime they were going to be able to, to measure the radius of the proton that, you know, precisely. And uh, I published a paper, and, and that was in 2012. Uh, and in 2013, they had made an experiment in an accelerator in Switzerland to measure the radius of the proton. And they measured it, and it, it was 4% smaller than what the standard model predicted, which makes a big problem for the standard model, but it confirmed my model. So it's very exciting because it says something completely different about the universe. Plus, also, uh, your theory, what it does is that uh, it unifies no, the relativity theory, the, the big stuff, mm -hmm. what ex explains the big stuff, with the quantum theory, what explains the small stuff. No? Exactly. What, you finding what's quantum gravity. So why right. don't you explain a little bit about that? Well, you know, so basically, when you calculate the exchange of information, so, you, so basically, think of a field of information, a field of electromagnetic fluctuation, a field of energy that's everywhere in the space. Uh, people might have a hard time visualizing that, but think about it in terms of like the space between you and I is full of electromagnetic waves. We don't see them, we don't experience them, we we'll only experience the visual frequency, right? But there's X-ray, there's infrared, there's ultraviolet, there's background radiation from the galaxy, there's all kinds of stuff in the space. So think of it that like, you know, there's longer wavelengths, but then there's really, really, really short wavelength of the electromagnetic field, like that are billions of times smaller than the atom. And that is the fabric of space itself at the quantum level. And so, and, and so basically what I found is that that fabric um, is mostly, you know, chaotic, but 
in region it's organized because there's spin in that region there's angular momentum and it makes organized region when it makes an organized region we call it a particle uh, like a little vortex in that field makes a particle and so i calculated in that region where it's organized how much of the information is exchanged and that gave me the right answer for the mass and the radius as i was saying but as well i calculated how fast it's spinning right and how much gravity it would produce in its surrounding in you know um in the field around it because of its spinning it's spinning really fast it's spinning near the speed of light very very close to the speed of light so there's mass dilation and so i calculated that and i calculated the influence of that mass on other protons around it and i got the right answer i got the exact right answer for the strength we call the strong force but now i'm proving that it's actually gravity at the quantum level and uh and i got the exact correct range as well so it's not like the square of the dif distance like you see in cosmological gravity because it's so close to the surface of the proton and this proton is spinning so fast it creates mass dilation so when you pull the protons apart the force drops exponentially because it slows down the rotation so the mass dilation drops at the same time as the distance so you end up with a drop of the gravitational force much faster than the square of the distance and that's why the strong force does, didn't seem originally to be gravity because it has a different range but i i could explain the range now and so it all came out just right to describe gravity at the quantum level at the most fundamental level and that tells us something very different about the universe tells us that the universe is um, is very much um, like scales of black holes like that that the nuclear of an atom is like a little black hole a little singularity spinning creating a gravitational field and um, and that tells us as well how gravity works because uh, Einstein described gravity as space-time this field but it didn't the curving, you know, where, where there's a mass, it curves and it attracts other objects, but it didn't say what space-time was made of. This theory tells us that space-time is made of electromagnetic fluctuation, bits of information. Uh, and so all of a sudden we realize that space-time is not smooth at the quantum level, but it's granular. And, and, and it, it tells us that the atomic structure we see all around us is a function of that field it's not separate from space but space makes the material world it's like if space was sculpting at every moment everything that we see and interact with. right it's sculpting the material world and it's exchanging information like it's not statically sculpting it's constantly sculpting it it's constantly modifying it right because there's atoms coming off right now and all this stuff so it's constantly changing just like your body is constantly making cells connections in a second you know a in your body uh, billions of billions of chemical change every second to make it all work so this whole dynamic you can bring from the atomic level all the way up to the biological level and now you start to understand how come biology can self oh and we lost bernie oh man totally that was, on that device nice that was a really good uh, interview though like he was getting into some really good stuff yeah i just missed like the last 10 minutes of it i was pulled away Probably the perfect part that I shouldn't have missed, you right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, he was talking about you know the fundamental structure of the universe. Oh, really? What did yeah. he say? Well, um, what he said really grocks with um, my intuitive understanding, where um, everything is um, plank relics, basically, or surrounded by plank relics, and. Uh, yeah, that the center of the atom is essentially a blank hole. 
-hmm. And that uh, all the atoms in the universe are a function of the field itself. And so if we change the parameters of the field, then we change the matter in that field. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, it certainly changes the binding energy. It changes uh, yeah. the valence. You're, you're, you know, you're saying... The Essentially, the, the strong force and gravity are the same thing. It's just that uh, the way that we were interpreting it is wrong. It could very well be. I really think gravity has really got quite a lot to do with the spin precession of all those particles, both individually and uh, together as a whole elemental nuclei. It would make more sense, especially considering gravitation and inertial isotopes, the way they behave, um, just having a different number of neutrons or a slightly different uh, geometric assembly totally changes the behavior of the material to be unique properties. People are most familiar with the property of radioactivity being added. Yeah, if you can change the decay rate of something, then you're changing the function of space-time in that specific volume of space. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I would say there's actually a lot of evidence towards that in support of that idea. That, uh, everything kind of relies on the stress energy momentum of the background intensity field. Now, if you modify that, you're going to get very different material responses, very different waveform interactions, especially when it comes down to the matter. Uh, welcome back, Bernie. <laughs> Did I ever really fully leave? I don't know. But yes, I am back. And that one was actually kind of uh, putting me to sleep as well. We were already seven hours in. So we're going to play this last 20-minute uh, uh, episode and then close off last panel uh, questions and discussions. Uh, but this is Nassim from about 30 years ago. And it's him uh, explaining the... Um, inconvenient facts that are the Giza pyramids and just this super advanced lost civilization of pyramid builders that must have existed pre Yunga Dryas uh, 12,000 years ago, slash Atlantean Lemurian, who knows? But uh, it's pretty epic. Start examining other temples around the world you realize that these other temples have a lot in common that is they're all very very difficult to explain <laughs> with vine ropes copper tools no pulley and so on one egyptologist the director of the Gizo plateau said there is not one grain of evidence of any advanced civilization ever having been in Egypt prior to the Egyptian. And I thought that was one of the most accurate statements I ever heard from an archaeologist. Because if you're looking for grains of evidence of sand, you will miss it. If you're looking, if you got your head in the sand, you will miss it. But if you look up from the sand and stop looking for grains of evidence, you will see millions of tons of rocks right in front of your eyes, giving you some pretty damn good evidence. The Grand Pyramid of Giza is made of 2,300,000 stones. 2,300,000 stones, it stands at 481 feet of altitude. Its base is 13 square acres. That is extremely large. When you take survey picture, satellite picture of the apex of the Grand Pyramid at Giza, it is one quarter of an inch off the center of the base. That's 13 square acres. 13 acres square. One quarter of an inch off center. 
That's after placing 2,300,000 stones that you have cut with copper tools. <laughs> yeah, you need some pretty good moonshine to do that one. But I guarantee you, that is extremely difficult to reproduce. In fact, there is no way engineering companies on this planet could ever reproduce that. Even with all of our modern technology, if we give them billions and billions of dollars, they couldn't come up with anything like that. Because if you cut, if you divide a quarter of an Steven. inch error Simon. by 2,300,000 yeah. stone, the accuracy at which you're placing these stones is outrageous. And we can't do anything like that. Our most accurate buildings, like um, telescopes, are not that accurate. They're not even close to having that kind of accuracy. Go ahead. So you could say we've just barely come out of the dark ages. Basically, or we got into the dark ages. <laughs> yeah. Because we, it seems that there was people that were doing a heck of a lot better than us. So what I'm, when I was looking at this, I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't happen that way. If you, if you know, why is it that we think, you know, that this is taught as facts to children in schools every day, that the pyramids were built by people pulling on vine ropes? <laughs> and you know why? Because in the 1800s, a bunch of in English archaeologists showed up in Egypt and that's the only thing they could come up with and because they had PhDs and they were very respected archaeologists since then everybody is repeating the same thing and somehow a theory that's completely unproven became a fact in fact you will not get a PhD in archaeology if you say anything else about the pyramids, I guarantee you that. You cannot get a PhD in archaeology by saying the pyramids were built by little green man. <laughs> this is one of the problem with education. A whole bunch of people repeating what they've all been taught doesn't advance the field very rapidly. Because everybody is repeating the same thing. You're not going anywhere. So, uh, you know, but they, these archaeologists never actually, you know, I, I, I know they're not mathematicians, but this is simple mathematics, okay? You take the number of stone. They tell you that the pyramids had to be built in 20 years, okay? So that the dynastic Egypt worked. And then you calculate how fast they had to put the stones in. At, at seven days a week, 10 hours a day, 365 days a year, for 20 years, they had to place the stone every two minutes to finish the pyramid on time. With that level of accuracy. Never mind. But then the archaeologists say, no, oh no, those were farmers. They could only build the pyramids during the time of the flood of the Nile when they couldn't work in the fields three months out of the year. See, when they had that three months vacation, hey, let's all go and build a huge pyramid. <laughs> so they went out there and built pyramids three months out of the year. You redo your calculation. Now they have to place a rock every two seconds to make it in 20 years so that really doesn't work um because it's not like you can take these huge rocks and average two tons some of them up to 40 tons rock like in the king's chamber there's a hundred slab of 40 ton pink granite rock okay these things at 135 feet of elevation in the pyramid 
It's not like you go, hey, Joe, catch this one. Hey, Joe, catch this one. You know, and the other guy on the other end is like putting them in. You can't do that. And it doesn't matter if you got a hundred thousand people. You still can't do it. And if and and you know they tell you they did that by rolling the rocks on logs. Well, they might have not noticed, but these pyramids are in the middle of a desert. You need a lot of logs to move two million three hundred thousand stone. Where did the wood come from? When you ask them that, they say, "Oh." They imported it from Europe. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Was this like some catalog, you know, 1-800 ordering? Because like, as far as I know, the Egyptian didn't like, you know, easily navigate it into Europe, cut millions of logs they would have needed and brought them back. There's no evidence of that. So, uh, but, but even more fundamental, I'll ask you, you know, even more fundamental, the fundamental axioms of archaeology is that you observe and uh, decode the remains of a civilization to understand its morse, morses and its is you know it, it's activities and all this right okay there is over a million aeroglyph walls in egypt thousands and thousands of aeroglyph walls in egypt in the temples in the tombs everywhere They tell us how they made love. They tell us how they eat. They tell us how they went to the washroom. They tell us everything about their life, everything. Not one of those walls mentioned building the pyramids. <laughs> what, they forgot? <laughs> You're talking about something that would have taken a huge effort you think they would have put at least a little wall somewhere saying oh by the way we build the pyramid <laughs> oh by the way we build the pyramid <laughs> no none of that in fact the archaeologists say not only that the pyramids built uh, that the egyptian built the pyramids but they say that they built them as tombs okay What's the evidence? Zero. Zilch. Not one, not one pyramid was ever found to host a mummy. Not one mummy was ever found in a pyramid. Not one. And I'm not just talking about Egypt. I'm talking about all around the world. And it's funny because you know how they do all these like historic, you know, history channel and all this stuff. You know, they have all these nice documentary and they show you where they found the pyramids and the, you know, and the, and the tombs and all this and Tutankhamen and all this. And then they splice and they cut directly into the pyramids. So you think the mummies were found in the pyramid. But in fact, the mummies were found, most of the king's mummies were found in the King's Valley, far from the pyramid. Some of the pyramids, they had to dynamite their way into the pyramid. They couldn't find an entrance. When they got inside the pyramid, there was the sarcophagus, the so-called sarcophagus in the middle. It had a slab. Some of them had slabs that were like 40 tons slabs sealing the sarcophagus they would unseal it pull the slab off still no mummy what was their conclusions 
Grave robber. <laughs> Those grave robbers, they were unbelievable. They, they just walked through the walls because they had to dynamite their way in. So the, those great robbers got there before. They must have walked through the walls, got in there, picked up the 40-ton slab on top of the sarcophagus, pulled all the stuff out, including all the bones and everything else, which, you know, wonder what they would do with. And then, you know, closed it back up resealed it right, just to make sure they didn't disturb anything and then <laughs> walked back out with all of this stuff this doesn't make sense now there's other things that don't make sense there's nowhere on these pyramids that it says i built this for my tomb i was born then and i died then you think if you build such a great monument, at least you put your name on it. <laughs> There's no hieroglyphs inside the pyramid. And Lord knows that the Egyptians put hieroglyphs everywhere. So why didn't they not write inside the pyramids? You know, so those are all huge contradiction to the concept of the Egyptian or the Mayans or the Incas or the Chinese or so on build their pyramids you know that's all logical pyramids were not tombs pyramids were not built by egyptians no egyptian text talks about the egyptian building the pyramids the texts do talk about monuments enormous monuments being built and who they say built them was the sun god the Mayans, the Incas, the Chinese, the Japanese, all cultures that have these buildings, none of them say we built it. All of them say the sun gods taught us how to build, how to talk, how to write, how to do all this stuff. This is an ancient, ancient symbol that was found on a granite pillar in uh, Abydos, Egypt, in a temple called the Osarian Temple. Why is it that this object, this drawing, which is on the 100-ton pink pillar in the middle of that temple, is not in any picture, books, or history books anywhere or archaeologic books anywhere it took me 10 years of research to go through all the books that were written on the Azarian temple from the first papers that were published from the archaeologists that found the temple to eventually you know all the papers and the books that were written none of them had this picture in it the way i got this picture is that a friend of mine went out there and took it okay why is it that this picture is not in there I'll tell you why because this graphic is not carved into the rock it's not etched into <laughs> the rock this graphic is actually burnt laser burnt into the atomic structure of that pillar. Now, when you think of ancient civilization 5,000 years ago, you don't expect them to be doing laser burn on, you know, hard surfaces at high levels of accuracy. Okay? Archaeologists have a really hard time explaining these things. When they can explain something, usually the tendency is not to popularize it. So they leave it out. Some of these uh, symbols that are in the Orzarian temple, there's, a, there's no writing in all of that temple. Not one piece of writing. All there is is these things. 
There's a few of them. Some of them are chipped. Well, the laser burn is through the rock. So that actually, even if you chip it, it still appears on the rock. We have no current technology to reproduce this. That's why you don't find this in history books. The other thing is that the Azarian temple is 50 feet below all the other temples at Abydos. The archaeologists tried to say, oh, the Egyptian dug 50 feet and then started building. Well, the Egyptian never did that to any other building. And actually, when the geologists went there, they went, no, that's not the case. The building was there and sedimentation piled up beside it. Well, when they calculate how long it would take to get 50 feet of sedimentation, that temple is yeah, four to 5,000 years old. That temple is nine to 12,000 years old, maybe 10,000 years old. That's why archeologists really don't like that temple. <laughs> In fact, they very rarely discuss it. The Sphinx. Most people think that the Sphinx is built. The Sphinx is not built. The Sphinx was carved. Uh, the Sphinx was carved right out of the enclosure of the Giza Plateau. Now, when you look at the paws of the Sphinx, you might notice that there's like brick-like structures on it, so it looks like it's built. Those are repairs that were done later in the history. But the Sphinx was carved, and actually there's evidence that the head of the Sphinx was recarved. It used to be a lion's head, but it was recarved into um, a pharaoh's head by one of the pharaohs. However, there is erosion patterns on the Sphinx that is a telltale sign that the Sphinx had to be carved when there was a lot of rain uh, hitting it because of the erosion on it. We know when the last time this area had a lot of rain. All right, that ended abruptly. Sorry about that. Okay, seven and a half hours in. Who do we still have with us? And what are your thoughts? I'm just settling back in to uh, hopefully catch you at the end because I have questions about your experiment. All right. Please do uh, ask away, good sir. Oh, these are the things you didn't want to discuss earlier, so that's why I was waiting. Oh, I see what you're saying. For afterwards, as a magician doesn't uh, expose all their uh, tricks at once or something like that. Is that how the same Yeah, goes? first I want to replicate and verify. Exactly, and that's the key thing of why I don't discuss everything that I have discovered and have uh, produced in the past until... I've uh, been able to um, replicate it uh, repeatedly and demonstrably, uh, so forth, and exactly, exactly it, right? Yeah, it's time for a third-party replication on that particular one. Yes, and uh, that's going to be the next one. And to be honest, it kind of freaked me out, and it's why I haven't really... Uh, isolated or harvested much of the red material since uh, the, uh, that original time just because it's like, you know, I don't really 
want to burn in my house down or spontaneously combust or my lab or anything of the sorts where all the rest has been uh, very implosive endothermic reactions and uh, low intensity cooling, not heating and definitely not uh, flammable, combustible. Uh, and well, it, if it was uh, red, I'm wondering if what you didn't produce was uh, monatomic iron that then got, you know, oxygen. Well, and then you'd have basically I half I of the same with the iron, but it you goes, put it on aluminum, right? It was aluminum. It was aluminum and copper that then uh, uh, I pulled okay. out. It dried, and then I rubbed it onto the rest of the metal that hadn't uh, turned, and it spontaneously ignited. Because uh, iron oxide and aluminum, that's basically uh, thermite. Oh, really? Well, um, yeah, the only catch it, there yeah. is it's pretty hard to ignite that stuff. So, yeah, but if it's monatomic, who knows? Yeah, and... really the friction from his fingers have done it. Well, the tentacles grasping uh, at that lion reactor there that is an iron ferrite core. Uh, wrapped in aluminum and copper and zinc uh, could possibly be creating that iron ferrite uh, oxide. Uh, maybe that's what that orange layer is right in front of us. Who knows? Dan Winter mentioned that uh, you're going to have trouble getting anything past iron, and I agree with that because if you look at uh, the way the stars produce heavier elements, um, they typically stop at iron unless they explode. So unless you're recreating Nova conditions, you're probably not going to be able to overcook it if you're aiming for iron. If you want something lighter than that, then that's going to be more difficult, I think, to get consistently. And I theorize uh, it all has to do with the resonant frequency of the elements that you're aiming to get at and that I have been able to get... Uh, iron aluminum tin copper zinc gold silver bismuth tungsten um and a couple more that i'm not name not remembering off the top of my head but all of those metals into the seven different colored states of transmutational metal elements that sir isaac newton and the ancient alchemists all describe and that uh yeah, they all turn into these seven colors of materials. So I guess I'm going to have to start isolating the pure red stuff and we'll have some fun with it. And it's what they call the live mercury uh, state of metal elements in the transmutations of ancient alchemy. It's usually what always uh, forms and deposits at the very bottom of these jar reactions. And there's a question, where do we go from here? And one of the goals I want to do is eventually create some sort of little monoatomic bar, uh, jar um, battery cell that, uh, you know, will power a little LED as well as uh, the little Magrav coils going on with the monoatomics that probably produce a little tiny electromagnetic field and a light uh, that will turn into some sort of little jewelry thing or something like that. Like a pendant or something. That, that's my goal. That, that's one cool thing I want to make. But yes, and just into jars, batteries, and home systems in general. Uh, any other questions there, Jeremiah? Sarah, Estra, are you still here, sister? Liminal? Yeah, I was just going to chime in and say, how do you all feel about the PMA? Is it time to, to get that rolling? Who's got uh, 300 acres? <laughs> I'm half TV, but not ranch. really. I'm actually, so, sorry, what? My family ranch in the beautiful East Kootenays, British Columbia, Canada. Um, seriously, let's do it. <laughs> that is the ultimate goal. I think uh, 
I will be going out there in July or August. And tomorrow is the beginning of June. And June, I am going to finally make it to the Medicine Hat Badlands Guardians and explore out there. And that is going to be epic boots on the ground also uh it was my greatest fear that i haven't shown in the longest time or really ever shown uh i had it on my digital camera in the uh card holder thingy in this little guy and that uh, i was like all right i'm finally gonna i got the new laptop i think that slot looks like it fits this thing is it for the little micro sd card and i like jammed it in there and then it was not for it and uh it got stuck and then i was like oh no the pictures are gonna be lost forever but my dad to the rescue saved the card so very soon i'm going to show the pictures of uh, behind Mount Yamaniska, which is a sacred indigenous uh, mountain. And um, it's right outside of uh, world-famous Banff and Lake Louise National Parks in uh, the Alberta Rockies. And it's uh, the first giant rocky mountain on the most eastern side of the Rockies here. And it uh, right behind it, and I was up there. The, these pictures that I will be sharing of this uh, were from a hike that I did uh, with a couple friends when they were spreading uh, of indigenous uh, actual descent, spreading their mom's ashes off uh, the top of the mountain. But uh, from the backside, point of this whole story, uh, these pictures show what I believe to be some other massive macro sized, uh, what appear to be at least several hundred foot in size, if not larger, uh, megalithic guardians uh, guarding the this carving up a mountain cliff that looks like two staircases carved up this giant mountain cliff several hundred feet uh, up this cliff. Uh, and then probably about even more uh, several hundred feet uh, going each way across the cliff and then entering into two separate caves carved straight into this mountain, which essentially looks like a giant uh, underground, under mountain city and uh, or tunnel or something. And um, yeah, I'm going to be taking the drone out there, rehiking there uh, this summer as well and exploring that site and um also on that those pictures are some of drum heller the badlands there with the mounds and what i believe to be pyramids in the set city of a uh, drum heller which has once again these badlands and pretty much anywhere that is labeled as badlands especially you know like uh the grand canyon or um, Moab in Utah there, pretty close to it. Uh, all of these bad lands seem to be plasma catastrophe annihilated former grand civilization sites. And uh, we're going to go explore a bunch of them finally uh, this summer. I just got back from a cool trip. I went to the California Lost Coast and like uh, some of the points like right, there's this really cool fort that was originally a Russian settlement. Uh, they're Tartarian. Say that again, what? Tartarian-esque if ever. Yeah, and uh, it was like, they said it was a recreatment, but like the wood and the, the structures and everything. So I'm gonna put some footage together on that. I have like other stuff because I went to the star fort in uh, yeah, because I live, I used to live there. I used to live in Astoria, and so I have, to, I have footage of like the batteries and gone into them, and um, so yeah. Anyway, but there's some good stuff there. I like it. I look forward to it. And right, there's good stuff everywhere, and that's the whole point: is boots on the ground wherever you live. There's something cool, and you just got yeah. You Start looking at the rock structures. I was just up at this 
uh, cape, you know, there's all these capes, which I, I have my own theories on like the connection with that. And anyway, and the, the rocks were just cut the way it, they were set up. And I, I, I know it's all over the place and you right. can't think all, like most caves look absolutely megalithic in nature and like macro megalithic. And oh, can I show one thing actually real quick that I found that I shouldn't say I found, but I found more than I did find something in Oregon and you are, if you guys know, Oregon has some really interesting history um, where, you know, we were for a long time, we had the original oldest known human settlement and we have a lot of caves, a lot of petroglyphs and it's sort of, you know, not a lot of people know about it, but there's these circles that are not recognized that I you can see on Google Earth and somebody when I was doing a research around this one of my favorite areas uh, somebody had like said hey check out there's these petroglyphs here and then there's these circles over here so then I started like looking at that a little closer and you can actually see um, and this is this area for me I've had quite a few profound experiences here and there's a lot of really interesting <laughs> history here. There's um, a lot of like, oh, the first American homesteader, Oregon homesteaders like uh, was up on this plateau and, uh, but there's circles there. Are, I mean, this isn't, yeah, I marked them all. I'm just gonna show this real quick. It doesn't have to take long. Yeah, no worries. Take your time. It's all good. We're here. We're not in any rush. It's one happy marathon stream, so I don't mind. Well, I, I do need to head out. So before I do, I'm just going to ask the audience one last time if uh, you'd all be able to pitch in a little bit to help with these very expensive experiments. Because I don't know if you've seen the price of gold, but it is not getting cheaper. No, no, it's literally the price of gold. Yes, yeah, exactly. Gold, but spot Copper is going to get expensive too. <laughs> and the shipping and all the rest of it. Yeah, and you still need to get yourself that signal generator and stuff. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, if, if you can't, we, we understand. But if you can, we really do appreciate it. We cannot do this kind of stuff without your help. So, uh, liking, sharing, hitting notifications, that thumbs up. Bitch. So with that, I have to head off. So uh, thank you very thank much you for the time. great time. Thanks, have a good Always a pleasure. Much love, Sam C. <clears throat> All right. Uh, do you? Oh, you do have this. Sorry, there we go. There we go. Oh, look at these more geoglyphs, more petroglyphs. Well, this is epic. There's I legit petroglyphs in this area. There's even this area called petroglyph lake and this is very close to one of the most famous spots in oregon for petroglyphs this, th there's petroglyphs like right up in this canyon and so somebody had pointed these out and you can you can almost see old ones these aren't this isn't farm that's not a farm circle i can show you what those look like if you no, if anything these kind of resemble michael tellinger's stone circles out in south africa and there's other depictions of these very similar circles on the petroglyphs near here as well. And there's more. There's like, I started going around and it was just like, this is interesting. There's other, you know, um, interesting lines that maybe aren't exactly like a circular shape, but most of it is all circles. And uh, this was like, this is like interesting. I've been here to this area many times, actually. It's one of my favorite rock hounding areas. There's sunstones and such out here too and uh so you can see these are obviously different they're not you know they have these two are intertwined yeah also um, like the nazca ask to it these are epic i think this is where some petroglyphs are i remember i marked a bunch of stuff um, but yeah, there, this is, let me just show you where we are really quick. Cause this is like, take your time. Again. I want you like all the things minutes of this, Sarah. you keep going. Well, and you and I have talked about, we did a show together a long time ago now. Yes. Um, uh, um, I was showing you what my theory, there's a lot of these quote unquote haystack rocks and they actually go into California, but they have very much like 
face like shapes. Some of these rocks are named like face rock. And there's a lot of Native American lore, like chief, what was it? Um, all of a sudden I can't think of the name of the rock right now. Chief Nescawa, I think. And, and there's a whole lore on that. And there's a lore on this like girl with her cats and, and obviously, so um, I just think that's pr pretty profound. I'm not saying that those are for sure it, but Oregon just has a lot of history. So you can see this was the area we were down here and this is Nevada and this is California. And there is petroglyphs here in California. This is the Modak Plateau. And there's a ton of stuff all over this area. Um, I'm trying to remember if I can show you the most famous lake. They don't tell you, but I, I did a lot of research and I was able to, by looking at their pictures, I'm pretty sure this is it, figure out where that area is. So I plan to go back here and do a lot better investigation than I ever have before because I, you know, before was, Heck yeah. I, I went up and saw Native American forts and stuff and I found like spearheads, but I've never, you know, really, really took the time to go look at that. So. Freaking awesome. That is all. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to go more in, de in depth with that and Arthur Faram's uh, book and research on geoglyphs, geoglyphology, and the ancient mapping that it all is. And that site right there is a prime candidate for it. Uh, epic. Thank you, Sarah. Awesome. Mindful yeah, no problem. And Sarah came up with, well, this logo that's up there right now, this, that, that there, and that. Oh, and, you know, King of the Dings, shout out <laughs> Dutch Sands. And, of course, you also did these flames. Um, yeah. If you can make me another one that has some green in it, I would... I would greatly appreciate one day, not you know, not not right. Well, I well, we should maybe do some more collab stuff and always because my stuff's getting ready to you know I've got more structure on my stuff so I have more time. But right, so we got go to go to go looking for a job, you know, just throwing that out there. So if anybody wants to send us some money, I will happily make if I I done a few jobs for you. Do you want to? It, did you ever see that last little intro I made you, The Weekend at Bernie's? And I used, like, The Weekend at... It's like, Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> it's I, so good, too. What? I don't think I've oh, ever... Can I play it really that. quick? Oh, you're going to love it. It's yeah. real quick. It's like 15 as long as there's no copyrights, because we can't copyright strike an eight-hour epic marathon. It's you crazy, mother... Yeah. <laughs> That's the beginning of it. You should have, because... Oh. It might have copyright sound then, so no, that part wasn't. But the okay, if if it's just as weekend at Bernie's and that part is from the movie, will it? Do you think it'll yeah. copyright like that it many might. seconds? So I just don't uh, want to get eight hours. I'm just gonna upload it to my channel to see if I got oh, any. Yeah. So we'll do it another time. We'll, I'll double yeah. check it. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to hurt the channel. It's not worth it. But well, just the stream, right? To have it taken down in eight hours, right? Like yeah, um, exactly. But uh, send cool. it to me. Cool. I will re-upload it all on its own, just for the heck of it, because it sounds epic, and I love it, and well, I love you, and I love Jeremy. Oh, I love you too, man. And I love Liminal, and I love everybody that's been here, and everybody that's watching. Appreciate you guys. It's been wonderful, and uh, Jeremiah, you've been like wonderful to listen to, and it's awesome all the work you're doing, and the fact that you and Bernie are working together. It's just this is, it's, I talk about it this all the time. I'm like, you should see what my friends are doing, man. They're kicking ass. <laughs> Even though we haven't met, man, it's like I know you. You're my brother from another mother. Damn straight, sister from a different. I hear that. <laughs> one day we i i already foresee that this is why i would talk about the pma because it would be cool if we started a group people could pay in privately you know we'd have an llc and a trust all associated with this associated with the land you'd pay five to ten bucks a month maybe but that would buy you into services and then also maybe even uh getting your like using our research lab using it to do something um, a non-communist non commune 
Well, and the thought is like, yeah, there's a board, but my I've always thought that like everybody should have to serve uh, for some period of time and have to, well, shouldn't have to, but like have their say on what's going on. Not that this is a closed, you know, well, we elitist type system. Look into, uh, the uh, One Small Town Initiative, the Ubuntu movement of Michael Tellinger, speaking of him and his oh. excellent uh, stuff. And that he goes good. through all sorts of legalities of it. Yeah, I, we should. You should definitely do a talk on that. We got to try to get Michael Tellinger on. All right. So, closing words. Any last words? Yeah. Last words. Last words. <laughs> that was a long one. All right. Good, good stuff. Good information. Thank you. Great. Great epic stream, everyone. It was awesome. It was weird. It was amazing and discovery. And we will see you all on the next one. Ta -ta. The resonant frequency of the earth is 432 hertz. And all music oh, was written and played in 432. But it was changed in World War II uh, by Himmler, I believe. Uh, it was behind it. And they changed it all to 440. So it's not in tune that's with, right yes um with us and with nature and the, the earth and all that it's all it's out of tune now and so the picture i have up right now is one of walter russell's and it's showing the uh octave scale and how the octave scale goes through uh chemistry creation through geometry through sound through light and through color but I mean, it's always been one of those things I've never really focused on whenever I tried learning piano, like the black keys, why are they there? When you play them, they just seem like off. They just make you feel a certain way instantaneously. It's like a lot of things It just um, that, that kind of connection, that kind of vibe or whatever it uh, projects that you get it immediately in that speed. With the black keys, it sounds like it's the ether more, you know, it's a background subconscious sound or, or frequency you know, like to do with dreams and, you know, the other realms, which is interesting because when you listen to music today, you know, especially, you know, like the pop music, it's got a very heavy backbeat, right? We put you in a certain state where you're accepting with the backbeat and then they sing all their lyrics into your, into your mind, which is how they program you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ooh, so that's like if you're resonating mm -hmm. with the right harmony, you're getting <laughs> like popped up in consciousness or in dreamland. If you're resonating with the dark hole, you're getting sucked back down to like the upside down. No, no thank you, stranger things. If I'm, I'm doing certain sounds, sometimes like if I'm doing like uh, breathing sounds or sounds with my throat, it depends. Like, uh... But some of those frequencies do calm me down. And, you know, a lot of those frequencies can be used to trigger people to feel, you know, anxiety as well. And I think that happens a lot. And it's uh, open to conspiracy and uh, to interpretation on how people use those frequencies to really put people at a state of vulnerability. Because music's very powerful in that kind of way that can, you know, shape right. even the most strongest of minds. Yeah, it's subliminal. <laughs> and also, uh, yeah, it's uh, the way I see it, too, is it's been used all throughout history. If he even even goes to back to the biblical times, you know, when they crumbled the walls of Jericho, they used a certain tone and frequency yes, a as trumpet. a weapon, a weapon, mm. right? And we're doing it again today. We're coming up yep. with ultrasonic weapons. <laughs> Vibrations is important. It's what makes yeah. people feel a certain way. It's what it's makes people, you know, it could be used as a, uh, you know, to have specific things that can alter your, your mood based upon frequency. So, I mean, it's good to understand different aspects of sound, the very thing that uh, everybody seems to be comfortable with when they hear something called music. Yeah, that's a good thing. You don't be out of tune. Think about that. Sound, sound.